for almost 2,000 years now. The biggest thing that's changed is the understanding that it's not one disease, but it's thousands of diseases. It's this understanding of the complexity of cancer that really changes how we think about treatment because now that we understand that the disease is so complex, we don't think of one cure for cancer, but rather thousands of different types of treatments that are all going to have to come together to be able to treat a patient. We need new tools to really understand what we're making uh, and, and that uh, science is happening as we speak. Really what's going to change is that chemotherapy and radiation will still happen but they won't be the first line anymore. Instead it will be these new more targeted therapies and it will really change the way that people think about cancer and how to treat it. Going forward, uh, a big part of the solution is going to have to be figuring out how to develop and manufacture these new therapies that are going to be more personalized, doing that in a very cost-effective way. As cancer moves from a terminal disease into potentially a chronic disease, there'll be all sorts of shifts in how we have to change our thinking about it. So there'll be all sorts of challenges related to pa patient mental health, expenses, all these different things have both incredible promise, but also are challenges that we need to think about addressing. Cancer diagnosis, the big impact is just uh, the notion that life will never be the same after that diagnosis, uh, certainly for the individual, but also for the family. It's really a, a defining point in, in time for, for everybody involved. And it's really that link between not only the science, but bringing the human element in that I think makes this a different science conference and a different cancer conference than anything you'd seen before. So many of the different fields in science, most people aren't exposed to in their day-to-day -day life. The more you can get out there and communicate to the young people coming up that are the future of science, the better. You never know what's going to grab one individual, and so that's vital to inspire the next generation. The Nobel Conference brings together students, faculty, and members of the general public to explore revolutionary, transformative, and pressing scientific questions and the ethical issues that arise alongside of them. We bring leading researchers to Gustavus, including nearly 100 Nobel laureates. We're trying to explore the ideas of science using all of the liberal arts, so the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, all of them working together. There are a lot of people who are not scientists who like to share in the adventure of discovery and to be able to share that joy with people who also get it, that there's something really exciting and cool going on. It just makes it just an enormous amount of fun. There's sort of a festive atmosphere which makes it part of a broader experience. There aren't that many forums for us to have the discourse at that level with that sort of range of expertise, yet still focused on one sort of overarching topic. One of the wonderful things about the Nobel Conference is it does give people the opportunity to ask people questions in an informal way. And you never know what statement somebody makes or what interaction that happens will make a change in somebody's life. It's always very, very encouraging to see other colleagues of yours who are at the top of their game, and it makes you want to lift your game. As you can feel the audience, and you can really feel 
when you've helped people to know something that they never knew before. It's really a feeling of discovery that you share. Good morning, and welcome to Nobel Conference 56, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology, Hope, Equity, and Access. I'm Lisa Heldke. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Gustavus, and I'm the director of the Nobel Conference, or as I like to say, I'm the chief learner of Nobel. I'm so happy that you've joined us today at this, our very first entirely virtual conference. To you longtime attendees, I hope that you find yourself as stimulated and challenged in the next two days as you do when you're hearing these talks live in Lund Arena. And for those of you who are new to Nobel Conference, a special welcome. And I want to give you just a word about what this conference is and what makes it so special. The Nobel Conference brings together students, educators, and members of the general public to explore revolutionary, transformative, and pressing scientific questions and the ethical issues that arise alongside of them. And it's that conversation between science and ethics, sometimes strident, sometimes euphonious, that really gives Nobel Conference its special character. Each year, this conference focuses on a different theme, ranging from the vast and distant, the universe at its limits, to the up close and very human, the science of aging. We bring together a group of leading thinkers on the topic and ask them to talk not only to you, but also to each other, sometimes across very wide disciplinary gaps. This year's conference theme is up close and for many, very personal. It's somewhat surprising we've never done a Nobel conference on cancer before. But during the next two days, you'll hear from physical and social scientists who have made the study of cancer their life's work and have been responsible for remarkable advances in disease treatment and also in the treatment of humans who get cancer. And now, a greeting from the president of the college, Rebecca Berkman. Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Nobel Conference cancer in the age of biotechnology. It is always a joy to spend two days each fall wrestling with big questions at the intersection of science and ethics. And even though I wish we could be together in person, I am glad you are here with us virtually. Gustavus is pleased and proud that the Nobel Conference is the only ongoing event in the United States authorized and supported by the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm, Sweden. We are grateful for their continued permission and support. We also wish to take a moment to thank those who have helped underwrite the cost of this conference. The Nobel Conference Endowment Fund was originally created in 1978 and is the result of generous support from the late Reverend Drell and Adeline Bernardson. Other gifts to the fund have been made by Don and Ted Michaels, Russell and Rhoda Lund, the Mardag Foundation in memory of Edgar B. Ober, and the United Health Group. I would also like to recognize and thank many individuals who supported this year's conference, including those of you who donated the amount you would usually spend on your conference tickets. Your generosity has helped us to offer this conference entirely free of charge. We extend our deep gratitude to John Young and the crew from Heroic Productions. We're especially grateful this year for their expertise in hosting virtual events. They have walked alongside us through the process of transforming an in-person conference into a successful virtual event. A special thanks to our speakers for their enthusiastic support of participating from afar. We will miss meeting them in person, yet we appreciate all the ways they have committed to still be engaged with us. Finally, 
Thank you to the 2020 Nobel Conference Planning Committee, led this year by conference chairs Dwight Stoll and Laura Burak, Nobel Conference Director Lisa Heldke, and Associate Vice President for Marketing and Communication, Barb Larson Taylor. Along with a number of talented students, these faculty and staff have gone above and beyond the typical commitment in order to reimagine and create a two-day virtual event. Thank you for your extraordinary efforts. Over the next two days, we will spend time thinking deeply about the many complexities of cancer and its treatment. I hope you will not only listen, but also actively participate by joining an audience discussion or submitting questions. As with all Nobel conferences, I trust that you will learn something new, think about these issues in a different way, wrestle with the ethical dilemmas presented, and leave with a sense of hope. Thank you again for being with us and welcome to the 56th Nobel Conference, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. This year, our new Nowhere venue has given us the opportunity to try some new things and to try a lot of old familiar things in a brand new way. As the president mentioned, making that happen has been a wonderful team here at Heroic Productions, where I'm actually coming to you today. Uh, and at Gustavus, I also want to shout out uh, a thanks to a number of the folks in technology and in uh, GTS, uh, our Infotech department, because those folks have been really doing yeoman's work to make this happen. They include Matt Van Fossen and Marnie Dunning, Matt Dobosinski, and Will Clark. Now, you received a program in the mail if you registered in advance, and if you didn't register in advance, you can click on a PDF of the program. And the teacher in me tells me I have to say, that's your syllabus. This is a course, a quick two-day short course. And if you go to that uh, program, you'll find all kinds of information in it, including long bios of each of the speakers, um, but also a lot of information about other conference-related materials that we've produced for this year. And also some, things about, uh, some information about things going on on campus that you might just be interested in. Uh, there's even a couple of articles about COVID and cancer, those connections. You'll see when you look at that program that we are again this year exploring this theme of cancer from the whole array of the liberal arts. You can watch the live stream all day and you'll see a really good um, sampling of that. So whatever come uh, uh, in between lectures today, there will be uh, material that has been created by Gustavus students and faculty. So you can just sit back and watch the conference from your comfortable chair all day long if you'd like. Or you can choose your own Nobel adventure by going onto the web page and clicking on learn more about cancer topics, which you'll find on the left-hand side of the web page, and mix and match the offerings there depending upon your own particular interests. Also, you should know that the lectures will be immediately archived. So if you have to miss one, or if you want to go back right away and watch another, or you want to recommend it to a friend, that will be available. As the day goes on today, I'll mention more of the specific things that we have on offer as they come up in the role. But uh, for now, just know that everything is on the web page, and it will stay there after the conference is over. There are a couple of ways that you can participate as an audience member today. Uh, one of them is we are using um, a, an app called Poll Everywhere, and I'll give you more instructions about that repeatedly through the day so that you can ask a question of our, pan of our, of our speakers, or you can participate in a, a little poll that we will take at the end of most of the talks. Uh, another thing is that at noon today and tomorrow, or roughly at noon, and also in the middle of the afternoon today, there's an opportunity for you to join a Zoom discussion that will be moderated by a Gustavus faculty member. You can just show up and uh, talk or listen to others in the audience who have just seen the same talks that you've seen, and you, um, and you have a chance to kind of give some feedback or to ask questions. Uh, tomorrow at noon, uh, there's a special opportunity to participate in a Zoom discussion with the author of this year's um, Reading in Common at Gustavus, a book called Mom's Cancer. Uh, and the, the author of that will be actually present uh, in one of the Zoom calls, um, one of the Zoom rooms, so you can uh, hear him talk about that. If you're a social media person, you can follow the conference. Um, 
at Nobel Conference on Twitter. And you can also join that conversation if you'd like to uh, post a picture of where you're watching the conference. And you can use the Nobel hashtag, hashtag Nobel56. Uh, we're also on Facebook at Nobel Conference and on LinkedIn at Nobel Conference. So as the president mentioned, there are many people to thank uh, for this conference, and I will be thanking them over the next two days. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for all the work that has gone into this conference. For the last two years, I've been meeting um, almost weekly with a group of faculty and students and staff who have been planning this year's conference. And they've been very ably led by Professor Laura Burak in biology and Professor Dwight Stoll in chemistry. You'll be hearing from them throughout the conference, but right now I want to give them an opportunity to speak for themselves. Hello, my name is Dwight Stoll. I'm a professor of chemistry here at Gustavus Adolphus College and one of the faculty co-chairs of Nobel Conference 56, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you how we got here, that is, how we decided to take up this particular topic for the conference this year. In January of 2016, I attended, for the first time, a scientific conference known as the Well-Characterized Biopharmaceuticals Meeting in Washington, DC. Biopharmaceuticals, also known as biotherapeutics, are drugs or therapies that have a significant biological component. For example, drugs that are, themselves, proteins. During this meeting, I participated in a workshop that was focused on the landscape of global needs for biotherapeutics and factors limiting our ability to meet these needs. As I listened to the speakers in this workshop, it occurred to me that the challenges associated with discovering, developing, manufacturing, and delivering biotherapeutics to people who need them touch on every aspect of the liberal arts. And so the initial idea around this year's conference was born. Now, it turns out that many biotherapeutics have been developed specifically for cancer treatment, and thus it made sense to bring the two ideas, biotherapeutics and cancer treatment, together into the program you're engaging with now. Decades of basic science research in the areas of cancer biology and biotechnology have resulted in deeper understandings of both the mechanisms of cancer development and the potential to use biomolecules to treat disease. Cancer research in other fields, such as sociology, psychology, and physiology, has also improved the ability to provide better treatment for the patients beyond the tumor itself. On one hand, this research has allowed for the development of novel cancer therapies that are targeted to the individual's disease and more effective at reducing cancer morbidity and mortality. On the other hand, efforts to manufacture, distribute, practice, and prescribe these therapies at the scale needed to have a significant impact on public health have revealed shockingly high costs, socioeconomic and geographic barriers to high quality healthcare access and inequities due to structural racism. We have made this juxtaposition the focus of this year's conference. Thank you for joining us. I hope you'll find the conference educational, informative, and inspiring. Hi, my name is Laura Barak and I'm an assistant professor in the biology department at Gustavus. My research and teaching both intersect with cancer biology, and I'm a co-chair of the 2020 Nobel Conference, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. I want to welcome you to the conference that we have been planning for the past two years. The work of putting together the conference has been shared with an incredible group of Gustavus faculty, staff, and students. I want to thank each and every one of them for their contributions engagement, and creativity. The format of the conference is different than we had originally envisioned, but our commitment to keep the intersection between the scientific advances and the human impacts at the center of the conference remains. When planning the conference, we chose to invite speakers that are the leading experts in the science behind developing and manufacturing new cancer treatments, as well as those that examine the structural and societal factors that influence patient access to these therapies. Over the course of the conference, each of these experts will present individually, and we will also bring together all of the speakers to have interdisciplinary conversations each afternoon. We also invite you to engage with the other amazing content available online, such as short presentations by Gustavus students, cooking demonstrations by Gustavus faculty, and a virtual art exhibit. 
I want to personally thank everyone who contributed to this content. On behalf of the entire planning committee, I want to thank you for joining us. We hope that together, our speakers and our audience will use this conference as an opportunity to make progress towards a future of equitable and effective cancer treatment. Good morning. I am Barb Larson Taylor, Associate Vice President of Marketing and Communication and Coordinator of Logistics and Marketing for the Nobel Conference. The opening lecture of Nobel Conference 56 is sponsored by the friends and family of Megan Berglund in celebration of her rich and radiant life. Megan was a member of the Gustavus Advancement Team, and one of her specific responsibilities was securing charitable support and underwriting for the Nobel Conference, a signature event of Gustavus Adolphus College. She worked tirelessly and creatively on behalf of the conference. Last September, Megan was unexpectedly diagnosed with stage four cancer at the age of 49. Suddenly, all the planning for this conference and all the topics that are going to be covered took on a new meaning as it became deeply personal. Many of you are all too familiar with the experience of being on a cancer journey with someone you love. Megan died on March 16th, just eight months after her diagnosis. We who were fortunate enough to work with her and become her friends miss her every day, profoundly so. These two days of the conference will be especially hard. As a reflection of Megan's incredible joy and spirit, it felt appropriate to raise funds to sponsor the opening lecture in her memory. Thank you to the 35 households who so generously supported this effort and raised over $10,000. These funds, in celebration of a beloved colleague and friend, were gratefully received as a loving remembrance of Megan. And we know Megan would want me to say that if you too wish to financially support the Nobel Conference as a remembrance or in honor of science and learning, please use the link provided on the website or contact us as we'd be happy to discuss such an opportunity. Enjoy the conference. Megan, thank you so much. Now, I would like to introduce my colleague, Mary McHugh, Professor of Greek, Latin, and Classical Studies, who will introduce our first speaker for the day. Mary? Carl June is the Richard W. Vague Professor in Immunotherapy at the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2017, the FDA approved the first gene therapy for the treatment of cancer, called Chimeria. It genetically modifies existing T cells in a patient's body, which enables them to target proteins on the surface of cancerous cells. In other words, it retrains healthy cells to hunt down and eliminate cancer cells. It was Dr. Carl June's lab at the University of Pennsylvania that developed Chimeria. June has been a leader in the development of immunotherapy, specifically chimeric antigen receptor therapy, usually referred to as CAR-T. This is a promising new form of therapy that offers a prospect of curing cancer using the immune system. The CAR-T therapy is currently being used to treat acute lymphoblastic and chron chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and trials have begun to use it for other types of cancer, including blood, pancreatic, and brain cancers. Today, Dr. June will discuss the promises and challenges faced by the evolving CAR T cell industry. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm recording this the, uh, the, the morning after the first presidential debate, uh, quite an evening, I must say. I wish we could be together uh, at Gustavus, uh, but unfortunately we're uh, virtual and I'm missing the uh, interactions we would have had. My name is Carl June. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my disclosures are listed here. The trials I have uh, and will discuss have been supported by a variety of sources, including uh, industry as well as the National Institute of Health. Take one.
Take one. Is it hard for you to say those words? We're trying to cure cancer. That's a, a really good question and why it's hard to say we want to cure cancer. We do. And uh, I think sometimes it's hard actually to think that you might actually succeed. Patients that we're treating on this clinical trial have absolutely no other options left for them. These are patients who are unfortunately uh, destined to die of their disease and in a fairly short amount of time. Emily Whitehead, 554. So Emma is uh, incredibly matter-of-fact about all of this stuff. This was a child who had had her leukemia come back twice. The parents were looking for a miracle. What we've learned how to do is train the immune system to recognize and then kill tumor cells. It's a procedure where we collect their T cells and they are infected with a virus that will genetically change them so that they will now see and react against their leukemia cells. And we actually use the HIV virus to do that. So you're taking the HIV virus and infecting healthy cells with it to help kill cancer? Yes. The virus has been engineered so that it can't cause disease anymore. But it still retains the ability to reprogram the immune system so that it will now uh, attack cancer cells. We call those modified immune cells serial killer cells. Each infused cell can kill more than a thousand different tumor cells. But the reality is the dramatic responses of cancer to new treatments are very unusual. We need to make it clear when we talk to a family that it may not work. Emma was given her T-cell treatment, and within a few days, she was very sick. She had breathing difficulties, she had blood pressure difficulties. We knew that she could not have gotten any sicker without actually dying. But then a remarkable thing happened. The T-cells were growing, they were starting to fight the cancer. Within hours, Emma's fever disappeared. It was like the calm after the storm. The clouds went away, and she woke up, and there was no leukemia. When that child survived, it was, of course, an amazing uh, uh, event. So that video was uh, recorded in 2012, um, and uh, uh, some follow-up since then. Um, this is a Facebook posting from her father, Tom Whitehead, and, and uh, you know, within a few days, that video went viral, and it had over one million views uh, on YouTube. And um, uh, I began to get uh, emails from people with cancer or their loved ones who had cancer asking. Uh, if we would in, in, infect them with HIV so that they would have CAR T cells. And um, this is what Tom White had posted that, you know, we, the, the public didn't understand that we were using an, an engineered form of HIV, a disabled virus that actually becomes a tool rather than the pathogen that kills us through AIDS. So that's one example of sometimes social media can be self-correcting. Emily then went uh, in 2015 to the White House. President Obama uh, had uh, initiated with Vice President Biden something called the Precision Medicine Initiative, and uh, it was in January of 2015. He invited her uh, to the White House. At that time, she was 10. And um, at the receiving line afterwards, he uh, asked 
Emily and her father, if there was anything he could do for them. And the father, quick thinking as always, Tom Whitehead said, well, she's supposed to be in school today because it was a Monday. Can you give her uh, an excuse? And Obama then wrote uh, and gave him this White House stationery and a get out of jail a free card. Um, so our CAR T cell that we're discussing today stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells. Um, and it you know, was initially named after the chimera, the Greek creature that is a fusion of three animals, a, a lion, a goat, and a serpent. Uh, but in reality, the reason um, it was called a chimeric T cell is it's a fusion of it, um, the cells in the body that normally make uh, antibodies as well as kill uh, infected cells, and those are T cells. So a little bit of immunology 101. So normally a T cell, which evolved to kill viruses, um, it uses a very complex method uh, mechanism to to activate the key uh, killing properties of the T cells. And if this is the T cell here, it uses a very complex receptor that binds to different nucleic acid and protein complexes that are expressed on the surface of the uh, virally infected cell, or it could be a tumor cell. Um, a CAR T cell uses a different approach, which is it has an antibody instead of the complex T cell receptor, it has an antibody on the surface, which is derived from a B cell, it inserted into the T cell using the Lenny Vral vector technology. And then it can then kill uh, the cell based on any protein that's selected on the surface of the target cell, which being in this case, a cancer cell. So that's a main difference. This, this uh, T cell targets virally infected cells and and looks for uh, the virus nucleic acid, whether it's an RNA or a DNA virus, whereas the CAR T cell targets and kill cells that have uh, proteins of, uh, that we select of choice on the surface. So CAR T cells have become uh, the first living drug in medicine. Um, we, we infused Emily in 2012 in April, and we just recently this summer got samples from her now uh, eight years later, and she still has functioning CAR T cells in here. Um, the, it's a very complex process to make CAR T cells. The patient donates blood uh, at, at a blood center, and then the cells are shipped to a manufacturing center, and approximately 10 days later, you know, they, they are ready for use, but that involves the process that's done manually of uh, inserting the lentibral vector uh, activating the T cells, having them grow, so they're about a thousand fold uh, during those 10 days. And then the cells are frozen and then infused in a simple um, intravenous, uh, like a blood transfusion to the patient, which takes about five uh, minutes. So then those cells stay on patrol in the patient, uh, and that's what really makes them why we call them a living drug. Um, so this is different from standard pharmacology and standard drugs that have been made over the years by the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry, because CAR T cell is not a simple drug, but it's really a process, most akin to a bone marrow transplant. So the patient has the complex logistics I've described of donating blood cells that are manufactured and then reinfused and sometimes combined with other uh, therapies. Um, and at this point, these are autologous cells, meaning they come from the patient. And I'll describe some efforts now where we're working and uh, to make the cells be what are called off the shelf cells, um, just uh, with the CAR T cells made from other sources such as cord blood or um, healthy blood donors or induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, so Emily was treated in 2012 uh, this with a car that was made in my lab. It's, it's usually said that cell and Gene therapies take a very long time to get FDA approval, and in fact, it did take a long time, but from the time she was actually treated, that it was FDA approved and licensed in August of 2017 as the first cell and gene therapy approved by the US FDA. Um, and uh, it's called uh, Kim Raya, um, and you know, the first report in adults was 2011, and then in 2013, we reported Emily's case. 
And we've treated many different cancers by now uh, that are in the blood uh, of B cell cancers that are uh, leukemias and lymphomas that start in the bone marrow and lymph nodes, and, and they have all um, um, uh, responded uh, to uh, with varying degrees, uh, leading to the FDA approval in uh, 2017. Um, so I want to hearken back, you know, when, when you know the cause of a therapy, you would think it would be pretty straightforward to make a cure for that. Um, and this is, uh, you know, Cicero said this, that physicians consider when they've discovered the cause of a disease, they will have discovered the means of treating it. And, um, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania, Peter Knoll discovered the first cause of cancer in 1963, which was the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, a, uh, um, uh, a disease that activated signaling and led to leukemia. And it took until the 1990s until Charles Sawyers, who you'll hear from later, found a cure by actually targeting the Philadelphia chromosome. So there's a very large gap in between the discovery of the cause of this particular form of cancer and the uh, uh, generation of a cure. Um, in the case of cancer immunotherapy, um, it has been not, it's an old idea, over a hundred years ago, there were um, ideas of using the immune system to kill cancer uh, leading in the 1890s to uh, William Coley, a surgeon who injected, uh, he killed bacteria into humans um, who had cancer and he sometimes had responses, uh, but it uh, took until um, uh, 2011 until the first FDA approved form of an immunotherapy was approved, uh, the checkpoint therapies that led to the Nobel Prize that was awarded to Jim Allison and and Professor Hanjo in 2018. So a very long gap. And then in 2017 until uh, CAR T cells were uh, approved. Um, so there are a number of lessons from this long journey. For more than a century, all these previous attempts had failed. That, that basically is due to the incomplete understanding of the very complex biology underlying the cause of cancer and how the immune system uh, works. It required the innovations of recombinant DNA technology that allowed CAR T cells to be produced. And one implication, especially relevant to this meeting, is that means that healthcare funding, research and development policies need to have a long-term vision. You can't um, uh, expect um, immediate miracles uh, such as Operation Warp Speed. Uh, which is something I, I think we were probably discussing. So in this, we are having now a very large improvement in cancer survival, um, you know, due to this long-term research in the United States and elsewhere, uh, and, and seeing many different kinds of cancer, the survival rates going up, and this was reported by the American Cancer Society in January. And of course, soon thereafter, President Trump claimed credit for this lower uh, cancer death rate um, and just leading to, uh, uh, you know, it's, it was due to many decades of research in the cause of cancer and to public health me methods such as stopping cigarette smoking have led to major improvements in cancer survival. Uh, so back to some of the details of CAR T cells. Um, uh, the two that are FDA approved are uh, Yascarta, which is marketed by uh, Gilead, and uh, Kimraya, which is marketed by uh, uh, Novartis. And uh, there are many differences in how they, the details of how they are made, um, but they both have um, the same uh, antibody that binds the CD19 molecule on leukemia uh, cells called FMC63. They have, uh, they're inserted in this case with a, a modified HIV lantivirus. This is a virus that comes from my, mouse uh, called a gamma retrovirus. Uh, they have differences in how the, the car is designed. And then they have very long differences in how long they persist. Um, the, uh, the Gilead car in general uh, disappears from patients after about four to six weeks. Uh, whereas uh, the, the Kimraya car now, we have uh, the first patient we ever infused was August of 2000, 
and 10, an adult, elderly adult with leukemia. And we have found out this summer he still has CAR T cells more than 10 years uh, later. So there is differential persistence. And, and I think in the long run, we want these to be physician controlled so that you can have cells that may have short-term survival or long-term survival, um, depending on uh, that exact use that they have. And so there are many strategies now to enforce uh, physician controlled survival um, of, of the cells. Um, so we're learning a lot now by studying the patients. Uh, so unlike other drugs, because our patients are genetically modified after they are treated, if you will, they're like a GMO. Um, we can find those modified cars because they have a different DNA sequence in them, or we can stain the surface of the CAR T cells, uh, meaning their, their normal circulating T cells, and, and compare the CAR T cells to cells that are not CAR T cells. And, and we have examples then of studying outliers where we've learned really interesting findings that have led us to, the, to um, develop more potent kinds of CAR T cells. And we've also had just blind luck which I'll describe. Uh, so when Emily was treated, this is her fever curve uh, here, uh, with two peaks of uh, basically uh, converting from Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit, over 106 degrees uh, fever uh, for three days. And uh, she almost died from this. She had what we now call cytokine release syndrome. It's something we had never observed before after uh, a, a CAR T cell therapy. and. Um, uh, she had multi-organ failure, was comatose, uh, and uh, in the intensive care unit. And um, it was only until we gave her a drug that's for rheumatology, arthritis, called tocilizumab, that uh, she responded, and um, and the fever went away. And the reason that happened was basically blind luck. Um, and my daughter Sarah, uh, in 2001, got arthritis. Uh, and called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. She's, she's now a graduate student at, at Harvard, but still taking medicine on a daily basis, basis for her arthritis. In 2010, I was professor, I was uh, uh, the president of the Clinical Immunologist Society, and I had known that Tata Kishimoto in Japan had invented a drug that's now licensed to treat juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And, and as the president of the Clinical Immunology Society, I gave him the presidential award uh, for this uh, notable achievement of, this, of a drug now that's widely used for many uh, kinds of uh, 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 rheumatologic disorders and um, um, used worldwide. And then, um, you know, when Emily had, we discovered she had very high levels of interleukin-6, which is what the drug Kishiboto had developed that blocks we tried that for her and it worked amazingly well um, and it's now been FDA approved by the US FDA and worldwide the, the use of tocilizumab, the drug made by Kishimoto to treat the cytokine release syndrome of CAR T cells. So, so we can study CAR T cells in patients by because as I mentioned they're genetically modified. They can evolve in patients over time. Uh, we're required by the FDA to study the patients now for 15 years after infusion since, since they have become genetically modified. So this sets them aside from all other kinds of patients who are treated with other drugs and recombinant biologics. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so there's an asymmetric form of monitoring um, to look for side effects in these patients. Uh, the pharmacology of these living drugs is very different from inert drugs that you administer and they just are metabolized away. We can follow the cells in these patients and they usually grow in patients until the cancer is eliminated and then they go down to small levels or, of memory CAR T cells. Um, and we found that these cells are very safe um, if they're autologous cells. We've never had them transform where the CAR T cell would turn from a uh, the CAR T cell into a leukemia cell itself. That, that is still a theoretic risk and may happen. Uh, and, uh, and as I'll discuss, I think it's more of a risk for the so-called third-party CAR T cells that, that we and others are also trying to develop. Um, 
So we're in this area now where the healthcare industry is, chased, is, is changing. So we've had for many years a three-pillared system of global healthcare comprised of pharma, uh, biotech, and then medical devices. Um, and now we're uh, transforming medical delivery to add a fourth pillar, which is cell and gene therapies. And they have different requirements than the, than the ones we're uh, mostly used to. And I'll discuss some of those now and later, I think, in, in our symposia. So, so one is that unlike other drugs, the autologous T cells are so-called N of one. So they're manufactured on a lot specific basis, and each one is FDA approved by uh, uh, testing and, and released. So it's more like a blood infusion where each one is specific um, and uh, very different than the standard uh, kinds of manufacturing that the uh, pharma does where they make one, one lot of, of a particular drug that may treat thousands and thousands of patients and they use central manufacturing for that. So, so this is something that's a, a, a major issue under uh, exploration in, in cancer therapy for CAR T cells. Um, and some of the limitations of that are shown here where you know, I, may, I have described the complex logistics required to make cells from a patient. Um, it, it's possible to do this, but it would certainly be uh, desirable if we could um, uh, use cells that are off the shelf from um, uh, a separate donor. Um, as, as you know, in, in red blood cells, you can have universal donors. If you have an O negative blood type, then you can donate blood to anyone. Um, but we don't have that for T cells. Unless you have an identical twin, you have to have the T cells be, uh, you know, be derived from yourself for this kind of therapy to work. So it's not like uh, it's not an easy problem to solve. There are other issues, which is right now the so-called vein to vein time, which is how long it takes to go from uh, obtaining the cells to when they're infused in the patient. The initial time for this uh, has been was 22 days when initial FDA approval occurred in 2017. Uh, we now have a manufacturing uh, process at the University of pa Pennsylvania that's down to three days, uh, so much shorter uh, manufacturing time. Another issue is that uh, there's a, a cell biology phenomenon called replicative senescence. Uh, initially talked about by uh, Leonard Hayflick, where when cells divide, mammalian uh, cells, their, uh, T, their, their DNA gets shorter with each cell division. And um, uh, this is a major issue with T cells in elderly patients, because if the telomeres get too short, the, the, T, the T cells uh, uh, arrest and are unable to continue to divide. So, so there is a glass ceiling, if you will, in treating some of the elderly patients with CAR T cells uh, because uh, their cells, if you will, are, are basically worn out. Um, and this is an issue in general for an aging population. The immune system gets, begins to flag. And even standard vaccines that work in all patients, all of, say, healthy 30-year-olds, there is less than a 50% success rate with flu vaccines, uh, standard flu vaccines in people who are older than age 60. And in part, that's related to this Hayflick phenomenon. So we, uh, I mentioned uh, we study outliers um, and you know, because the cells can be retrieved from the patients. And shown here are uh, the plots of the CAR T cells in the blood of patients for out to two years here. Um, and you can see that there's a fairly uniform increase and decrease. Uh, but this one patient here in red had a delayed peak. So there's about 90 patients pl uh, plotted here. But it turned out this one patient had the CAR T cell uh, where the HIV lentivirus was used to insert the CAR DNA code. It landed in a specific gene called TET2. And then it made those cells be super CAR T cells. And we can show actually that this, this was actually the 10th patient we treated. That patient has been cured um, of his leukemia. And what we found out was that all the CAR T cells in that patient were the descendant of one super T cell. And so it taught us that just one CAR T cell can cure leukemia if it's good enough, uh, which 
has, has profound implications on manufacturing. If we could manufacture many less cells and have the patient themselves be the uh, um, bioreactor, it would be less, uh, uh, much cheaper and potentially more rapid to do this. Um, so, um, you know, one approach then uh, mentioned is, is moving away from autologous cells and uh, finding so-called off-the-shelf cells. And, and here I've compared uh, some of the attributes of patient-specific cells that are N of 1 manufacturing versus off-the-shelf cells. Um, and the cell source um, is obviously very different. Um, they're called autologous if they're derived from the patient, and they're called allogeneic if they um, are derived from other sources. Um, obviously, this is where, where the autologous cells, you treat one patient at a time. Uh, and you could potentially treat many, maybe even a thousand patients from each lot of universal off-the-shelf cells, which would mean that standard pharmacologic manufacturing used in a master cell bank could be used, and it would be much cheaper, and would then be in the shelf of pharmac pharmacies and ready for use. Um, we know at this time, though, however, that you know the off-the-shelf CAR T cells have an unknown efficacy and persistence and safety profile uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the, you know, Kimriah, which we know can cure many patients with leukemia and lymphoma. A number of approaches to develop off-the-shelf CAR T cells. One that we're uh, doing at the University of Pennsylvania, this is an ongoing project with uh, Nikki Mason, who's a veterinarian at the University of Pennsylvania, where our approach is to use human T cell CAR T cells and uh, use uh, genome engineering to uh, overcome the xenogenetic uh, rejection mechanisms that would occur when the cells are infused from a human into a dog uh, that has cancer, um, and then use that large animal model as a way to um, optimize uh, off-the-shelf CAR T cells for patients. Uh, so we, we're actually using dogs with uh, lymphomas uh, in, in this trial and treating them with human T cells and comparing that to results where we treat with uh, autologous dog CAR T cells. Um, and so to do that, it requires um, genetic editing of the cells. And you, there are a number of ways now to do this, uh, combining, say, technologies such as CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the DNA in T cells and um, and improve them over what natural endogenous T cells would do. So, the uh, we, we've recently uh, reported a study where we use uh, CRISPR Cas9, which targets uh, selected genes in, in the gene of in this case a T cell, and we chose three different genes uh, to knock out uh, using this technology that are on three different chromosomes and then also to insert uh, a T cell receptor in them. So, so we made and tested the ability of uh, four different genetic modifications at once in, in uh, the patient T cells in this trial uh, using uh, CRISPR, which was not even described until uh, 2012. So it's a very recent advancement that we have the ability now to literally find a needle in the haystack of the three billion uh, uh, codons in human DNA to be able to target them precisely as uh, we're at three different gene loci is, is to me an astonishing uh, reality of the new technologies we have. And this was published uh, the first trial using uh, CRISPR Cas9 engineering in humans uh, in February of this year. Uh, and we found it was safe in all three patients in, that we treated initially on this trial. Um, and um, so, so I mentioned we are in a process of moving from a three-tiered healthcare delivery system to um, this fourth tier that, that includes uh, cell therapies. And uh, one of the issues in there is that, um, you know, the access is not uniform when one has a new form of technology, such as cell and gene therapy. And in general, when new technologies come out, they're much more expensive than um, uh, mature technologies. And this is especially true of cell and gene therapies.
So CAR T cells uh, uh, were, you know, just developed by a handful of academic investigators in the United States, uh, and then initially approved in the uh, uh, United States. The first trials began in 2006, and now um, if you uh, look at the clinicaltrials.gov site, you can find that there are now more than 600 CAR T cell trials uh, ongoing in the world. Um, and most of these trials actually now are in China. It's, it's amazing how fast they have moved into this field. Um, in, in general, China has been thought of in their pharmaceutical industry as, as a, um, an industry that generally made knockoffs and B2 drugs and was not thought of to be high in innovation. But we're seeing a lot of innovation in China now and a real challenge to the dominance of U.S. Um, uh, uh, academic uh, development of, of new, uh, you know, biotechnologies, and so I think this is a, a really important uh, observation. In general, you can see that this is not just that that Asians are more uh, gung ho to develop and test new kinds of trials uh, with CAR T cells, because in Japan that is so neighboring close. There's only 11 trials open compared to the 300 in China. So the, the Chinese uh, society is very aggressive to adopt new technologies, and the government has promoted policies to invest in this, and uh, this is something that we need to consider. Um, the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and others have talked about the so-called million-dollar cancer treatment, uh, who will pay, um, and this is an issue uh, with cell and gene therapies. Um, and it's really a looming issue because in, in the case of acute leukemia that we got the first FDA approval for, there's only 5,000 cases a year in the United States. But uh, it's thought that uh, the most common blood cancer in adults is myeloma, where there's 30,000 cases approved uh, or uh, diagnosed every year. And, and it's thought that um, CAR T cells will be approved by several companies uh, later this year or early next year in 2021. Um, and myeloma is an awful disease. In general, it's not curable. And, um, you know, patients live eight to 10 years after diagnosis. And, and the cost of their treatment is about ten to $12,000 a month and uh, leading to a huge financial cost, uh, so-called financial toxicity to treat that uh, disease. It's only 2% of all cancer in the United States, but it accounts for about 7% of all um, uh, uh, costs that, that the U.S. pays every year for cancer care. So there are many ways to make CAR T cells cheaper. I've, um, one is, is manufacturing technology. A second is using the so-called third-party CAR T cells that I described. Um, and um, and, may, and also to use uh, cheaper manufacturing uh, labor costs, which is, for instance, offshoring this to areas where there is cheaper manufacturing. And I'm currently exploring that in both uh, Costa Rica and in India, where the cost of manufacturing is much less. Um, so cars, uh, CAR T cells are made, um, you know, right now at this point by scientists on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, Automobiles, you know, were initially made uh, on a one-to-one uh, -one basis on, you know, the Henry Ford, uh, you know, assembly line. And now most cars are made um, by robotics and assembled without human hands. And that's what needs to happen with CAR T cells. Our CAR T cells are shown here, our manufacturing process that was developed in my lab in 1995. Uh, this is a, a, a microscopic image of T cells bound to a brown uh, uh, spherical five micron polystyrene beads that have antibodies that we covalently attach that activate the T cells so that they proliferate. And, and these are also uh, paramagnetic. And so we remove the beads at the end of culture using magnetic fields as shown here. And, um, and then we have pure T cells later, which are infused and look sort of like milk chocolate here. Uh, so that's a manufacturing uh, process that's used by Novartis, um, but it's very labor intensive. It requires highly trained scientists and technicians to do this, uh, and we need 
to to develop automated systems. And there's a lot of effort now in the biotechnology industry to develop the advanced manufacturing and using actually uh, many of the lessons from Detroit, where uh, uh, you know engineers have shown how the how cost follows different scale outs of uh, the number of patients that are treated. And if you uh, make a Lamborghini, those are in general made by hand and they're very expensive uh, because they're put together by highly trained mechanics and technicians. Whereas an automated Volkswagen that's put together by robotics is, is uh, cheaper by more than an, uh, a log scale. Uh, so there are many different groups now brought together to learn how to make cell uh, and cheaper cell and gene therapy. Um, and, and there's ideas that this is an industry that's different than the standard pharma industry. Uh, cell and gene therapy, because it begins where the patients are at hospitals, is uh, somewhat more dependent on the development of new therapies with the uh, academic institutions. And, and, and the industry now is working with many different groups to make uh, this compl logistically complex uh, process uh, simple. And, um, uh, you know, in, and there may be one approach. This is, uh, there's a paper published by Beth Schachter in Nature Biotechnology proposing that uh, we could accelerate the development of more advanced cell and gene therapies by having government, industry, and philanthropic partnerships. The UK has this where they have made central manufacturing plants, which are the expensive rate limiting step to make new cell and gene therapies. And they have made those through governmental forms and then new academics and fledgling biotechs can use that to test initial trials uh, concepts, uh, de-risking them and, and de decreasing the total cost. Uh, so um, I, this this may be a way to accelerate the development of cheaper and more affordable cell gene therapies. Um, one concept that's uh, approved or emerged is shown here, which is that we may hit peak serum, and you know serum is used in the culture of most cells, and it's derived from cows, and there are only so many cows that can be donors for calf serum, and. Um, um, and, and this paper published in 2012 shows that the peak serum levels uh, that one blockbuster cell therapy could overwhelm the supply of the world's supply of cows uh, to supply serum. Um, and they, they say potentially that the concepts of peak oil and peak water have spurred innovation and not disaster. And hopefully that the same may be true for peak serum. So there's a lot of effort now to make um, cell culture conditions that are independent of the requirement for calf uh, serum. Um, there are economic forecasts showing that the cell, the cost for cell and gene therapy is related to the number of patients that are treated. So for very rare diseases, the costs have been over a million dollars per patient. And now for uh, the cell and gene therapy, where for a lymphoma, it's down to $375,000. And it will come down, I think, by an order of magnitude in the next uh, five years. But this has huge implications for the Center uh, for Medicaid, CMMS, which sets the price of drugs in, in the United States. Uh, there have been now a number, uh, actually 500 different companies start. When we published our first patient about uh, paper about Emily in uh, 2012, there were no CAR T cell companies. And now there are two marketed in the US but there are hundreds around the world now showing, as shown in this dart, uh, dot plot of um, companies testing various ideas. So it's a very active new area of the biopharma industry. So there are many uh, aspects of this that are specific to uh, cell and gene therapies and that I've highlighted throughout my presentation. Um, and I think we'll, we can discuss some of these later uh, today. Panels. Uh, so, in summary, there are many kinds of CAR T cells in development now. It's a new pillar for the medical therapy uh, in the US and, and worldwide. Cost and scale are the major pros, uh, problems facing the field. In genome engineering and, and, and cell omics uh, at the 
DNA, RNA, and protein level have a major potential to synergize to make a more potent next generation. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the panel discussions. So let's see. I said that you could participate um, by uh, in asking questions by going to a website, and I neglected to tell you what that website was before. If you have a question for Dr. June, go to polev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash Nobel 56. Or if you'd like to participate by text, uh, text uh, go to 22333 and text Nobel 56. <clears throat> uh, since we can't all be on campus this, uh, for this Nobel conference, we decided we would bring you some images from the, the campus uh, to make you feel like you're really there. Uh, for those of you who have uh, have great familiarity with the Gustavus campus, you will say, where is Lisa standing in front of? And the truth is, we've made a pretend room that doesn't really exist, but that is about where North Hall would be. And so just imagine, if you will, a viewing platform somewhere out where North Hall is, looking over um, the, the um, old main, my, my building. So at any rate, my colleague, uh, Professor Laura Burek of the biology department is in a real room. In fact, one of the exciting real new laboratories at uh, Nobel Hall. So welcome, Laura, to uh, this virtual conversation. Thanks, Lisa. Is this your lab by any chance? It is not my lab. My lab is just down the hall and around the corner, but Wonderful. it's pretty close. Excellent. And I'm certain that you've been enjoying settling into the new digs. <clears throat> Yes, they are beautiful. It's sort of amazing to see what a transformation has been made. Mm. I have so much more space and collaboration room <laughs> and all sorts of things. It's, it's a great, great building. Wonderful, wonderful. So I, as you know, describe myself as the chief learner of Nobel Conference. And so I have the delight today of getting to talk with you a little bit about Dr. June's talk, uh, because it turns out you know a lot more about what he was talking about than I do. So um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is this difference he talked about between viral editing and um, CRISPR gene editing. So. <laughs> What's, what's the difference between those two, and why would you use one rather than the other? Yeah, so both of them are ways to actually modify the genome of a cell. The difference comes in in the way that they do it. So the HIV vector that he mentioned is sort of part of a large family of retroviral vectors. And so these take advantage of the fact that those viruses, when they infect us, part of their genome actually inserts into our DNA. And so that insertion into our DNA is what allows the virus to have a long-term infection, but it also then essentially changes our DNA. And so by taking away the infectiousness, but leaving the insertion, you can pretty much put in whatever you want. And so that's a technology that has been around for quite a while, and it's really, really good at putting in pieces of DNA. What CRISPR does that's a little bit different mm. is it actually allows you to target where in the genome you want to make a change. And so if you want to change something about the existing DNA, CRISPR is the way to go. So uh, <clears throat> the retrovirus is really good for putting something in, and the CRISPR is really good for changing the DNA. And so uh, the CAR-T therapy, the way it's been used in clinical trials, really what they need to do is insert that CAR into the DNA. And so therefore the retroviral vectors work great. Uh, for some other types of uses of something like CAR-T therapy, for example, to treat <laughs> solid tumors, they need to make more changes. And so therefore they've used something like CRISPR, which can actually change the DNA to be able to make those types of changes. Mm -hmm. Would, so uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, they're both uh, changes in the genome, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit more like, do you wanna put something in or do you wanna change what's already there? Mm -hmm. I noticed you're not saying, take something out, which is my sort of layperson's understanding of how CRISPR works. They always depict it with a scissors, and I always think, oh, you're just taking something out. Not so. so. 
So really what CRISPR does is it makes a cut at exactly the right place. Ah, uh, okay. And, and there so you can stick something you in if you need don't to. Don't give it anything to put in. It will actually make a tiny little deletion because okay. um, the process of fixing that cut will make a little change. And then yes, you could delete a gene. Okay. But you can also put in a new piece of DNA and then that cut okay. will be exactly where the new piece comes in and you can really <laughs> just sort of fix uh, what's there. Okay. I'm going to interrupt our discussion just to invite the audience to participate in a little poll that we created uh, about Dr. June's talk. So again, go to that same place, uh, pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash Nobel 56, or again, the phone number is 22333 and text Nobel 56. And we will, um, and you can see this, the poll on your, uh, on your webpage when you, when you enter that address. And while the poll results uh, start to come in, I have another question for Laura. What, was there something particular about the HIV virus that made it particularly um, optimal for this particular kind of insertion? Do you happen to know? Yeah, so I think it's a combination of the fact that HIV has been very well studied. Mm. Uh, and so the integration process has been very well studied that I think might be one reason why sure. it's been used so much. Uh, and indeed, and Dr. June the, studied HIV, yeah, I believe. Yeah, definitely. And I think that the fact that uh, we know so much about its pathogenesis as well allows us to be very certain that we are getting rid of everything that is pathogenic if you were Brilliant. to use that type of vector. So those are just Brilliant. a couple of the reasons. Brilliant reasons. Interesting. Uh, now, of course, my as a dog person, uh, my ears pricked up when he started to talk about the ways in which they are conducting trials using dogs. And indeed, my, my web feed all year has been sending me things about ca dog cancer as I have been collecting up cancer information for the, the Nobel page. Um, so in the case of trials uh, they're conducting with dogs, those, are, those cells are normally rejected by the body. Am I understanding that correctly? Why does that happen? Yeah, so every person has specific markers on the surface of your cell. Okay. And your immune system is trained during the development process to <clears throat> be sort of ignoring of those markers. So when your immune system develops, all the T cells and B cells are actually generated through this random process uh -huh. where they put together all sorts of little pieces to essentially look for any possible thing out there. Okay. But during development, they're trained. So essentially, if they recognize you, they're uh, killed. And so uh, anything that's not you could potentially be recognized by the, do by the uh, immune system. And so therefore, the dog's immune system essentially hasn't been trained to ignore human cells. And so therefore, we have to trick the cells so that they now don't have any of those sort of surface markers uh, that would make them uh, sort of be seen by the dog's immune system and therefore uh, be rejected. And so uh, like when you think about organ mm -hmm. transplant, you think about how there has to be a very specific match that occurs between the uh, oh, organ that's being put in and the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that same idea um, that sort of allows for organs to not be rejected. Although in those cases, they do have to take immunosuppressants so that they're not rejected. Mm -hmm. And so when he's talking about this idea of allergenic T cells, uh, essentially, that's the problem that has to be overcome. We have to fig they have to figure out how to make it so that the right. T cells from someone else right. don't recognize anything about other people. They right. are sort of trained specifically for one person, and so then we have to train them to sort of be ignoring of lots and lots of people instead of just the one person. And he mentioned, of course, universal donor in, in, with respect to blood, and there's sort of no universal T cell. And of course, I guess when you think about it, it what, what good would a, an immune cell be if it was just universal, right? Uh, 
Yeah, so if it was universal, then you could maybe fight one infection, but you would only be able to, let's say you had universal influenza cells, you could potentially fight influenza really well, but any other infectious disease, you would be completely susceptible. And so it's the randomness that allows the immune system to work so well, but it's also the randomness that makes it so hard to sort of use someone else's cells in this type of immunotherapy. There you go. There you go. Well, it looks like we've gotten some results in from our poll, which statement best describes your thoughts on immunotherapy. And Laura, I'm not sure you can see these results, but- um, I can. You can, oh, well, wonderful. So it looks like a, a, a majority of folks say, as I certainly would have until now, I didn't understand immunotherapy could lead to long-term cancer cure, um, but a substantial, you know, 14% of people say, I worry about those negative long-term consequences of modifying an immune system. What do, you th um, what do you notice about those results, Laura? Does that surprise you at all, particularly the, the concern? No, I think it makes sense. So when we think about immunotherapy, they are incredibly powerful treatments. Okay. And so essentially that power is what makes them so effective, but that power is also what makes them potentially a little scary. So if we think about uh, all sorts of different diseases that are related to autoimmune diseases, uh, those are all something that is potentially a risk of some of these immunotherapies. And so the trick is to make sure that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So most people, that are treated with immunotherapy today, including uh, the patients that undergo CAR T therapy, are generally quite sick, such that without the immunotherapy, uh, they might not have very long to survive. And so if you're sort of weighing the pros and cons, if you're thinking about the possibility of a long-term effect 15 years down the road right. versus a prognosis right. of a year, I think that that's a pretty easy choice to make. Right. If you're thinking about cases where patients might have a prognosis of 20 years, uh, so a lot of prostate cancers, for example, are very slow growing. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a very slow growing prostate cancer, I think it becomes a much more difficult decision to think about which of those is the greater risk. Mm -hmm. And so I think that personally, uh, Immunotherapy is incredibly promising and uh, has incredible benefits for a lot of situations. But we should be sort of thoughtful about when to weld the power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well put. I'm aware that we have a hard stop at 11.45 so that our audience can go to uh, discussions. Um, and th that Zoom code should be available to you on the, um, on the web page. But I think we can squeak in one more question. And I think it's, it might be as a wild card question, but it's, okay, tell us about cow serum. Why can't we just use, I don't know, something else? Yeah, so he mentioned the idea of peak serum uh, in his talk, and some of the audience might be wondering why, why do we need cow serum? And so essentially it's because human cells are designed to be in a social setting. So it's called actually social control. Uh, over the huh. growth. So they're designed to be part of a multicellular organism. And so therefore, in order to replicate, even if they're potentially cancer cells, they still need all of these growth signals in order to replicate. And so if you want to grow human cells in a dish, you need all of these signaling molecules, all these different growth factors. But it doesn't really work if you just have one. You need a whole slew of them. Huh. Uh, and so you could theoretically make each one of those individually, but that might also be tricky. And so the easiest way to do it is to use uh, serum from a cow um, because cows are large, relatively speaking, and so you can get a large number of volume out of a given uh, animal, as well as the fact that usually it's actually fetal bovine serum. So when you think about development, early in development, there's all sorts of growth that happens. And so essentially mm -hmm. it's the fetal bovine serum is used because newborn developing cows have lots of cell growth. And so they have lots of growth factors which make the cell culture work. Neat, neat, so. that's fascinating. 
Uh, and we are just about at time to go to audience discussions. Audience, I remind you that you can either join a Zoom discussion uh, led by one of my colleagues, or you can sit back and relax and watch uh, pre-recorded content created especially for today's conference. So thanks again, Professor Laura Burek of our, our, huh, of our biology department, <laughs> and thanks for all that you've done for the conference. Thanks, Lisa. See you later. So audience members, please feel free to join a Zoom discussion or watch that uh, stream of interesting videos. Let's see, this afternoon, what can I tell you? We'll start with a healthy cooking demonstration, uh, a poetry reading, and then a, a sec segment on yoga for cancer, followed by a tour of art that's happening in the Schaefer Art Gallery at, uh, or I'm sorry, the yes, the Schaefer Art Gallery at Gustavus a special exhibit related to the conference. Uh, there will also be a live discussion of that um, audience, of, I'm sorry, of that artist tonight at, um, I can't remember exactly what time, I think it might be 5.30, but you can check the conference program schedule to see. So that is just some of the offerings that we will have uh, going on during this hour. And then at uh, 12.45, we will return here to uh, hear a lecture by Professor Shanita Hughes-Halbert of the Medical University of South Carolina. So let's see, what else can I tell you right now about the Nobel Conference? Oh, I know something that I wanted to mention. It is pretty exciting that we have the Nobel Conference every year at the same time that the Nobel Prizes are being given out. And I don't know if any of you is a Nobel Conference, uh, Nobel uh, prize watcher the way I am, but I was pretty excited this morning when it turns out that one of the three people who won the Nobel Prize in physics was in fact a uh, Okay, so uh, We are going now to go. I'm sorry. I've, I've been a little distracted there by the, the voice in my ear uh, I just wanted to finish that thought by saying that one of the three was a woman, and that, believe it or not, is only the, I believe, fourth time in the history of the Nobel Prizes that a woman has won the physics prize. So I'm very happy about that. So now we are going to go to the live stream. Uh, I'm sorry, the pre-recorded stream. Sorry, a little flustered there. Hi, I'm Stephanie Otto. I'm Nate Otto. And we both teach here at Gustavus in the Department of Health and Exercise Science. And we are very excited that the Nobel Committee asked us to come here today and teach you a few of our favorite recipes. And before I forget, I'd like to say thank you to Lisa Heldke and the Nobel Committee for the invitation and also to Brandy Russell for allowing us to use this beautiful laboratory kitchen in uh, Nobel. So today we're going to be making pasta ravioli, but just the pasta part to begin. Um, a few of the tools that you're going to need as we begin, a uh, good pasta roller, a uh, rolling pin, um, a couple of bowls if you're going to get all of your ingredients parsed out, a fork for mixing, a uh, nice good sharp knife, a couple of ravioli uh, cutters. You don't necessarily need these, we'll talk more about this, but they're nice to have if you're going to actually make nice beautiful ravioli. A couple of bench scrapers. A nice cutting board to work on so we can roll our dough out. And then uh, a, a towel that has uh, underneath a, a baking sheet so that we can dry our pasta out. So the ingredients for pasta are beautiful and simple. We are going to be using the flour and we just use all purpose flour uh, for our pasta. Uh, Nate has some olive oil there that he's going to be using. We happen to have a little olive oil that we brought back with us on one of our trips to Italy. Um, we're going to be using some bacon fat, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we chose to use bacon fat. It's, it's not something that you have to use, but we like the way that it makes the dough feel. Um, he also has some water and some salt here, so I'm going to let him mix that up. Just a pinch of salt. We don't need anything. Um, uh, as far as flavor, the salt is just going to add that little bit extra flavor. Um, you can add more, uh, don't necessarily have to. And then I'm not going to hold a little bit of my water back so that I don't use too much. Um, and I can always add just a little bit more water in as we begin to start making our pasta dough. 
As our pasta dough starts to form, we're gonna work through just trying to scrape those sides on the bowl and we'll incorporate a little bit more water. One of the things that we've learned um, making pasta, number one, pasta making is 99% confidence. So if it doesn't turn out the first time, keep working at it. Um, and number two is um, the ratio of water to flour is really, is really important. You definitely want to make sure that your pasta dough is not too dry. If it's too dry, it'll be a little more difficult to roll out. So as we take our pasta, we fold it out onto our table or onto our cutting board. And we're just working through trying to mix all of the ingredients evenly. Should have a nice kind of crumbly um, to begin as the oil gets incorporated into the flour. The flour gives us this kind of softness as we press our heels into the pasta. And we may need a little bit extra flour. It kind of depends on how the flour incorporates and how you measure your flour out. One of the first times we learned how to make pasta was in uh, Sorrento, Italy. We actually had a group of Gustavus students with us and we were at a cooking school in Sorrento. And I'll never forget the teacher kept telling us uh, when we think about adding flour to the pasta, pasta dough, she kept saying piccolo, piccolo, and the students were saying, what does that mean? She said, just a little at a time, just a little at a time. So if the dough is sticky and you feel like you need a little bit of flour, just add a little bit at a time. Once we get through, you should have a nice kind of soft dough ball. We're gonna just let this rest for a little bit as we clean up the rest of our table. We don't want any of this stuff that we get off on our hands. We're really trying to make sure that we get our hands clean so when we roll out our pasta dough, all these leftover odds and ends from our flour are able to be scraped up. We can put them right back into that bowl that we originally started mixing our pasta dough in. And then we'll let our dough rest for about five to 10 minutes. This might be a nice time to talk a little bit about fat. Uh, and while the American Cancer Society doesn't have any particular recommendations regarding fat content in, uh, in their dietary recommendations uh, for a healthy diet, um, fat tends to come up a lot. And you'll see us using different kinds of fats today. Again, we used bacon fat in the dough. We're going to use and on some olive oil. Um, and um, oftentimes, sometimes we'll use a lot of butter or coconut oil. There's lots of different kinds of fat. But there's a reason that fat comes up a lot when you start to dig around at um, dietary guidelines for chronic disease. Uh, so like I mentioned, American Cancer Society doesn't have any specific guidelines for fat, um, but the overarching sort of lifestyle related guideline from the American Cancer Society is maintaining a healthy weight. So um, whatever chronic disease you're looking at, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, or cancer, obesity is probably one of the strongest predictors for um, developing that kind of disease when you're thinking about lifestyle um, factors. And fat of our three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, contains the highest calorie density. Uh, so twice the amount of calories in a gram of fat compared to our other macronutrients. So it makes sense that oftentimes the guidelines invite us to limit our fat intake. Notice I said limit, not eliminate. So fat is necessary for all sorts of reasons. Lots of healthy vitamins, um, lots of essential fatty acids are found in all kinds of fat. So please don't eliminate fat from your diet. Um, but as you'll see us doing today, you just wanna be smart with where you're using the fat. It's important for us because we like the texture that bacon fat happens to add to the dough. That's why we chose bacon fat. And you'll notice Nate just added, if you remember, he just added a little bit of bacon fat to the dough. About one teaspoon yeah. as we go through. Again, you don't need a lot. It's there just for flavor and to help kind of hold the dough, dough ball together. Right. Um, some of the other guidelines from the American Cancer um, Society include eating lots of fruits and vegetables. You'll notice in our second video when we teach you how to put the ravioli together, we're going to be packing our ravioli with a ton of um, vegetables, which is going to give us a really high um, nutrition density, which is also one of the recommendations from the American Cancer Society. And again, lots of uh, our dessert today later on is going to be apples, so um, we'll get a little bit of fruit there as well. So we let our dough rest. We're really trying to let all the ingredients incorporate and have the opportunity for our flour to incorporate some of that oil into the actual dough. We're gonna take our dough ball and we're just gonna cut off a portion of this dough ball. We don't need to roll it all out all at one time. We'll set that off to the side and we'll incorporate our dough back into a nice little ball so that we can kind of make sure that everything is incorporated nicely. 
you should see kind of this nice soft texture and you might notice that there'll be some different colors and some different uh, patterns of the olive oil as it continues to kind of work its way through the, the dough ball. We'll squeeze it a couple more times and as we do we're gonna incorporate a little bit of flour just so that we can roll out our pasta dough. Um, incorporating all of the stuff that we have into our dough ball, we press it out into a nice soft circle using the palm of our hand and getting it into a flat scenario. We also then don't need to incorporate a lot of extra flour. We're really just trying to use the flour to help keep everything from sticking onto our mat or onto our table. So as we continue to press, we'll grab our rolling pin. And a lot of times I like to dust the rolling pin just a little bit. So again, that rolling pin doesn't stick to our dough. Um, once things get really sticky, it's really hard to undo. So softly rolling from one side to the other, trying to incorporate a nice even pressure through that dough. And we're trying to get this dough to a even consistency all the way through. Um, this may take a little bit more time. A pasta roller is something that you could use if you really wanted to. Again, um, we're just trying to show how you do this by hand. We've used a couple different kinds of flours over the years. And if you look up pasta recipes online, you'll see things like double O flour or semolina flour. Um, experiment, have fun, use all sorts of different kinds of flour. We just happen to like the consistency of using an all purpose unbleached flour. Um, the semolina flour, when we tried that one, it gave the dough a little bit more of a gritty texture, which we just didn't prefer. So we chose, uh, we chose this one, but there's all sorts of different kinds of flours out there that, that you can try. And I love using, Nate's using a really heavy, heavy marble uh, rolling pin, which actually um, prevents you from having to do a lot of extra work because the weight of the rolling pin helps distribute the dough out nicely. We're looking for a nice, even, consistent texture. Um, you should be able to see some kind of general light through the dough. As you get through, you'll notice that the dough, some spots will be a little thicker or a little more dense. We're looking for a nice soft glow kind of through as you look at the pasta and you look at that, that dough ball lifting it up and being able to see through it is really kind of a big goal for ours, our, our good success of our pasta dough. We're not trying to put holes in it um, to get it too thin and we have to be really careful that we don't um, put seams in it, but we're just trying to get a nice even consistency all the way through that entire sheet of pasta. The other thing to remember is that we're going to be filling this later with um, some a vegetable puree filling. So uh, we might want to leave the dough a little bit thicker than we normally would if we were going to cut this into spaghetti or uh, linguine. So our dough is pretty much ready. If we wanted to do the entire surface and try to match that with another dough ball, we would continue with the next dough ball, cut off a next piece and we would be able to set all of our ravioli on here if we're gonna make ravioli. If we're gonna end up making it into pasta as far as tagliatelle or more of a spaghetti, a linguine style, um, and we would let it rest for about another five to 10 minutes. And that resting time, again, gives that dough a little bit of more elasticity, dries some of those oils out, and allows us to make it a nice, soft, supple dough for our noodles to be nice and easy to work with. Uh, if you're choosing to use this as a spaghetti, we oftentimes will just use a good old pizza cutter to like yep. so cut strips of nice, pasta. Nice, even, simple strips. Again, if you're in Italy, they would probably tell you that this would all be scrap. A lot of times they'll cut everything off so it's perfectly square. In our house, a lot of the irregular shapes, the kids really enjoy. So again, your choice as far as what you want to do. But with a pizza cutter, you can make nice, simple, easy strips all the way through. Thin or thick, kind of up to you. As we go through, again, good sharp knife can do the same thing, um, but you get a nice, simple pasta that you can use. Um, if you're gonna end up making this pasta, I would let this dry, and this is where our baking pan comes in and our towel comes in. We'll just let set that off to the side. If you don't have a pizza cutter, um, you can use a simple sharp knife, just trying to be careful of cutting through as you cut through. Nice, simple, soft motion as well, coming through and cutting a nice, simple line 
all the way through that piece. If we're gonna be making some kind of ravioli, this is where we would use our ravioli cutters. So ravioli is a stuffed pasta. Um, we can do one of two things. We can roll out another sheet, or we can take this and flip this over if we were gonna fill it, and just press down our ravioli right on top of there, slide back and forth, and work through cutting out that pasta to a ravioli shape. Again, with our filling inside of there, we'd have that, that pasta all set, ready to go. Circles, squares, um, we can also use a trusty fork and a knife. So maybe you don't have the ravioli, that's not a problem. We come through, cut it with our knife as well into whatever shape we're interested in doing. Let's say we're gonna cut these two in half here. And then we can just press this down with a fork, make that super special ravioli flare on the outside. <laughs> and again, very simple making pasta. Right. You can fill this with ricotta cheese, vegetables, um, anything, anything that you'd like, which is one of the fun things about making ravioli. It is. Our kids really liked having the ability. It's like um, cookies at Christmas. Right. So. Yeah. So if you have any questions about making ravioli, you can certainly shoot either Nate and I, or I an email, and we'd be happy to answer any questions for you. But that is all we have for you uh, for now related to ravioli, but stay tuned, because we'll be taking this ravioli and stuffing it with some yummy vegetables next. Sounds good. Alice Lorraine Hampton Bryant. Half this, half that. Racially tanned, she was often with short natural hair before it was called natural, then Afro without explanation. Mistaken for Ethiopian, Egyptian, or Sudanese. She was Leonard's only daughter, raised a tomboy, his center and ghostly other. When he died, she cried like the bereaved lover. She came out of a strictly human cast, or so she told her children, told us to think of ourselves, not mere apostrophes of a captive, despised race, but larger than that, mere coincidence of a natural fact. She'd written the prepared script of her own life and then rue the day since she'd been running buddies with Lorraine Hansberry. She spun out other orbits where we could create as well with our own going beyond a single category as the primary consideration. She quotes Shakespeare and Rousseau, yet the two were confused in our minds. Distant contradictories, yes, a way to make anew, yet a longing to be right here. While in our darkening minds, we tended to those ever-present dangers. We were captive to her half-baked vision, her rage so mired with stately reference to our true humanity. Our own individuality took us away from the what is that made our physical features so African-seeming, feeling so like a sting against the levelings of freedom marches, the cause, the crusade. Too diffuse her otherworldly energies that the unconscious country at the time would not accept, she developed other strategies, block club meetings, church women proceedings, demure political and social verities, as well as a petition to keep a bus terminal from being built in our stiff middle-class neighborhood. A real ball of wax that deflected and yet oddly defined the real issue, the singular cause to pass on to us in those overheated 60s, a sense that we weren't really just black, but to her, something more than that. 
and she, on the contrary, took offense at this newly arrived consciousness and spoke not of black, but Negro history as an almost corrective for those then shark infested waters. The riots were her plum to eat with relish to prove her own point about the pit buried deep in the sweet flesh. She cast empirically based judgments upon this seemingly new emerging race. The more things change, the more they remain the same. She was resigned as the whole west side of Chicago burned and Fred Hampton lay in a bullet riddled heap on his bed. She offered me better advice, more down to earth common sense as a matter of personal survival in those troubled times. Think not of yourself as educated, sensitive, cultivated. If you join the rabble and a white policeman sees you, none of these things count. To him, you're just a nigger. So the answer for her was to finally withdraw and quietly build her own domain, make it invisible as well as intractable should anyone unworthy try to enter and face the loneliness of her truly lost cause as she did herself, dying of cancer just after turning 50 in her bed, obstinate, taciturn, still in her own words, self-reliant, her whispering deflated voice over the phone telling me her only son, I'm not dying. Cancer's a doctor's hoax. It's a question of mind over matter. Don't rush here for me. I'll beat the crap. I'll make it through. You'll see. But the what is finally had its day. And later my sister bitterly turned to me and said, I saw her dying into a heap of skin and bones. You should have never believed her. You should have been there. Forgive me, Sean, for abandoning you. What you say is true, but as her only son, in the end, I could have only done what she wanted me to do. It is the loneliness of that senseless and unfounded hope she spoke of that I speak to you now, for Claire, for you. Welcome. My name is Michelle Rosinko, and here at Gustavus Adolphus College, we're preparing for the 56th Nobel Conference, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. Soon thought leaders will be coming to campus, and we will be exploring the science of these new treatments, the ethical issues surrounding who has access to these treatments, and the optimism how these new treatments will extend and improve the life for people living with cancer. Now, all of this is fascinating to me, and yet for many of us, cancer is really personal. I remember exactly where I was standing in my kitchen when my primary care doctor called and told me I had invasive lobular cancer. I don't really remember the words after that, I remember being overwhelmed with fear, and I remember feeling like my body was shutting down. I knew I needed to find a way to calm my mind and stay present in my body if I was going to make good decisions on my cancer journey. So I found my way to my yoga mat. Now a yoga practice can support us, but I wanna be clear it never takes the place of your medical team, the diagnosis and treatment you decide on with them. But there is a whole science behind how yoga can support you during cancer. And I wanna just share a little bit about that. The first thing I want to do is bring us into an awareness of our breath. 
Now they have known for many years, the sages years ago wrote about how breath can support our health. Current research shows that breath can support our immune system. So that's where we're gonna start today. Here's one thing I want you to think about. We are three-dimensional beings. Our bodies have depth, our bodies have width, and our bodies have length. And so do our lungs. So when we're breathing, we want to think very three-dimensionally. To start with, I just want you to bring your awareness down to your belly. And I want you to feel and notice how when you inhale, your belly expands. And when you exhale, it sinks in a little. And try again, expanding and sinking in. And just let go of that and go back to whatever your natural breathing is. When we're asleep at night, our bodies breathe us. We don't have to intentionally do anything. And you can always come back to just that comfortable place of your body breathing you. Let's move up just a little bit into the rib cage. And let's think about the breath expanding side to side and the ribs expanding like an accordion and then narrowing on the exhale. So again, inhaling into your width and exhaling into your narrowness. And again, just let go of that. Go back to your natural, comfortable breath pattern. And the last thing we want to do is think about our length. The upper lobes of our lungs come all the way under our collarbones. And when we inhale, we fill up those upper lobes of the lungs. That's kind of hard to feel sometimes. The easiest way for me to feel it is to yawn. And it doesn't matter if it's a pretend yawn. So just take a pretend yawn. <sighs> Do you feel how you can get air way up here? So now, I want to think about breathing in all those dimensions of our lungs. So we're going to expand the belly, expand the ribs, inhale into the high lungs, exhale and soften, exhale and narrow, exhale and sink in. That's a three-part breath. Let's try that again. Inhale into the belly, Inhale into the ribs, inhale into those high lungs, and exhaling from the high and the middle and the low. And just pause for a minute. Just notice your breath. This is not to say you're breathing wrong. There's lots of ways we can breathe. But a friend once described it like we live in a five bedroom house and we spend all of our time in the kitchen. We're like that with our lungs. Sometimes we don't breathe into their fullness. So before we move on, just take a moment and breathe into your fullness. Feel the belly, the ribs, the high lungs, down from the high lungs, narrowing in the ribs, softening in the belly. And let go of that. Now to breathe fully, we need the support of our spine. And so the next thing I want to introduce today is the five directions our spine can move. But before I get there, I jumped in real quick today. I'm sitting on a big old bolster. You might be sitting on the floor, you might be sitting on a chair. You can sit wherever you are comfortable. Comfort and ease is your guide here. My students would joke that I travel with a pelvis everywhere. When you're sitting, you want to sit on your sit bones. You don't want to be rocked back on your tailbone here. So if it's hard to sit low to the floor, 
you want to lift your pelvis up. If you want to try to be on the floor, maybe put a pillow or a, a couch cushion or a couple of rolled up blankets. You want to be able to sit so you're on your sit bones. And that's going to allow your spine to move and your lungs to fully expand. The first way I want to think about our spine is to go into that vertical dimension, that magnificent length. And so as you're inhaling, I want you to imagine that your head is floating upward. And as you exhale, stay tall, don't collapse. So we're just gonna breathe into all of our magnificent length. And we're gonna exhale and stay supported. Reaching to either side, go ahead and take an inhale and sweep your arms up. And if they can't straighten all the way, that's okay. Deal with the body you have right now. Bring your hands together and into heart center. So go ahead and lace your fingers. And as you open your hands, think about your heart reaching forward. We're doing a little bit of a back extension. Not a big one, just a little one. And then as we exhale, we're gonna bring our hands forward and we're gonna hollow Take our spine into forward flexion. Inhale up. I'm gonna side bend to the right and just feel the left side of my rib cage open up. Inhale up, side bend. Inhale up. Now undo the hands and very gently spiral or rotate to your right. I'm putting one hand on my knee, one hand behind me. I'm gonna look over my right shoulder. Now I'm not forcing or cranking my spine. I'm just gently looking right there. And then I'm gonna inhale up, exhale down and gently look over my left shoulder. Inhale up, exhale down breath. Now we're going to do the other side, but I want you to take a moment and think, how could I be a little more comfortable? Do I need to sit a little higher or do my knees really not like this? Now I have yoga blocks here because I'm in the studio and I could prop my legs up with some yoga blocks. If you're at home and you want to try this and you want to prop your legs, I have found two rolls of paper towel work fabulously. So you can try that. I'm going to switch which leg is folded in front just so I can work both sides. You can also take a leg out to the side or you might switch and sit in a chair. It'll work just fine there too. I want you to bring this into your everyday life. So here we go. I'm going to talk you through it again. Inhaling up, exhaling hands to heart. Lace the fingers, inhale a little bit of a back bend or a back extension, exhale into forward flexion, inhale up, let's take left, side left, inhale up, side right, inhale up, undo the hands, rotate the spine, not forcing, looking over the left shoulder. Inhale up, exhale. Rotating the other way, looking over the right shoulder. Inhale up, exhale down. So here's what I want you to take away today. These are practices that you can sprinkle through your day. You don't need it to go to an hour long yoga class somewhere. That's lovely to do. But it's equally valuable if you just take moments in your day 
to fully breathe. Let's review that. When we inhale, the belly expands, the ribs expand into the high lobes, exhaling from the top down, ribs in, belly in. Just finding your breath. First thing you have when you come into the world and it's the last thing when you leave it's always there and it's a marvelous tool to support your immune system the spine which supports our body it it helps us to breathe fully and it helps our immune system again to fully function there's five ways we can move our spine we can elongate, we can back bend or extend, we can curve front or flex, side bending, and spiraling. And again, doing this, if you're sitting at a computer and you've been working too long, just push yourself back and inhale up, exhale down, inhale backbone, front. Inhale up, side bending. Inhale up, side bending. Inhale up, rotating to one side. Inhale up, rotating to the other side. Inhale up, and down. I'm going to leave, I'm going to wrap up with one final practice. It's a practice of well-wishing. I'm going to say a wish for you. I'm going to, the first line I'm going to say is, may you be safe. And I want you to silently repeat, may I be safe. And I'm going to take you through four of these well wishes, loving kindness, extended to you, to extend to yourself. My biggest goal in teaching these little slices of how yoga supports us on our cancer journey is that we think of our body as a friend and as an ally. It's not the enemy. We're going to work with it. So we're going to send a lot of loving kindness to it. If you're comfortable doing so, you can close your eyes or you're welcome to keep them open. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you find peace. big breath down. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to share two more videos where I'm going to talk a little bit about how we want to keep our range of comfort, our range of motion, and keep our strength for the journey. And also how this practice can support us with anxiety and stress which is ever present in our lives. Be well. I look forward to seeing you virtually at the conference. The Now and After, Part 1. It was tomorrow and it is yesterday. This video is meant to show how a viewer would interact with the sculptural work in this exhibition. However, due to the current COVID-19 safety protocols on campus at Gustavus Adolphus College, gallery visitors are not permitted to touch or interact with the sculptural work, as the work cannot be effectively disinfected. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Now and After, an exhibition by me, Alison Hiltner. 
There are two pieces in this exhibition, and the first one we'll be looking at is It Was Tomorrow and It Is Yesterday, which places the viewer into a science fiction-styled interpretation of the natural world. The main ingredient of this work is microalgae, more specifically, spirulina. I selected this species because of its frequent connection to being utilized as a CO2 scrubber slash oxygen generator and fuel source. It is a journey into cultivating and utilizing this difficult to define organism, cyanobacteria. Spirulina is neither flora or fauna. Instead, it is a mixture of neither and both, deriving its energy from photosynthesis, its only solid connection to flora. It also possesses the infrastructure of a unicellular parasite. The blooms encased inside of these vinyl sacs respond to CO2 data collected by blowing into a sensor apparatus that you see that looks similar to a microphone. The audience can start an exchange where the cyanobacteria releases a unified sigh of oxygenated air in the form of bubbling chatter. Viewers can breathe into the sensor within the gallery and the duration of the aeration pumps attached to the cyanobacteria sacs will quicken in response to the breath input, creating a rhythmic rudimentary form of communication. Do you want to breathe into it? The Now and After, Part 2, Tethers. This video is meant to show how a viewer would interact with the sculptural work in this exhibition. However, due to the current COVID-19 safety protocols on campus at Gus Davis Adolphus College, gallery visitors are not permitted to touch or interact with the sculptural work, as it cannot be effectively disinfected. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. The second piece we'll be looking at today is tethers. Signals create life from chaos. Life implies connection, and connection is vital. When cells detach from their environment, they lose connections and die. This concept is universal. It is the immediacy of our sense of touch that dissuades loneliness. Tethers is about focusing on this connection and about the signals we send into the world that weave us into the greater matrix of existence. How does it feel to hold a heart, our own or someone else's? With tethers, I have created a physical interface where someone can feel the pulsation of the heart in their hands. A participant merely needs to place a fingertip on the green glowing sensor, and data is transmitted into the pulsating translucent white fingertips that are encased in what was once a transplant organ transport module. Then they pulsate to the rhythm of that person's heartbeat. The reason the work is centered around the heartbeat is twofold, both coming from my experiences as an artist in residence at the University of Minnesota School of Medicine in the Visible Heart Lab and System Regeneration Lab. The first is learning that cells can essentially die of loneliness. And then when I held a still beating pig heart in my bare hands, leading me to the realization of how separated we are from our bodies and the vastness of what we simply take for granted. The beating of our heart is a muted physical sensation for us 
at most background noise that can comfort or concern. But in reality, it is a powerful universal connection, a sign of life that is always felt and should be shared. In the midst of a global pandemic that is exposing radical inequalities in U.S. society and in our healthcare system, it seems appropriate to reflect a bit on what cancer narratives can tell us about these kinds of issues. French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir's account of her mother Françoise's death from cancer in the early 1960s, a book titled A Very Easy Death, is a great source for this. The signs of Françoise de Beauvoir's cancer weren't read right. By the time it was finally diagnosed, it was too late. She was already on her deathbed. Simone de Beauvoir clearly describes how, both in the lead up to her mother's diagnosis and in the month that she lay dying, her mother's doctors were dismissive of her concerns, condescending about what one of them even called her little life, and obsessed with their own heroic feats rather than the quality of life of their patient. The title of this book is ironic. It's a reference to how her mother's doctors and nurses described her death. And we, of course, see only the opposite. But Beauvoir also acknowledges that her mother's death was a relatively privileged one, and that inequalities in the healthcare system make other people's deaths even worse. And I'm going to read an extract from the book now. What would have happened if mom's doctor had detected the cancer as early as the first symptoms? No doubt it would have been treated with rays, and mom would have lived two or three years longer. But she would have known or at least expected the nature of her disease and she would have passed the end of her life in a state of dread. What we bitterly regretted was that the doctor's mistake had deceived us. Otherwise, mom's happiness would have become our chief concern. The difficulties that prevented Jeanne and Poupette from having her in the summer would not have counted. I should have seen her more. I should have invented things to please her. And is one to be sorry that the doctors brought her back to life and operated or not? She who did not want to lose a single day won 30. They brought her joys, but they also brought her anxiety and suffering. Since she did escape from the martyrdom that I sometimes thought was hanging over her, I cannot decide for her. For my sister, losing mom the very day she saw her again would have been a shock from which she would have scarcely recovered. And as for me, those four weeks have left me pictures, nightmares, sadnesses that I should never have known if mom had died that Wednesday morning. But I cannot measure the disturbance that I should have felt since my sorrow broke out in a way that I had not foreseen. We did derive an undoubted good from this respite. It saved us, or almost saved us, from remorse. When someone you love dies, you pay for the sin of outliving her with a thousand piercing regrets. Her death brings to light her unique quality. She grows as vast as the world that her absence annihilates for her and whose whole existence was caused by her being there. You feel that she should have had more room in your life, all the room, if need be. You, sat, you snatch yourself away from this wildness. She was only one among many. But since you never do all you might for anyone, not even within the arguable limits that you have set yourself, you have plenty of room left for self-reproach. With regard to mom, we were above all guilty these last years of carelessness, omission, and abstention. We felt that we atoned for this by the days that we gave, gave up to her by the peace that our being there gave her, and by the victories gained over fear and pain. Without our obstinate watchfulness, she would have suffered far more. For indeed, comparatively speaking, her death was an easy one. Don't leave me in the power of the brutes. I thought of all those who have no one to make that appeal to. What agony it must be to feel oneself a defenseless thing, utterly at the mercy of indifferent doctors and overworked nurses. No hand on the forehead when terror seizes them. No sedative as soon as pain begins to tear them. 
no lying prattle to fill the silence of the void. She aged 40 years and 24 hours. That phrase, too, had obsessed my mind. Even today, why? There are horrible, agonizing deaths. And then in the public wards, when the last hour is coming near, they put a screen round the dying man's bed. He has seen the screen round other beds that were empty the next day. He knows. I pictured mom, blinded for hours by the black sun that no one could look at directly. The horror of her staring eyes with their dilated pupils. She had a very easy death, an upper class death. Welcome back. You might wonder, how did we choose the pieces that you've been experiencing? And I will tell you simply that we knew that when we addressed the topic of cancer, we wanted to address it as a, a complete human experience. And so you've had a little bit of that complete human experience during the last 45 minutes if you stayed with our, our stream of pre-recorded content. You saw someone, you saw some people cooking, you saw yoga, you saw poetry, you saw essay, uh, you saw art, because all of those are media through which the human being tries to make sense of the experience of cancer. We can't, of course, do without the science, and we also can't do without, I believe, poetry and art. So I really want to thank all of my colleagues who have created all of that wonderful content. One of the things that you maybe heard in Michelle Rusinko's yoga presentation, um, professor of dance, is that she talked about the fact that one can engage in practices for just a few minutes a day, you know, push away from your desk and take some breaths. And those can actually revive and rejuvenate you. All of us working at home these days know about that. One of our other presenters, actually, is someone who, uh, Professor Catherine Schmitz, will be talking about the role of exercise in cancer treatment, and, and um, she calls it moving through cancer. One of the things that Professor Schmitz often suggests that people do, and in fact, she makes people do it at conferences, and I am certain that were we meeting live, Professor Schmitz, at some point during her talk, would have said, okay, now we're going to do an exercise snack. Unfortunately, this does not involve Rice Krispie bars or M&Ms, but it does involve just taking a few minutes and doing a little simple exercise that you can do wearing the clothes that you're wearing right now, not needing to put on special shoes or take off your jacket or anything of the sort. One of the ones that she's very fond of doing, and you'll, you'll see it all over the web, is just a few squats. So I invite you right now Yes, you, as she would say, to stand up from your chair and just do a few squats. She would encourage us to do this for about 30 seconds to a minute. I'm not going to do that right now because I'm all alone in this room and I feel just a tiny bit silly doing that. However, I encourage you to do so because indeed we do know that our human bodies are human bodies and they really need some exercise. A few items of business. First of all, for those of you who attempted to go into a discussion at... Uh, at 11.45 and were unable to find the link. Apologies about that. Here's the deal. You have to go to the Nobel Conference webpage, or actually easily enough, you can just go to gustavus.edu and you'll see our large banner um, photograph at the top of the page will be the Nobel Conference link. So you can go to gustavus.edu, press the arrow button and you'll be taken to the conference. And there, when a, when a discussion is about to start, you'll see a the, the Zoom link crawling across the bottom of your screen, and it will include the, the meeting code. We're doing this as a security measure, so those of you watching on Facebook or, other, uh, or through YouTube directly, just know that if you want to enter a discussion, you need to go to the Gustavus page, our home page, and get there that way, just because we know that um, there are lots of ways to enter a Zoom call that don't have anything to do with wanting to talk about cancer, so we want to prevent that from happening. Just a reminder that we are um, posting on Twitter, and you can follow us there um, at Nobel Conference, and please feel free to join that conversation. This is our 56th Nobel Conference, and so if you use hashtag Nobel56, we will be able to see what you're posting about. Um, I invite you, if you'd like, to send us a picture of where, 
where you're viewing the conference. I've been joking all along that I'm pretty sure that most people will have a more comfortable chair than either the bleachers or the folding chairs in Lund Arena. So even though we're sad not to be together, you're probably happy that, that you're sitting in a comfortable chair um, at a computer that is perfectly well positioned so that you can look at the screen, I hope. Um, let's see. I want to let you know that um, this, the next talk, which will be happening quite soon, is, um, is a little bit longer than some of the others. And so we want to make sure that we, uh, that we get all of that talk in and still get an hour for you to have discussion. And so we will be starting that talk right at 1245. Um, and then after that, we will be going right to the discussion, right from the talk. And so there will not be a little discussion with me and one of the conference hosts. Um, also, the next talk that we're hearing is a talk that involves a technical concept uh, within the social science literature, and I just wanted to say a little tiny bit about that concept. Uh, Dr. Shanita Hughes-Halbert is a social science researcher, and she uses this concept of social determinants of health. And in fact, just this last summer, Dr. Hughes Halbert and one of her colleagues received a, a major grant from, uh, from Duke University uh, to identify these social determinants of health in primary care patients. So just a little bit of a description of what she means when she talks about social determinants of health, I think will be helpful in um, looking at the conversation. So social determinants of health are those conditions that characterize your environment. And you might think, well, duh. But it turns out that studying them and really studying them on the micro level is an incredibly important thing to do. Um, social determinants might be, where do you work? What are the circumstances of your work environment? For many of us, those circumstances have changed dramatically in the last few months. Uh, where do you live? What's your, what's your dwelling place like? Where do you play? Where do you contribute to your community in various ways? What are the other uh, circumstances in which you find yourself? It might be your housing, it might be your transportation, it might be your food, but it might also be more unusual things that you don't necessarily think about, like your access to technology. I know in my own case, as I've been working partly from home for the last several months, I'm very acutely aware as a rural resident of the ways in which my access to technology raises my levels of stress because I'm not able to participate um, to the extent that I should be. Another concept that uh, Dr. Hughes Halbert will be using in her um, discussion is the notion of community-based research. And that concept is perhaps familiar to many of you, but just to say again a word about it, it's the notion of research that is grounded in a community's interests and um, rises, arises from that community's, um, uh, that community's needs and interests. And so much of the work that Dr. Hughes Halbert has been working on has been um, of this nature. Sometimes, um, some, sometimes that's also referred to as um, participatory action research. Uh, so that's just a little bit to help you to think about the, um, to, to enter into Dr. Hughes Halbert's talk, which will be coming up in just a few um, seconds, actually. Um, my colleague, Haley Russell, who is an associate professor in the Department of Health and Exercise Science at Gustavus, has been a member of this committee, and Dr. Russell will be introducing our next speaker for us. So, Dr. Russell. An exploration of cancer in the age of biotechnology would be incomplete without an examination of disparities and inequities along with their possible solutions. Dr. Shanita Hughes-Halbert, a psychologist and medical researcher, is at the forefront of addressing these questions. Her work focuses on understanding how healthcare inequity, particularly racial inequity, shapes cancer risk and outcomes. Dr. Hughes Halbert has examined interventions to increase African American women's participation in breast cancer screenings, community based programs to help patients navigate the healthcare system, racial disparities in quality of life after cancer diagnosis, and the impact of stress on disease progression in African American men. Dr. Hughes Halbert earned her undergraduate degree at Hampton University 
and her master's and doctorate degrees at Howard University. She is now professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Smart State Endowed Chair in Cancer Disparities at the Hollings Cancer Center at the Medical University of South Carolina. Prolific in the field, Dr. Hughes-Halbert's work has been funded through the National Institutes on Minority Health and Health Disparities and the National Cancer Institute. Among her many accolades, Dr. Hughes-Halbert was appointed by President Barack Obama to the National Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Advisors. In 2018, she was awarded the Distinguished Lecture on the Science of Cancer and Health Disparities by the American Association for Cancer Research. Additionally, she's been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Hughes Halbert's work is groundbreaking, exemplifies interdisciplinarity, and focuses on community engagement and strategies to reduce disparities. We are thrilled to welcome her to Nobel Conference 56. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to participate in this exciting conference and for the opportunity to discuss transformational research in cancer health disparities. Now, cancer health disparities has been the focus of my academic career, but this has been a focus of empirical investigation for at least the past two decades and continues to grow in terms of its breadth, depth, and impact on our population's health. Now, cancer health disparities refers to differences in cancer risk and outcomes between individuals from diverse racial and ethnic minority groups when compared to non-minorities. When we think about cancer health disparities, the focus has been on understanding differences in cancer risk factors and outcomes between individuals from minority and non-minority groups. And these first and second generation studies have been critically important to providing the empirical basis and documentation of the nature and distribution of how racial minorities differ from non-minorities in terms of cancer risk and outcome factors. Now, consistent with the overall goal of translating research findings into action, uh, research is now being conducted to evaluate the effects of intervention strategies on cancer risk behaviors such as uh, cigarette smoking, obesity, and access to health care. Now, in many ways, um, these first and second generation studies were transformational because they radically changed uh, our understanding of minority health and health disparities and has led to the creation of a new paradigm for addressing racial disparities and cancer outcomes. Now, as the field of cancer health disparities has matured, so has our thinking and conceptualization of the factors that contribute to disparities. As shown in this figure, it is now widely recognized that biological, behavioral, environmental, and system level factors operate at multiple levels of influence to influence cancer health disparities. My goal during the presentation today is to provide examples of where we are uh, now in terms of our understanding of how these factors shape cancer health disparities and where the field is going to develop, implement, and disseminate interventions that can promote cancer health equity. So one of the ways in which cancer health disparities research has been transformed is through the focus that has been placed on working collaboratively with community-based organizations and other types of stakeholders to design, implement, and evaluate interventions to improve health care and outcomes in racial and ethnic minorities. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, an academic community partnership that I developed uh, while I was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was called the Triumphant Living Collaborative, which was established uh, with funding from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities to develop infrastructure for academic researchers and community-based organizations as well as community residents to work collaboratively to develop interventions that address disparities uh, in health promotion and disease prevention among African Americans in the greater uh, Philadelphia metropolitan area. To do this, one of our goals was to identify and prioritize um, health concerns and issues and to translate that information 
into uh, interventions that would be developed, implemented, and evaluated um, collaboratively by the partnership. We also had a goal of developing resources to help uh, both academic investigators uh, to be more effective in working collaboratively with community partners, but we also wanted to develop community capacity to be um, equally able to be effective partners in an academic community partnership. Our last goal for the partnership was to develop um, and implement interventions uh, inter strategies for disseminating uh, the results of, of interventions to academic and community stakeholders. And I think this was a really important component of our partnership because we recognized early on that um, it was important for us to um, tell our community stakeholders, tell our community uh, what the findings from our research were, but also to have an opportunity for um, residents to participate in an education process that didn't involve them really participating uh, in a research study per se. So we had a really vibrant, uh, robust community information workshop program that was designed to disseminate findings from uh, studies that were related to health promotion and disease prevention uh, beyond and, and beyond the um, specific work that was being done in our partnership. And this was a way for us to um, address uh, health concerns that had been that had been identified as priorities among our community residents. So this graph here is showing you uh, the members, uh, the academic and community organizations that were involved in our partnership. I want to point out a couple of things that I think are really important to know about uh, how the partnership was developed. So first, um, while it did include academic organizations, first um, the University of Pennsylvania and then uh, uh, later on in our process, the Medical University of South Carolina, it also included community-based organizations that were um, had a, a strategic mission and focus on health promotion and disease prevention, uh, but provided um, the expertise and capacity to expand our breadth and depth of and that, uh, to increase, improve our ability to address community concerns. So for instance, the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer uh, is a grassroots organization that focuses on uh, developing community education programs and developing uh, collaboratively with um, other grassroots organizations as well as academic medical centers. The Health Promotion Council of Southeastern Pennsylvania is another type of community-based organization that had expertise in health education, health promotion, uh, and service delivery uh, and communication sciences. And so collectively, we all brought, um, I think, a really different types of expertise to the table to, to help us and enable us to address, uh, first to identify uh, community concerns, prioritize them uh, in a, a equitable way, and then develop interventions and solutions to address those concerns and then work collaboratively to address them. So we were, um, one of the things I think is important to acknowledge is that the NIMHD or the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities was really forward thinking when they established um, their community-based participatory research program. So they set it up in three phases and the first phase was focused on um, developing the partnership and this was a three-year phase that um, where we were charged with identifying community health priorities uh, and developing and pilot testing interventions um, to see that to build the evidence base for um, conducting larger scale uh, randomized trials which was the focus of the second phase of the overall program and the second phase of our triumphant living academic community partnership. So with funding from the NIMHD, we conducted a comparative effectiveness trial of risk education. We also received funding from the NCI or the National Cancer Institute to um, conduct an observational study that examined uh, the effects of a community-based navigation program for cancer control. 
And then we also received funding from the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to disseminate um, information about breast cancer uh, prevention using a community information workshop program format. And then the third phase, which was a, a three year period of time, uh, focused on disseminating the results of our research uh, to community stakeholders. And for this initiative, for this component or this phase, we didn't limit um, participation to uh, individuals who have participated in our research studies. We really cast a wide net and opened up our community information workshops to the larger uh, Philadelphia area. And we also worked um, with our community-based organizations in the Philadelphia area to implement the interventions that had been evaluated as part of our comparative effectiveness trial. So this is what we found. Uh, and this uh, slide first shows you um, the outline and the layout for our comparative effectiveness trial. One of the things we learned in our first phase was that community residents um, were first concerned about cancer and cardiovascular disease and, and wanted um, interventions that would help them to live a healthier lifestyle. So community residents were not interested um, in a weight loss program. They did not want to have to come into a, an intervention or a program where they had to be weighed and the expectation was that they were working to lose a specific amount of weight. Rather, our community residents told us through our focus groups, key informant interviews, and a community health survey that they wanted um, interventions that would help them to live a healthier lifestyle while being more physically active and by eating a healthier diet. That led us to a focus on a developing a risk education program. And the, the rationale for the risk education program, which was developed uh, with under the leadership of our community partners from the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer and the Health Promotion Council of Southeastern Pennsylvania, was that um, that there that there was there were opportunities to help people understand the connection between risk factors for cancer and cardiovascular disease, help them understand the overlap or the share risk factors that exist between those two conditions and that if individuals um, ate a healthier diet, if they exercised more, then that would have implications for their risk of developing cardiovascular disease and would also have implications for their risk of developing some forms of cancer. We, we developed or thought of this idea that this would be an important motivating uh, factor because what, as we were doing our focus groups and key informant interviews, what became clear is that some um, residents sort of saw the connection between risk factors and was using that as sort of a motivating uh, a, a, a motivation that motivated them to uh, want to be healthier and it motivated them to want to be um, more physically active and motivated them to want to eat a healthier diet. At the same time, we also saw that some people didn't really see the connection and so we thought that um, our hypothesis was that if people sort of understood um, the shared risk factors between cancer and cardiovascular disease, which was covered um, as part of our integrated risk education program, it would lead to an aha moment and it would um, result in an increased um, engagement in eating uh, consumptions of fruits and vegetables and it would also increase their uh, physical activity level in comparison to uh, risk education that really focus um, just on helping people to understand uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. I also want to point out that, um, as you can see here, the set that was a four session protocol. And in developing the number of sessions for um, the interventions, we, we made some uh, strategic decisions, which one was that we thought about, we're thinking about the long-term um, ability to disseminate the risk education program <coughs> to community-based organizations. And an important feedback that we received along the way as we were developing 
the uh, risk education protocol um, for, and this feedback was from our community partners was that we needed to be mindful of how long and the amount of resources that it would take for a community-based organization to implement any type of intervention into their uh, service delivery and into their practice. That led us to um, develop a, a, a brief but intensive uh, risk education protocol brief in that it only it was only a four session protocol intensive uh, because it covered a significant amount i think a lot of information was covered um, in each one of these sessions so in addition to providing evidential content or content that was specific um, to disease facts and figures for african americans um, as shown in session one it each session incorporated um, concrete, tangible strategies, um, evidence-based strategies that individuals could uh, implement to change their behavior as it related to um, being, being more physically active and eating a healthier diet. I should also point out that, um, this, the, as I've mentioned, the protocols were developed under the leadership of our um, uh, collaborators from the Health Promotion Council of Southeastern Pennsylvania, but there are a lot of um, expertise at the table that uh, really shaped sort of what we, um, what we, uh, the content of the intervention protocols. One of the things that we paid particularly close attention to was ensuring that in addition to including some of the uh, act, uh, uh, components of motivational interviewing, um, it also, we also delivered uh, information that um, enable people to really act upon uh, the changes that were the behavioral strategies that were um, that were that were recommended as part of the intervention. So one example, um, you know, Philadelphia is an urban area. There's a trolley system. There's a bus system. There's a subway system. And one of the things that we included as sort of making more active choices were examples such as uh, participants could. Um, you know, get off the bus at a, a couple of stops before where they would normally get off the bus to go home or go to work and uh, walk the extra way. So it was really tailored to the geographic um, opportunities to be physically active and lead a, a healthier lifestyle that were um, of, um, sort of within the context of, of the Philadelphia metropolitan area. So we enrolled uh, 530 uh, community residents from the greater Philadelphia uh, metropolitan area into the comparative effectiveness trial. And there are a couple of things I want to point out and I, that I think are really important. Uh, so first, uh, participants were recruited using a community-based strategy that consisted of self-referrals from newspaper advertisements and flyers. Um, participants, initially, we um, limited participation to residents who lived uh, in the West Philadelphia community. But as we started our recruitment activities, um, individuals from the entire Philadelphia area uh, self-referred and were interested in participating. Our initial decision about uh, limiting participation to specific uh, zip codes in the south in the in the uh, southwest Philadelphia and West Philadelphia area was because our partnership was really focused on that um, that community, and we felt like that because it gave us a, um, more specific and precise geographic boundaries. But as we started uh, recruiting for the study, and there was uh, interest among individuals who lived across the entire Philadelphia metropolitan area, um, it became clearer, uh, the, the, uh, our initial thought process became uh, less important because you know we started to get questions from uh, individuals like, well, why can't I participate in the study? I don't understand why I can't participate in the study just because I don't live uh, in the West Philadelphia uh, community. So that led us to expand our um, a, a geographic uh, catchment area for the study to include the entire uh, Philadelphia metropolitan area. The second thing that I think is important to acknowledge uh, and just to point out is that 43% of our uh, sample were men. And this is important because typically 
uh, men are less willing, have lower enrollment um, in health promotion and disease prevention trials. And um, using our community-based dissemination strategies and the selection of those were informed by um, our staff members, uh, one of whom was a, a lifelong Philadelphia resident uh, who was a man who helped us think about the best places to um, distribute flyers, helped us to think about the best uh, newspapers to advertise, uh, to play study advertisements to reach uh, a, a more distribute uh, a more diverse uh, uh, community sample in terms of the ratio between men and women. Uh, the other things I think are important is that this research was done uh, and conducted uh, during the recession of 2008. So, um, you know, many people were not employed um, and had a uh, an income that was uh, less than the $20,000. And even though 78% of our participants had health insurance, um, most of those were covered through a state or government sponsored uh, insurance program. The other thing that I think is important to note is that um, the, the body mass index, the average body mass index was at the um, right up under the, the uh, obese uh, low category for being obese. So, you know, these are participants who, um, you know, I think where weight loss would really have been, would be an important goal. But again, consistent with the priority and the preference for um, an, an education program that really didn't focus on weight loss as a specific outcome. It really focused on helping people to live a healthier lifestyle. Um, I think it's, it's really important to just acknowledge that we honored that even though we saw that the average uh, body mass index was, was pretty high. So what did we find? Uh, well, first thing, first I just want to point out that we had, um, a, I think, a really high level of intervention completion. Uh, this is a really important metric because it helps us to uh, understand um, and identify any potential uh, biases associated with um, the ultimate effects of the intervention. And we didn't, there were 73% of participants were intervention completers, which meant that they completed all four of the intervention sessions. I should point out that um, one of the decisions that we made is that it would be important, it was important for us to provide uh, individuals with um, uh, resources, financial support to come to the session. So they were given a $20 uh, stipend to uh, pay for childcare, to pay for transportation. And that was uh, one of the uh, you know, features of our, our study uh, protocol. There are also no differences in, in intervention completion based on whether or not individuals are randomized to the integrated or disease-specific counseling, and there are no differences in intervention completion based on um, traditional socioeconomic or body socioeconomic characteristics or body mass index. So our primary outcomes were um, fruit and vegetable consumption and physical activity. And these are measured in terms of whether or not individuals met the recommended guidelines or did not meet the recommended guidelines. Uh, and what we didn't find any significant effects in terms of changes in the proportion of participants who met the recommended guidelines for fruit and vegetable intake. But we did find significant uh, increases in the proportion of, of um, participants who met the recommended guidelines among those who were um, randomized to the integrated um, risk education group. This shows the logistic regression model of, um, of, 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 this, of the, our physical activity outcome, which basically shows that um, after you control for variables that were associated with completing the one month follow-up interview, and this um, logistic regression model is based on our one month outcome data, is that um, there are no differences between the intervention groups, but that it was whether or not individuals completed um, the intervention sessions, all of the intervention sessions, and their um, education level. 
which I think are, is really important because one, it shows that um, all things being equal, we have two different two protocols that can be effective at, at producing increases in the likelihood of meeting and uh, meeting the recommended guidelines for physical activity. It also tells us, though, that um, completing the entire protocol is really important because you know, and, and I think this. Uh, this applies to any type of behavioral intervention. You know, we design our behavioral interventions to um, provide information in a sequential way that builds upon and re reinforces uh, the previous content. And so this uh, held true for our study and that and that people, participants who completed all four sessions were um, ha had the greatest, had an increased likelihood of meeting um, the recommended guidelines for physical activity after controlling for um, other variables as shown here. The other thing that I think is important to acknowledge about um, this program is that we, as I've mentioned earlier, um, we did pay particular attention to incorporating um, evidence-based strategies for eating a healthier diet and becoming more physically active. And I think one of the reasons why we saw increases in the proportion of, of participants who met the recommended guidelines for physical activity is because many of them did the actually use the behavior change strategies that were described and relevant for physical activity more so than for uh, dietary behaviors. And what I'm showing you now are um, the percentage of residents who um, reported that they um, started a walking program, excuse me, the percentage of participants who said that they started a walking program, made more active choices, um, and talked to a healthcare provider about their concerns or exercised in short bouts um, following the um, intervention. So you can see that it was fairly high in terms of uh, the likelihood, the percentage of, of, of participants who met, who did those, who performed those behaviors. And then finally, um, we also, because this was an academic community partnership, and the ultimate goal for, I think, any community-based participatory research program is that it actually targets and addresses community concerns. And what you can see here is that um, overall participants said that um, that our, the interventions address their concerns about physical activity. Um, it addressed their concerns related to in, vegetable intake and fruit intake. You can also see that there was um, a high level of engagement in terms of participants reading the intervention materials. And participants were also very satisfied with the health educator, her ability to explain issues and the convenience of participating in the sessions. I think, you know, if we had to do it over again, I, we would probably reconsider uh, the number of sessions that were offered based on 64% um, saying that they were satisfied with the number of sessions that were delivered. I think what we've heard, what we heard anecdotally after the intervention was completed was that participants really wanted more time to uh, be together, wanted more time with the health educator because what the information was valuable, what was important, and they enjoyed um, interacting as part of the group sessions. So this summarizes um, some of our key findings from sort of this community-based participatory approach program. And one of the things I think is, is a, a key take-home message that continues to inform the field today is that we need to have ongoing engagement of diverse stakeholders from the community, and we need to incorporate participatory strategies um, in, our, in our efforts that are focused on uh, promoting cancer health equity. Which is really why I think um, there's been this has been one of the focal areas when the in the All of Us research program. Uh, so community engagement uh, is a, an, an underlying or foundational a value within All of Us um, because it emphasizes. Um, active participation among diverse stakeholders to work to identify ways to um, implement affect strategies that can ensure the diversity of uh, participants who are enrolled um, in the All of Us research program. And I think the Precision Medicine has really, um, the Precision Medicine Initiative has encouraged us to think beyond um, the clinical strategies um, to efforts that enable us to 
um, deliver the right intervention at the right time to the right population. So we're sort of moving from sort of this precision medicine, which is really focused on, you know, a clinical application of individualized strategies to this precision public health approach, which is thinking broadly and, and reaching the population. And we can think about African Americans and um, racial and ethnic minority groups um, as sort of po different populations that can be targeted as part of precision public health strategies. One of the ways that we can think about this within the context of health cancer health disparities um, is from the perspective of, of diseases such as lung cancer, um, in which national data continue to show um, that African Americans are an important population for precision health interventions um, that can be used and employed to address risk behavior such as cigarette smoking. So consistent with this, precision precision prevention strategies for lung cancer emphasize early detection through lung cancer screening, tailoring pharmacological strategies according to smoking-related biomarkers, and identifying the most effective ways to deliver uh, smoking cessation interventions. These approaches have significant promise, but African Americans were underrepresented in the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, and limited efforts have been made to develop smoking cessation programs that are targeted to the smoking behaviors and patterns among African Americans. So this has raised some, I think, important concerns about um, the potential for precision medicine and precision prevention or precision public health to exacerbate um, cancer health disparities. And when we think about um, and one of the ways that this concern is being addressed is by uh, developing conceptual frameworks that have greater precision in terms of specifying the mechanistic pathways that are potentially important to racial disparities and cancer risk and outcomes. Now, this first model that I'm showing you here, which was developed through the Centers for Population Health and Health Disparities, uh, is important because it was one of the first to identify a determinants of disparities beyond um, health behaviors, psychological characteristics, and genetic factors. And it really sort of pushed us to sort of question um, how social conditions um, sort of contribute to um, how social conditions, health behaviors, and biological factors contribute to minority health and health disparities. And so we kind of have this sort of linear um, organization of these variables is all kind of each having their you know their their single singular contribution to um, minority health uh, and disparate health outcomes among racial and ethnic minority groups we now have um, conceptual models that are have greater precision I think and offer um, greater explanation about the potential mechanisms and pathways um, and how these um, stress pathways, physio physiological and behavioral reactions and genomic pathways um, can contribute to racial disparities and cancer outcomes. So we're now be becoming more, um, I think, precise and more mechanistic in, under in beginning to think through and, and understand um, the pathways that are important to racial disparities and cancer outcomes. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about um, our center, our Precision Medicine Center um, our, at the at Medical University of South Carolina, which is a transdisciplinary collaborative center in precision medicine and minority men's health, um, as one example of how this sort of the mechanism, mechanistic model, this more pathway-oriented model for cancer health disparities is used to address precision medicine and minority men's health. So our group has, and as others, have really been focused on understanding uh, prostate risk and outcomes because it continues to be one of the leading causes of cancer among men. Uh, African-American men continue to have a greater uh, incidence from prostate cancer and have significantly uh, continue to have greater morbidity and mortality from this disease. Our group has worked to understand um, determinants of racial differences in uh, quality of life outcomes 
um, and other psychological reactions to being diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, as well as understand screening behaviors. And one of the things that we found consistently was that perceptions of stress um, were important to men's um, quality of life, their emotional well-being, their physical well-being following their prostate cancer diagnosis. Perceptions of stress were also important to how men responded to uh, being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so this really sort of began to generate questions for us about um, how psychosocial stress uh, is a potential pathway through which uh, that's important to the initiation and progression of, of prostate cancer and can also be an important uh, variable in how men respond. As you can see in this figure, our Precision Medicine Center is exploring and examining several different ways in which stress can influence racial disparities and disease processes among African American and white men. Now, stress is a multidimensional construct, and our center is, ex is examining stress as a social determinant and as a physiological response that influences uh, disease uh, outcomes. Our conceptualization, conceptualization of stress as um, both a social determinant and a physiological response was, was influenced by the unique stressors, uh, unique acute and chronic stressors that African American men experience on a daily basis, and previous studies that have shown that social and psychological stressors impact um, processes that are important to uh, the initiation and progression of disease. Our decision specifically to use allostatic load as the overarching physiological framework and biomarker uh, in the center is because it is a marker of how much social and psychological stressors impact biological functioning. Several studies have shown that African Americans and whites differ in terms of allostatic load, but within the context of racial disparities research, minority health research, and cancer health disparities research in particular, uh, there's been limited attention to the ways in which allostatic load uh, are associated with uh, psychological responses, behavioral responses, and the um, biological processes that are important to the initiation and progression of disease. Uh, this led us to uh, focus on developing a better understanding of the effects of allostatic load on disease processes and outcomes as part of our center. Amen. So our overarching question for the center is how uh, is really trying to understand how psychosocial stress influences cellular stress response. I think it's important that this work is being conducted in South Carolina, um, where there, you know, this state, our my state, uh, in particular, I think really reflects the broader um, social context and geographic challenges that exist across the country. As, uh, as you can see um, under the project descriptions, all of the studies focus on prostate cancer in a, a critical a clinical uh, time point within the trajectory from diagnosis to uh, treatment. So project one, for instance, is examining uh, stress responses and allostatic load and how they influence immune responses to a prostate cancer vaccine among men who have a high risk for uh, developing a recurrence of their prostate cancer. Project two is working to identify novel biomarkers that can improve the precision of identifying prostate cancers that need to be treated. Um, and we're doing this within the context of understanding the distribution of these biomarkers um, based on allostatic load um, and self-reported characteristics uh, and social factors. And then the third project is conducted uh, in the uh, Veterans Health Administration and our VA, our, the v, v, Veterans, the Ralph H. Johnson uh, Veterans Administration uh, here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is to examine the effects of vitamin D sup supplementation on molecular changes uh, in the prostate among men who are undergoing a prostate biopsy. 
We implement uh, a standard social determinant survey to understand uh, the nature and distribution of a, a variety of stressors that uh, exist in terms of socioeconomic characteristics, uh, disease-related variables, and psychosocial and social conditions. Uh, and this social determinant survey is, is implemented and administered across all three of our studies, as well as in our pilot work, um, so that we can understand um, the ways in which there are similarities and differences in um, these social determinants among men as they are sort of encountering different critical, comp different cr critical uh, trajectories uh, within the continuum of prostate cancer diagnosis. The first example uh, of results that I'd like to give you from our Precision Medicine Center are the results from a systems analysis of the prostate transcriptome uh, in African American compared to white men who were undergoing a radical prostatectomy uh, in the VA. And what this work showed was that African Americans uh, had higher expression of genes associated with immune response and inflammation compared to uh, white men. And then on a follow-up study, we um, examined the prostate transcriptome uh, using a single biopsy core and were interested in gene expression patterns uh, between African American and white men uh, who had early stage prostate cancer. And what we found was that two genes, uh, specifically PERC and SRP1, uh, related to the endoplasmic reticulum had a moderately higher expression uh, in African American compared to white men. And so taken together, these two uh, endoplasmic uh, reticulum stress trans transcripts were suggestive of a greater uh, stress response in African American compared to white men. And these findings are important because it's, uh, I think, first evidence showing that there's cellular uh, stress response differences between African American and white men uh, within the context of prostate cancer. But it's also important to think about stress as it can be uh, psychologically manifested. So there's a, a, a biological mechanism for stress responses and there's also a psychological mechanism of stress response. In, a, in, a, in this next example, um, which examined physical activity in African-American prostate cancer survivors who um, had been treated with radical prostatectomy um, at the Hollings Cancer Center um, and who were identified um, uh, from uh, men who had donated a, a tissue sample as part of uh, donating to our biorepository and tissue analysis core at the Hollings Cancer Center. Um, what we found was that um, only 34% of men uh, met the recommended guidelines for moderate intensity of uh, physical activity and that, um, that's, that men who had uh, greater perceptions of stress were had a lower likelihood of meeting the recommended guidelines for, um, for moderate intensity physical activity. Now again, uh, perceived stress is, is, is important psychologically um, because it's one of, it's one of the psychological mechanisms of a stress for the stress response. Um, it's also an important social determinant of health and I want to uh, in, in a few moments begin to segue my talk into social determinants of health. Um, but before doing that, want to talk a little bit about um, resilience and you know one of the things I think is really important about our our frameworks and conceptual models of disparities is that we often think about the ways in which uh, minority populations have lower functioning have poorer outcomes compared to white men and I think this is because we typically are thinking about differences and when we think about differences or disparities we think of one group as doing less than the other group group. I think this approach has been really important to help us understand and identify uh, where there are gaps and where resources uh, need to be directed and targeted. At the same time, it's also important for us to understand uh, what enables men to 
be resilient or to recover from challenges, stressors, and difficulty. Um, so these are data from a study that was published uh, this year that examined um, the extent to which men, and these men were uh, in our VA sample, reported that they were able to um, be resilient, that they were able to adapt uh, to challenges, stressors, and difficulties, and that they were able to bounce back from these difficulties. So you can see here that 66% of men said that they were able to adapt uh, from challenges and 40% said that they were able to bounce back. What's interesting is that allostatic load was greater among men who reported uh, resiliency. So it really raises the question about what types of strategies are men using to adapt and to bounce back or to be resilient and at what um, physiological consequence or impact or effect are these efforts having? And it's charging us and challenging us to think about ways that we can help men to be more um, physiologically effective in their efforts and, and processes of being resilient or backing, bouncing back or adapting to challenges, stressors, and difficulties. One of the ways that we can do that is one, to identify men who have uh, unmet social needs. And, you know, the, the idea of identifying and understanding social determinants is now a, a really important priority uh, nationally, locally, and regionally, because healthcare systems, healthcare providers, are now being um, held accountable are, and are, are being having greater increased responsibility for understanding their patients' background and developing and implementing strategies to help patients to have better outcomes um, following their interactions with the healthcare system. And we know that um, the healthcare system and the clinical settings are critically important. These are the settings in which healthcare is delivered. But people have to um, follow recommended guidelines. They have to manage their conditions. They have to um, be compliant with recommendations in the communities or in the social environment in which they live. So more and more professional organizations, national um, organizations are recommending that, that uh, social determinants be obtained uh, from patients and documented in their electronic health record. And can see, you can see here that there are many different ways and different types of social determinants that reflect um, the conditions in which uh, individuals live, learn, work, and age. And all of these things can affect um, someone's health and well-being and their lifelong health. I think some of the there are several clinical and public health priorities for um, understanding and addressing social determinants of health. The first one is that because there are many different um, determinants that, in, that are related to the social environment in which people live, work, and age, that um, we really have to be thoughtful about identifying and documenting uh, social determinants of health using a standardized approach using validated instruments um, and, to, and, 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 and documenting and measuring those that can, take, that can be actionable within the context of a clinical setting. Relatedly, um, clinical workflows need to be established to make sure that as patients with unmet social needs are referred appropriately um, to social services. And then we also lastly have to understand acceptance for to social referrals and understand the extent to which um, referring a patient to a social service organization or to a social service program uh, has a clinical benefit in terms of improving patient outcomes. <coughs> Our Precision Medicine Center, I think, has been leading the way and developing tools to um, understand the extent to which social determinants are currently being documented in the electronic health record. Um, and so our, our, our data integration core um, has developed 
uh, natural language processing tools that can be used to identify and extract data on social determinants of health using the clinical notes. And I think this is a, is a really important and exciting approach because one, it tells us uh, something about the extent to which uh, patients and providers are, are talking about their social background. It also tells us something about the extent to which uh, these variables are being uh, documented in the electronic health record, which provides the foundation for us to be able to um, act upon and intervene among those who have unmet social needs. So one of the one of the natural language processing tools that we developed um, is related to financial strain, and financial strain is a really important priority uh, within the context of prostate cancer or any type of cancer because uh, cancer treatment is very can be very expensive. Uh, cancer treatment. Um, several studies have shown that patients who are being treated for pro for any type of cancer. Um, experience some sort of financial strain or hardship. And um, you can see here that financial strain or hardship is reflects the extent to which patients um, have financial hardships because they do not have um, sufficient resources to cover their expenses. Now, it's exciting time for um, thinking about uh, social determinants such as financial strain because uh, CMS has now issued guidance about um, one that that social determinants should be documented. They're creating uh, ICD-10 codes that can be used to <coughs> document um, the the presence of, of social determinants or unmet social needs. Um, using specific codes uh, and, and documenting those in the electronic health record. What we've been interested in doing is understanding the concordance between the documentation of financial um, of social determinants such as financial strain <coughs> using the electronic health record um, based on what's documented in the clinical notes, what's documented using ICD-10 codes, and what's documented by self according to when what patients will self-report as um, an unmet social need. This is one example that I'm showing you now for financial strain where uh, in, a, in, a, in our cohort of patients who were treated <clears throat> with radical prostatectomy um, at the Hollings Cancer Center, um, None of the patients had an ICD-10 code that could be used to document financial strain, but 6% um, had financial strain documented in their electronic health record using um, and were identified using our natural language processing tool, and that 18% uh, self-reported uh, having a financial hardship. So taken together, these findings really demonstrate the importance of using a quality improvement strategy to enhance the uh, ability of healthcare providers to document of un social determinants <coughs> with greater precision uh, using ICD-10 codes and also using greater precision <coughs> of documenting these discussions and uh, unmet social needs that are identified um, through patient provider communications as, as part of the clinical encounter in the electronic health record. So this shows you um, uh, um, uh, results from our, our work using <coughs> with our social isolation lexicon, again, using the same approach where we developed um, a natural language processing tool to identify a social isolation and overall only a less than two percent of patients had any instance of social isolation documented uh, in their electronic health record and what this table is showing you is that the, there are different types of terms that were used to indicate um, uh, social isolation and the frequency with which they were documented in their electronic health records. So it ranged from 19.5% for um, lack of social support um, to 3.4% uh, for social, social isolation and feeling isolated. 
So one point to make with um, with this particular example is that there are many different ways in which um, providers uh, can and do document a particular social determinant. So one of the areas uh, that just I think is really important for us to think about in terms of improving the precision of collecting and documenting uh, social determinants with the greatest precision is that we need to come up with standard terminology and language for how these uh, social determinants are documented in their electronic health records. So some of the key findings from our precision medicine research is that um, one is that we provide that we've generated some uh, I think some really exciting findings related to uh, racial differences in molecular stress responses or cellular stress responses. Um, but and that's an important biological cellular mechanism uh, that plays a role in the initiation and progression that is can play a role in the initiation and progression of disease. At the same time, we've also um, begun to explore a psychological uh, mechanism for stress responses uh, in terms of perceptions of stress and demonstrated that men who have greater perceived stress are less likely to meet an important um, cancer control strategy or strategy for uh, reducing or for controlling cancer. We've also demonstrated that um, there's an opportunity, I think really important opportunities to work within the space of improving the precision for uh, addressing social determinants data. So really, um, we're at a point now where there's the power and um, the investments that have been made to implement electronic health records. There's um, th this, these investments can be leveraged to understand uh, the nature and distribution of documentation and discussion of social determinants um, as they are occurring now uh, and patient as part of the clinical encounters. If that and that can be used to develop um, a more structured uh, interventions to improve the quality and precision of documenting uh, those determinants and uh, addressing those unmet social needs um, uh, using um, evidence-based approaches. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is work that um, is being supported by um, the, the, um, the Duke Endowment, which is really building upon our work with uh, developing natural language processing tools to identify social determinants uh, in a really important way. And so our goal here is to develop, implement, and evaluate um, what we're calling a multi-level informatics strategy for identifying patients who have unmet social needs based on the extent to which um, social risk factors are documented in their electronic health record and using uh, a community-based navigation program to link patients who have unmet social needs um, with social service organizations um, and community settings. As part of that, um, we're also will be examining the concordance between uh, <clears throat> social determinants um, de de uh, reported by patient self-report and those identified using natural language processing to help us understand the, um, the, the performance and the precision of our natural language processing tools. Because at the, at ultimately, we would like to be able to disseminate those tools uh, to a wider audience, to uh, different types of healthcare settings so that other institutions can have a better understanding of the distribution of unmet social needs in their patient populations and use that as the basis for making operational decisions about population health strategies. So social determinants are one of the um, focal areas of this recently published um, Cancer Disparities Progress Report that was released by the American Association for Cancer Research. And I wanted to um, bring um, this report to, um, to the attention of the conference participants because it really, I think, summarizes um, much of the, the, the substantial progress that has been made uh, in terms of understanding 
um, cancer health disparities under, and identifying um, the complex ways in which um, biological, social, psychological, and behavioral characteristics and factors um, work together to um, lead to um, excess rates of morbidity and mortality and racial and ethnic minority groups. It also highlights um, uh, our vision and the vision uh, for the field. Um, but and, and as part of that um, helps us to sort of outline several important areas that um, are future directions for uh, ensuring and achieving the bold vision of health equity uh, for racial and ethnic minorities and uh, individuals from other underserved pop populations. So I encourage you to um, to seek out this report because it is a important resource that um, helps us to understand um, where we where we've been, uh, where we are, and uh, I think importantly where we need to go. So if we think about uh, our future directions. Uh, one area that I think is, is really important for us to think about is developing, implementing, and evaluating uh, quality improvement efforts to uh, enhance the collection of data on social determinants of health. And related to that, um, you know, identifying patients who have unmet social needs is really important, um, but will only be effective to the extent that those patients are linked with um, social services in their communities to help them address um, their particular set of needs. And those efforts need to be coordinated. Um, and, and, you know, we know that um, we have uh, several uh, opportunities to reduce the fragmentation uh, and care coordination in our healthcare system. And so as we think about uh, and develop a, a strategies for um, collecting and documenting social determinants of health, we also need to develop um, coordinated approaches to addressing unmet social needs. The other two areas that um, I think are really important future directions for the field um, and will really enable us to transform um, our, 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 our healthcare systems, which ultimately will enable us to transform, um, to do more transformational work that has uh, the, the ability to uh, really move us towards cancer health equity are translational studies that help us understand um, the interaction between biology and psychology. Um, I think, you know, really thinking through um, and using multi-level strategies to um, address determinants will be uh, critically important to uh, transform uh, our field and our work so that we are able to uh, move towards uh, cancer health equity. So in closing, I'd like to thank the, again the conference organizers for uh, including me in this uh, important conference. I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, the funders for uh, my research program and um, acknowledge my collaborators um, at the Medical University of South Carolina, the University of Pennsylvania, um, Hampton University, and the University of Texas San Antonio Health, Sy Health System. Um, and and mo most importantly, I'd really like to acknowledge and thank all of the participants who have um, been gracious and, and willing to give of their time and effort to participate um, in several different types of studies that my research program has uh, been a part of and has have led. Um, we really cannot do this work without the active participation of patients um, and, and diverse sets of stakeholders uh, and cancer health equity and cancer dis research that's really effective at reducing disparities. Thank you. 
Welcome back. Lisa Heltke, the director of the Nobel Conference here, and I'm just cutting in really quickly to tell you that there is indeed another discussion going on um, starting right now, actually. And I, I didn't exactly give the most pre precise directions before. Please go to the Nobel Conference webpage or write to the gustavus.edu webpage. And when you click on the link there, uh, you'll be asked to register. And then if you slide all the way down the page, you'll see a place where you can click on a Zoom link um, to this conversation, which is supposed to happen at 1.45, so we're a tiny bit behind. But I just want to also say, if you'd like to ask a question about Professor Hughes Halbert's talk, uh, you can do so by going to Poll Everywhere. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash Nobel 56. So that's Poll Ev dot com slash Nobel 56. Or you can text it to 22333. Just text Nobel 56 to 22333. And again, if you'd like to just stay in your chair and watch some content, I can tell you that right now you'll see part two of Yoga for Cancer. You'll see a poetry reading by one of the Gustavus poets, a piano performance, a dance that's inspired by uh, cancer survivors' uh, self-report, self-descriptions of their experience and performed by Gustavus students. And then part one of a three-part very interesting history of cancer where you can find out, did those ancient Egyptians Egyptians mean by cancer what we mean by cancer when they wrote that in their papyri. So I invite you to go ahead and either visit a Zoom discussion or uh, enjoy that um, content created by my colleagues and students. Thanks. Welcome. I'm Michelle Rosinko. This year's Nobel Conference is Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. While I am very excited about the cutting edge research I'm going to hear about, grappling with all the ethical issues around who has access to those new treatments, I'm mostly excited about the hope and the optimism that comes from these new treatments. As somebody living with a diagnosis of cancer, Yoga has been something that has really supported me in so many ways. I think it's helped me deal with the uh, anxiety and unknowing. It has helped support my immune system so I can be as strong as possible. And I just want to share a little taste of that with you. In our first video, I introduced the idea of the three-part breath and I introduced how our spine can move in five different directions. What I want to start with today is the idea of yoga, which comes from an ancient Sanskrit word which means yoke. We might think of it as integrate. So I want to return to our breath, but I want to integrate it with just a little movement. But before we even go there, I want you to invite yourself into your present moment. Whatever happened before you sat down and watched this video, let that be in the past. Whatever's on your to-do list, let that be in the future. Let yourself be in this moment now. If it's comfortable for you, close your eyes or just find a quiet focus and see if you can feel what's going on in your breath. What's the tempo of your breath? Are you breathing quickly or slowly? Just investigate this with curiosity but without judgment. Do you notice after your inhale, is there a little hesitation before the exhale, or does one go right into the other? This natural breathing pattern, I want this to feel comfortable like an old worn-in pair of shoes, or if you think of the time when we all traveled more regularly, what it felt like to come home and you went, ah. So let you come back to your breath. Ah, I'm home. Let's think about the three-part breath. Inhale into the belly, into the ribs, into the high lungs. Exhaling high lungs, 
ribs, belly. Again, filling the breath from the bottom, middle, top, and emptying the lungs from the top and the middle and the bottom. In our first video, I introduced you to a seated pattern for moving your spine in all its directions, and we're gonna do that right now. I'll talk you through it. I explain it a little more fully in the earlier video. Go ahead and take a nice big breath up. Exhale, bring the hands down. Release your fingers. Inhale, a little bit of a back bend. Exhale, belly button back, spine flex. Inhale up, exhale side. Inhale up, exhale side. Inhale up, spiral around. Look over the shoulder without forcing. Up, spiral around. Inhale up and down. And just take a moment, return to that home breath. I'm gonna switch my legs. You might find another way to sit that's comfortable and we'll repeat that one more time. Inhaling up, exhaling down. Inhaling, slight back bend. Exhaling, bend front. Inhale up. Inhale up, side, inhale up, and spiral, up, spiral, up, and back again. What I want to focus on today is what we often call range of motion but I want to emphasize, you're looking for range of comfort. If you ever move into a place that feels painful or even uncomfortable, back off. You want to keep the body and your movement as a place of comfort. And you choose, you have agency when you want to challenge or push it a little bit. Now, I started working with range of motion with my arms following a mastectomy. I taught this series of movement to a number of people, many women who had had breast cancer and were trying to recover their range of motion. But along the way, we discovered if you live in the 21st century and you text or you work on a computer or you drive, you need the same range of motion work. So if your experience of cancer is in a different body part, this is still useful work and a useful idea. So I'm gonna start with my right leg outwardly rotated and I'm gonna inwardly rotate my left leg here. So my legs are like two points in a pinwheel. Now if this is not comfortable, again, you can sit in a chair. Or you can sit with your legs stretched out like this. Whatever works, what's comfortable for your body at this point in your life. But I'm gonna start here. And I'm gonna make just a little chicken wing. And I'm gonna elbow the bottom half of my circle and bring my elbow around. I don't have a lot of range of motion there. This is my exhale. Here's my inhale. And exhaling. Now I'm gonna go the other way, under, and over, under, and over. And now I'm gonna let this go out and I'm just gonna think about pairing breath and motion. Inhaling and exhaling. Inhaling and exhaling. And let that arm drop. Now this inwardly rotated leg, I'm gonna bring it around to the side I'm going to put one hand on my belly and one hand on my heart. I'm going to stay tall and soft. And I'm going to exhale, staying supported. Full breath. I'm going to start by just 
pairing my breath with flexing and extending my ankle. So I'm gonna inhale and reach through my heel and exhale and reach through my toes. Inhale through the heel, exhale through the toe. Two more times. Inhale through the heel, exhale through the toe. Inhale through the heel. When I'm doing that action, my sciatic nerve is gliding from my spine into my leg. Now I'm gonna take my opposite arm up. I'm not trying to touch my toes. I'm staying easy and I'm trying to open my ribs. I think of myself like seaweed when I do this. Inhale up, exhale, over. Inhale up, exhale, over. Inhale up, exhale, over. One more time. Inhale up, exhale over, and let's just stay there. Four, three, two, one. Drop your arm down. Big inhale over the top. Drop the arm down. Inhale over the top. Again, we're going to go the other way. If you need to keep your arm bent, that's fine. Find your range of motion, your range of comfort. Bringing that all the way up. Let's switch around and do the other side. Now my left leg is outwardly rotated. My right leg is inwardly rotated. I'm going to start with my little chicken wing. I'm going to inhale over the top. Exhale under. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. And I'm going to go the other way. Again, noticing with curiosity what's going on there. I'm going to open my arm out. Bottom half of the circle, just pairing with our breath. Inhaling, exhaling. Inhaling, exhaling. And bringing this leg around. thinking about staying tall but soft on my inhale and staying relaxed but supported on my exhale. Nice long spine. I'm inhaling and reaching through my heel, exhaling, reaching through the toes. Through the heel, through the toes through the heel, that sciatic nerve just gliding through my leg, and out, opposite arm comes out. Now again, I'm not trying to touch my foot, I'm not trying to touch over here, I'm just trying to wash over and open up this side of the rib cage. Now this feels fabulous for me. If this doesn't feel good for you, think about how you can adjust it. Maybe you need to leave your hand right here, maybe that's going to feel better. You know your body. Find your range of motion, your range of comfort. I'm going to be here. Inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling. And exhaling. Inhaling. And exhaling. We'll take that one more time and just linger a bit. Exhale. Four, three, two, one, drop the arm down, big circle around, drop the arm down, big circle around, other way, up and under, up and under, up and over. I'm going to come up to standing. Sometimes when we do this practice, it's really nice to have a chair or something close by. I'm going to stand up. And take a moment to recalibrate. Standing feels different than sitting. I'm going to feel the crown of my head reaching up, my feet pressing down. How can I just stand here 
feeling very tall, but not rigid. And exhaling and staying supported. Again, this is one of those home bases. In yoga, this is called mountain pose. It should be a place of comfort. Right here, let's inhale and bring both shoulders up and shoulders down. Bring your shoulders up and your shoulders down. Two more times. Up and down. Up and down. Take a nice big breath up. And when you come down, I want you to take a look at your feet. Are they pointing straight forward? like train tracks? Are your legs straight under you like a train track? Or are they a little bit out there like a capital letter A? Let's bring them right underneath ourselves if we can. Okay, Straight right here. Now, let's take a nice big breath up. Take your right hand, grab the left wrist, and take just a slight side stretch. Side bending again and up and exhale down big inhale up grab the opposite wrist side bending up and down now we're going to do one strength building action in yoga, we refer to this as a chair pose, and this is going to be a slightly modified chair. It might feel a little bit like you're doing squats if you used to go to the gym. I'm going to just turn on a slight diagonal so you can see what I'm doing here. What I'm going to do is inhale, and I'm going to just bring my arms up right to the center. I'm going to keep my feet fully planted on the floor, and I'm going to shift my pelvis back as I bend my knees. Now, holding this knee bent position, I'm going to inhale and open to one side. Exhale, come in. Inhale, other side. Exhale, come in. Bring those hands to heart center and hold it for four, three, two, one. Big stretch tall. And come down. You might want to give your legs a little love there. Let's do that one more time. I'm going to slightly diagonal the other way. Nice big breath up. Up. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Start again. Inhale front. Exhale sit. Inhale open. Exhale close. Inhale open. Exhale close. Hands into heart center. Four, three, two, one. Strong legs up and down. I'm going to come back to a seated position. And I'm going to close, as I often do, with a well-wishing meditation, a loving-kindness meditation. As always, I'm going to just say four stanzas and I'll always say, may you be, and then I'll pause, and you can hold that for yourself. May I be safe, may I be healthy. But in this practice, you always have a choice. If right now you are holding that space for someone else, and you want to think about that person, may my friend be safe, may my friend be healthy. I welcome you to identify who you want to focus your loving kindness on. <sighs> nice and tall. Close your eyes if you're comfortable or would like to. Not necessary. Nice breath in, breath out. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you find peace. Take a nice big
big breath up and a breath down. And now I want you to pause for one minute. Is there something you could just leave on the mat while you go into your day? A little stress or anxiety or something you could just leave there? Or is there something you could take with you? Do a little body scan. Is there some place that feels a little more ease, a little more comfort? May you carry that into your day. Be well. I look forward to joining you at the conference. Hello, I'm Helen King, and I'm going to do a few podcasts on the history of cancer. My background is a historian of medicine and a classicist, um, but I'm also interested in medicine just as a patient, as we all are. So this one, I want to talk about what is the history of cancer? And I think it's actually quite a complicated question, but it's one which involves us thinking about how we use evidence, and that's always really important. So why do we want to have a history for any disease? Why do we need a history? So I think there's something here about continuity, about reassurance. We want a disease to have a history because it's a bit like when you're a patient, you go to see a medical professional and you want to know that you're not the only person in the world who's ever had that thing. So you want a name for your condition. That's reassuring. It means you're not the only person who's ever had it, but it also means there's likely to be some research on it. There's likely to be some treatments for it. There's likely to be something people can do to help you. But that's sort of more about getting a name for a disease than about actually having a history for it. I think names and history are very closely connected though. So as an example, if you go to your medical practitioner with an embarrassing sort of pain um, down below, and you're told you've got proctalgia fugax, you think, mm, that's great, I've got something with a name. But actually what you're being told there is nothing that you didn't know already. Proctalgia fugax literally means a shooting pain in your butt. So the proctos bit, bottom, algia bit comes from a Greek word for pain, as in analgesic, against pain. And fugax just means fleeting flying away. So proctalgia fugax, fleeting pain in the butt. It's a name, it's got Greek and it's got Latin and that makes it sound sort of impressive, but actually you're not finding out anything you didn't know already. What about the name cancer then? Cancer, you'll read everywhere online, comes from the ancient Greek and Latin words for crab. So in Greek, uh, it's carcinos, as in our carcinoma, and in Latin it's cancer, crab. The use of the word in medicine, the crab word, goes back to Hippocrates, the so-called father of medicine, lots of scare quotes there, uh, who lived in the 5th century BCE. But of course in those days there was no knowledge of how the body worked. There was no knowledge of cells and their structure and how cells change. There were no diagnostic tests, so we can't say if we find the crab word in an ancient medical text, oh, that's definitely cancer. There's no way of knowing. We don't have access to the patient's tissue in that way. So finding the crab word is no guarantee that the text is about cancer. But if you look into cancer history, you will find that cancer specialists really want to find cases of it in the past. They need a history, and I think that's more about their reputation and their confidence than it is about just finding a word. They need a sense of a lineage of noble physicians fighting to find a cure to help patients. And a sense of progress in which even if some of the patients that people have now will die, nevertheless, there's a sense that in the past, fewer would have died, or more would have died in the past. Fewer are dying today because we've made progress. And I think history is often important to that too, to get that sense of progress. And I think we as patients also need a sense of progress. Things have got better. So cancer gets a history. And it's really worth doing this if you haven't done it already, just going online and searching for history of cancer and seeing what you get. You might find it's quite surprising. 
you'll find it's linked to the name of Hippocrates, but also to the names of other famous doctors of the past, so Galen and Celsus. But keep in mind as you do this that there's no way of knowing that those crab words meant what we would call cancer. And then today, is there even one thing called cancer? We probably emphasise today the different types, the different causes, the different stages. Uh, we would not simply say, oh, it's all cancer, in quite the way that the history sites want you to do. Let's just take one form, breast cancer, as an example. If you search online, you'll find that you're told that breast cancer has a really long history. And you'll find many, many sites which trace that back to ancient Egypt. They'll talk about something called the Edwin Smith papyrus. That's a papyrus. It's a writing, written material uh, that dates back to someone called Edwin Smith who discovered it. Um, and that supposedly tells you about using cauterization to treat breast cancer. The general history of cancer sites are often run by medical professionals and they will go along with that idea of a long history. They'll mention Egypt. If you look instead at experts on ancient Egyptian medicine, specialist historians, they'll see something rather different in the same material. A chap called John Nunn, who was between the two worlds of medicine and history, he was a retired anesthesiologist. He wrote a book in 1996 called Ancient Egyptian Medicine, which is still the sort of go-to book for this topic. He pointed out we wouldn't actually expect as much cancer in ancient Egypt because lack of triggers in the environment, but also because people just didn't live long enough to get it. Um, you have to live to a certain length to get some sorts of cancer, and people just didn't live long enough. He also said that in the skeletal record, cancer was very rare, although actually that's complicated too, because he talked about bone cancer as something you could find in the skeletal record, so evidence of a damage, damage to a bone from a tumour that's pressing on it. But also there's an important factor he wrote in 1996 and in the 90s, we didn't have such sophisticated ways of finding evidence in skeletal material. So from the early 21st century onwards, we can find quite small tumours, we can see evidence of spread. And I've directed you in the reading that accompanies this to a couple of sites that talk about ancient Egyptian skeletal remains, which we now can say do have evidence of cancers we can identify. But specifically, what about that Edwin Smith papyrus? A quick online search will probably tell you that there's 48 cases described in it, 48 either individuals or conditions, and that there are eight cases of cancer. But is it that simple? Now, you can find out for yourself. This is great. There is an online version of the 1930 translation of the Edwin Smith papyrus that includes really detailed notes on all the different Egyptian words that were actually used in this text. So you don't have to believe people who just say, oh, the Edwin Smith papyrus tells you about cancer. You can read it for yourself. So there are certainly eight cases of conditions that affect the chest area. And one, case number 45, tells you that if there are swellings over the breast area and they're cool, they're bulging and they're spread over a large area, then there is no treatment. Now, some modern sites will make that sound really doom laden. There is no treatment. But actually, within the papyrus generally, there is no treatment is used for several different conditions. It's not just to do with this particular possible cancer, possibly not description. Also, some Egyptian, some of the English translations of the ancient Egyptian use the word swellings here, others use the word tumours. And as soon as you translate the ancient Egyptian word as tumours, you're making it sound much more like it's cancer. So remember, as ever, every act of translation is also an act of interpretation. The next case, case 46 in the papyrus, is an abscess. It's an abscess that's developed a clear head, it's come to a point. So it's what happens when there's an infection, and so there's a lot of pus in it, and it's under pressure, and it, it forms this head, it's inflamed. So is that cancer, or is it an abscess, a localised skin infection? We can't know, but 
the decision to decide to say it's cancer is part of trying to get a long history for the condition. So it's probably not eight cases of cancer, may not be any cases of cancer in the Open Smith papyrus. And whatever they are, all these conditions are actually in men. And that surely must influence how we interpret them. Plenty of ulcers and swellings and cysts and abscesses and so on, but no mention of the disease of cancer. There's another ancient Egyptian text which comes up, which is called the Ebers Papyrus, and that has something called eating of the uterus. And that again has been interpreted as a very advanced cancer of the womb. We don't know. Now, in your online search for the history of cancer, you'll find various images with titles like the evolution of breast cancer, 3500 BC to 2016, which will include an arrow that's sort of going up as part of the chart. For both medical professionals trying to treat cancer and for patients looking for cure, knowing a disease has a history is very comforting and we like that upward trajectory in which things are getting better and better even if they're not perfect yet. We live in a world of changing theories over history. Breast cancer has been seen as being caused by black bile, by a clot of lymph, by not enough sex, by your genes, by your environment, and cures have changed too. Tests have changed, mammography, genetic tests, radical mastectomy or lumpectomy as treatments, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. But we still want a history and we still want it to go back as far as possible, hence all these references to ancient Egypt. The part of developing a sense of progress is having something that's actually worse than the present that you can progress from. Next time I'll be returning to the very early history but focusing on changing ideas of causation of cancer and also the evidence we have for early patient experiences. So look forward to that. Hi, this is Yumiko Shimurayan from Music Department. Thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce you a Japanese piece called Vignette for Twilight. This is the first piece from the uh, series called Tapiora Visions, composed by Takashi Yoshimatsu. These are written for left hand alone. There is a reason for that. He has a best friend, piano friend. Um, his name is Izumi Tadano, who had a cerebral hemorrhage at his age 65. He recovered, but he didn't uh, regain his use of right hand. One of my friend and colleague, she went through cancer and during her cancer treatment, she told me this. When we celebrate with gratitude what remains, we are finally able to move beyond the mourning what has been lost, and questioning what is left. I was inspired by her and named my new album Left Alone. I have been working with people who is recovering from cancer and going through cancer treatment with this music. And Yoshimatsu's music, I believe, has very powerful message about moving forward in the midst of very challenging time. I'm very happy to share with you this piece today. Hope you will enjoy it. Thank you.
Death's Engines. Some bodies sing an old malady, an inner reverb like rain chanting. A song from before turtles had shells, and one cell who believed he should live forever. A while later, life came to feel like living inside a sandwich. Oh, great blue bread and cloud spread. Oh, to be consumed by something larger. But some bright startup flickers in the darkness of your body. A new technology has all your cells raging. Inside you, factories crank out undying devices that play an old tune from before turtles could sing. A dim village grows into a blazing city. But who can stop a song from being sung? It's like you're in a pool reaching out for a ball, but it spins and dips and flies away. What is the answer to the answer for us? faith in the treatment, but you kind of begin to think like maybe your body isn't working right, you know, and maybe the treatment's not going to work on you. It's very public when you have cancer, but then you're very alone. And I didn't feel like the same person. I'd lost my identity as a healthy person. And 
I don't want to just be a cancer patient because you just, you kind of do feel like that, like that takes over your identity. You're a different person, you've gone through trauma, right? And so you're not exactly the same person that you were before. But everyone around you wants to see the same person you were before. You know, you're different, you just are, that's kind of how it is. And you'll never not have anxiety. I can't believe this is what I'm doing today. The anticipation matches the reality. The ultimate frustration is that it's constant curveballs. I don't want my identity to be a cancer patient. I just felt so much uncertainty. Any little indication that something was wrong in my brain just went. You understand it in yeah. a different way right. once you've been right. through it. I think it's important for them to take the time to communicate some concern for me beyond a number.
Welcome back. I hope whether you were Zooming or watching uh, some of the video of that last dance movement that you have enjoyed the time that you spent away. We're back now for another lecture. I wanted to tell you a little bit about some other work that uh, Gustava students did that you might find really helpful as you go through the next uh, several lectures. A group of students who were doing research on campus this summer with um, science faculty were kind enough to spend some of their time creating very short, five minute long narrated PowerPoint presentations uh, explaining some basic concepts that, you know, I for one just this morning forgot. Uh, for instance, exactly how does a cancer cell mutate? What's the process there? Um, uh, another of the power, um, yeah, and another of the narrow, narrated PowerPoints describes uh, some of the many kinds of cancer that exists. As we know, cancer isn't one disease, but many diseases. How do we group them? Uh, two of the presentations look at drug development. One of them explains the stages that a drug has to go from discovery to being on the shelf. Uh, and another explains why biologics, which they also get called large molecule drugs, are so much more complicated than small molecule drugs like chemotherapies. Again, five minutes. Uh, another couple uh, explore some of the social science topics. So one is about cancer health disparities. Where do they, um, how do they congregate? How do we understand and, and catalog the ways in which disparities in access to health care um, occur? And then the last one uh, explores the notion of the, the discipline of psycho-oncology. Just what exactly is it? So those are, uh, can all be found on the Nobel Conference page if you go to the Learn More About Cancer Topics link. And you can pop in there at any time and see any of those. And indeed, any of the, can the content that's been shown during the course of the breaks between lectures, you can find at the Learn More About Cancer Topics link. Just a reminder that after this next talk, uh, we will have a short conversation with my colleague Ian Hill of the chemistry department. And then uh, at 3.45 p.m. Uh, Central Time, there will be a live panel discussion with all seven of our presenters present. I, for one, am so <laughs> excited about this. I have I've lined up my list of questions that I would really like to have answered, and of course, I won't get my way. But I'm really, really excited about those um, those live panel that live panel discussion. It's going to be a really wonderful opportunity to see all of our presenters. Um, Let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Uh, I want to just remind you that uh, you can uh, tweet about us at Nobel Conference. Uh, use the hashtag Nobel56. Um, also, if you go to our Facebook page, uh, you can, or if you'd like to tweet about, um, about um, the conference, or if you'd like to Facebook about the conference, please feel free to do so. And again, use hashtag Nobel56. Just a reminder that we really encourage and invite you to submit your questions. And you might say, well, how exactly are we using those questions? And uh, we're using them in a variety of ways. Uh, we are using them to inform the little discussions that my colleague and I have after each of the lectures. So what are we noticing? What patterns or trends are we seeing people uh, displaying? Uh, in their questions after the, after the talks. And also, uh, at the end or the beginning of each day, I will talk with either Dwight or Laura to ask them to kind of give an overview. What are they hearing presenters talking about? What are they, what are they noticing in the pattern of questions that our audience is, is asking? So know that your questions are being uh, taken in and examined and thought about in, in light of other questions that other audience members are asking. So do know that we're reading and thinking about those very carefully. And if you'd like to submit one of those questions, again, the address is pollev.com slash forward slash Nobel56. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Nobel56. The text number is 2233, and you can text to Nobel56. Uh, let's see. What else do I want to tell you about? Um, let's see. Let's dip into some history of Nobel conference facts, shall we? It turns out that um, the very, very first Nobel conference was called Genetics and the Future of Man. Now, we know if we did the topic this year, we would do Genetics and the Future of Human Beings, right? But at any rate, um, that was the very, very first Nobel conference. We had four Nobel laureates in attendance 
that year. And one of them was Edward Tatum, who received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1958. And he gave a talk, the title of which was The Possibility of Manipulating Genetic Change. And it really foreshadowed things like the CRISPR technology that we heard talked about this morning, that mechanism that enables us to cut um, a sequence and with the, with the intention or with the purpose of altering it somehow. So that technology is now being used to deliver some of the immunotherapies that are transforming people's lives. So I just think that's really an interesting feature. By the way, the CRISPR technology, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about that, uh, the conference, the 2017 Nobel Conference, was on reproductive technologies. And at that conference, Professor Jacob Korn, who was one of the people who's been really instrumental in creating and developing that technology, uh, Professor Korn gave a talk about the CRISPR technology, so you could hear that. Uh, some other, can uh, I'm sorry, some other Nobel conference conferences of years past uh, in, on genetics include the 1999 conference, which was called Genetics in the New Millennium. Uh, at that point, the Human Genome Project was not yet completed, but one of the architects of that project, Craig Venter, was among the presenters that we had. Also at that, Leroy Hood gave a talk entitled The Human Genome Project, Revolutions in Biology, Medicine, and Society. And I think we probably wouldn't have imagined what some of those uh, innovations were going to be when, when, we listened to, uh, when we listened to those talks in 1999. I know some have said in 1999 it was sort of like, well, we've done the human genome. That's pretty much all we need to do. Everything else is just a footnote, right? We've figured it all out. And of course, it's anything but that. So uh, furthermore, another topic that's pretty uh, important to this year's Nobel Conference, I think, is the year that we did uh, immunity, 1992. It was called Immunity, the Battle Within. Obviously, that's a topic of enormous interest and concern to us right now. Two of the presenters at that conference included Candace Pert and a name that some of you might have heard of, Jonas Salk. I can remember very vividly sitting in Lund Arena and watching Professor or Dr. Salk come into the room, and we gave him a standing ovation. It was a really moving moment when you thought of how many lives had been changed by that man's um, development of the polio vaccine. They talked about the immune system as, quote, the mind of the body, and also T cells in health and disease. That was Philip Amarak's talk. So again, I, I as a non-scientist, a science watcher, think it's so interesting to see how developments build and build on each other. This morning, Dr. June talked about the fact that really um, the notion of using the immune system had begun already in the 19th century, perhaps even earlier than that. Uh, and, and it has taken this long to, to have that come to fruition. So at this point, I think it would be appropriate for me to turn the stage, as it were, over to my colleague, Professor Ian Hill, a member of the Nobel Conference Committee, who is also going to introduce for us our next speaker. So I'm going to hand it over to Ian. Pharmaceuticals and biologics play an integral role among a battery of treatments used in managing cancer. And the discovery of novel effective drugs remains an active field of research and development in academic and corporate laboratories alike. Our next speaker, Dr. Jim Thomas, has built an extensive career in the biopharmaceutical industry and worked to see the discovery, development, and FDA approval of many biologic drugs. Following his PhD work at Purdue University and a postdoctoral fellowship in biochemistry, nutrition, and cell physiology at MIT, he began working as a scientist at Genentech. From there, he transferred to Immunex in Seattle to become the director of cell sciences and was there to see the FDA approve Embril, a breakthrough monoclonal antibody biologic for the treatment of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, in addition to many other biopharmaceutical drugs. Dr. Jim Thomas ultimately became the vice president of process science which he continued through the buyout of Immunex by Amgen in 2002 and retiring as the Vice President of Process and Product Development. Since his retirement from Amgen, Dr. Thomas became a founding partner and CEO of Just Biotherapeutics, 
which received $8 million in 2016 from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation towards its mission to expand access to life-changing protein therapeutics across the globe. He is now the Executive Vice President, Global Head of Biotherapeutics, and President of U.S. Operations of Just Evotech Biologics. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jim Thomas. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at this Nobel conference. It's quite an honor to, to be here. I'm going to provide some thoughts about how we're addressing the issue of global access to biologics today. And this is a rather complex issue, and I've, I've tried to calibrate the talk to the average listener that's out there. I may be talking in an elementary way to some, but uh, over the heads of others. And if you're in either of those camps, I, I apologize. But I, I hope I'm connected with the students that are out there, and I hope you see some opportunities to engage with your interest in continuing education to uh, come in and make contributions to the field. This is a requisite forward-looking statement. The average cost to develop a novel therapeutic for the treatment of serious illness like cancer is well over $2 billion. And when this, this is translated to patients, the average cost could be $10,000 a month or more. And I think some of the newer therapies are actually quite a bit more than this. Um, this is going to obviously create quite a hardship on uh, patients that are out there uh, in this country. Uh, and other actually countries like Europe and, and Japan, I think we have to have very good insurance, but can be some significant co-pays and so forth associated with this. But if you think about across the planet, uh, there are many billions, actually billions of people that won't be able to access these drugs at all. So we really need to do something about that. So to, to start, I want to provide some high level view of why these drugs actually cost so much. At the very highest level, when you look at the biotech and biopharma industry as a whole, the process for discovering, developing, and commercializing new therapeutics is remarkably inefficient. And that's not because, you know, there, there are a lot of inept people out there and they're not working very hard. That's not the case at all. But the real reason is that the process is remarkably challenging and very complex. So any good scientist will tell you that there are far more failures in the lab than successes. Understanding the complexity of human biology and the fundamental mechanism of disease is quite a humbling experience, actually. And I, I, can, I can say that um, by personal experience. Now, the lead candidates that come out of discovery, only 10% make it past phase two clinical studies or the proof of concept stage. And for those drugs that make it to phase one, only 5 to 20% of those drugs actually make it to the approval process. And unfortunately, cancer therapeutics are on the, on the uh, low end of that, that range. And it takes a long time, 8 to 12 years or more, actually, to, to, to go through this whole cycle. And then, you know, obviously, to add to further complexity, these, these uh, drugs are actually, therapeutics are going, are going into people. and you know, they have to be safe, and we have to develop all the information preclinically and in the clinic to demonstrate that they're safe. That's very important, of course. And uh, we work with the regulatory authorities uh, to make that happen, FDA and, and other world uh, regulatory, regulatory authorities. <clears throat> so if you track the cumulative cost of developing all these new therapeutics, uh, about 75% of the cost resides between discovery and clinical proof of concept studies, because that's where most of the failures happen. These are rather expensive experiments from discovery to proof of concept. There's a lot of those exper uh, experiments that have to happen uh, for a drug actually uh, to move forward. Um, and I think, you know, the success rates uh, have to be addressed. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. Uh, and I'm going to actually talk about some of those in some of the following slides. So what can we do about the high cost of therapeutics, particularly biotherapeutics or biologics? So this slide represents a, at a very high level 
uh, this process from discovery to commercialization. We started discovery, we improved the design of the molecule, we find methods and process methods for making these drugs. We do along the way, of course, we do a lot of pharmacokinetics and, and we do a lot of safety testing before we get to the clinic. Um, then we make the drug in, in clinical manufacturing and we put that into people in these phase one slash phase two studies. Phase one is really for safety, to make sure that we're safe uh, in people. And uh, phase two is to try to get some hint of efficacy of the drug. Now, if the drug actually passes this stage, it goes to late stage clinical development. Phase three, clinical development, where we're refining the dosing. And we're also getting additional safety information before it's actually approved and becomes a commercial uh, product. So better prediction of clinical efficacy at, at, at discovery is actually critical. So if you want to think about some ways of reducing the cost of these therapeutics, and there are a few ways I will talk about, the, it starts with getting better prediction. Um, and that sort of makes sense, right? I mean, if, if you're doing um, discovery, you want to pick the molecule that's actually going to work. Uh, so we need better biology around that discovery process, and we're getting it. We're, we're actually uh, putting in a lot of robotics at that stage so we can generate data really efficiently, and we're actually using AI and machine learning tools, computational tools, to understand that biology better so that we can get better prediction. Another thing that we can do to increase uh, uh, our success and decrease our failure rate is the identification of biomarkers to segment patient populations. Now, biomarker is, is not the therapeutic target itself, but is an indicator of that disease. So if you had some indicator, it, it could be as straightforward as a, a gene mutation that you can actually uh, create an assay for and get that, get that information. Uh, sequence information, uh, and then you can actually look at a larger patient population, do that assay on that population, and decrease the size of the, of, of the population that might respond to the drug. So that biomarker is, is a way of, of uh, enriching the patient population for responders to the drug. And if you can do that effectively, you can do smaller clinical studies and you can generate more statistical power with those smaller studies. Um, and then that reduces cost and also accelerates your ability to develop these therapeutics clinically. One of the things that we're working on at Just Even Tech Biologics and others are as well, but we're, we're looking at ways of accelerating from discovery to that proof of concept study. So we want to get there really fast and we want to get there at relatively low cost. And that's important because we want to do more experiments. We want to do more experiments or we want to do experiments for lower cost. Uh, and we're using machine learning tools in AI to do some of this work as well. And I'm going to talk about some of that a bit later too. But if we can do this really rapidly, uh, and we can do it for a reasonable amount of money, a lower amount of money than it costs us now to do this experiment in people, then we can actually feed back the information that we learn at the clinical stage, that initial clinical stage, and we can feed it back into the discovery process and actually train it or, or learn from it, adjust our models so that we're actually better at predicting going forward. So we can learn from both our successes and our failures uh, through this feedback learning loop that we can create. Another way, kind of a final way I'll, I'll address here about reducing costs, it's an opportunity that we're looking at at Just Eva Tech Biologics uh, in the way that we are pioneering, a pioneering approaches to manufacturing. And uh, so what we're doing is that we're, we're actually designing plants that are smaller, much more efficient, much more flexible, that can be built more rapidly. And if we can do that, then we can delay, uh, we can delay the investment in commercial manufacturing to a later stage. So, so that's important because we want as much uh, clinical data, 
to show what the dosing is, so what the demand is going to be. And of course, we want to be absolutely sure that it's going to be an effective drug before we make that investment. So, if um, so, by being able to do the commercial manufacturing capacity to build that, put that in place rather quickly, we can delay. We can delay again uh, our decision to do that to make that investment until we have that really important clinical data. So now let's, let's uh, transition a bit and go to what are biologics specifically and how are they used to treat cancer? Kind of a broad working definition of biologics is that a biologic is a, bio, is a pharmaceutical drug product manufactured in, expressed from, or semi-synthesized from biological sources. And there's some major classes I've illustrated here that actually is broader than this, but it gives you an idea and the vaccines fall in that space, gene therapies, recombinant proteins, cell therapies, you've probably heard about a lot of these. Certainly vaccines we've heard a lot about recently in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 area. They're actually uh, vaccines that are being uh, developed now. I'm quite hopeful uh, that that's going to happen soon. I think all of us hope that that's going to happen very soon. Um, there are also some recombinant proteins that are antibodies. Uh, there are actually antibodies, natural antibodies, that are being fished out of patients that have been exposed to that virus, and then recombinant versions of those are being made uh, to uh, to being made into drugs. So, um, gene therapies. I, I'm not going to talk about those. Are cell therapies? Uh, there's a really uh, should be a great talk around cell therapies by a real pioneer in that area at this at this uh, conference. So uh, make sure you tune into that. Uh, tune into that talk. Um, I'm going to focus here, though, on recombinant proteins. It's where I've spent most of my career. Uh, it's where a lot of these therapeutics that exist right now have, have come from. They've, uh, some of the leading therapeutics, I mean, there's a lot of small molecule uh, drugs that are out there uh, and chemotherapies and so forth that are out there. But biologics uh, are a whole class that came in and actually effectively treated oncology in different ways, different mechanisms, and quite effective with low toxicity. So very specific technologies, uh, and I'll talk more about why that's the case as I, as I go forward here, but I'm going to focus here. Rituxan, Herceptin, Avastin, Nulastin, k trigger these are all leading uh, biologics that are oncology therapeutics, and they have different mechanisms of action that I won't go through here, but uh, they treat different types of cancers, but uh, quite effective. Actually, uh, these are quite effective uh, treatments. Now, antibodies are large molecules. I'm using antibodies as an example, but uh, they're, they're quite a bit more complex than small molecules. In fact, in fact they're vastly more complex because uh, they're really a string of small molecules kind of bound together and then folded in a three-dimensional shape. That's kind of what they are. They're made up of amino acids. Uh, they could be strings of 100 to, you know, thousands of amino acids uh, that are actually, you know, bound together through these things called peptide bonds to make these long chains. And then these chains, again, are folded. Uh, and they have to be folded properly to, for, the, for the molecule to have activity, right? So. Uh, it's very important, and they're so complex that uh, we can't make them synthetically like we do small molecules. Small molecules can be made through a series of chemical reactions, and uh, because they're relatively simple, you know exactly what you make, you, you measure it, um, and, um, and, and it's done, I wouldn't say, in an absolutely straightforward way, but it can certainly be done synthetically. And you can't do that with, with large molecules, especially molecules like antibodies because it's just way too complex to do that. So we've learned to harness actually cells in the cell machinery over the years to actually have these cells make these drugs for us. So we put the DNA that codes for the drug, uh, the antibody or another protein, into, the, into a cell. Uh, we get that into the genome of the cell. And then we have ways of actually amplifying the number of gene copies. And then we have ways of actually making more uh, uh, drug 
her gene copy uh, through some other tricks that we can play that we've actually learned from viruses and how they replicate themselves. But the cell actually has all the machinery it needs to, uh, to make these long chains of amino acids. It, it has specific compartments uh, that are inside the cell where these chains fold in, a, in the proper three-dimensional shape. And then they're, they are actually modified. Sugars are put on these uh, proteins in specific places, and that's important for their activity too. And then they're actually secreted outside the cell. Uh, you know, where we actually purify them and they will in, in, uh, eventually formulate these things. So like a, a precision tool, these, these molecules are designed for very specific functions. And so uh, they have to be made in a very precise way. And again, that's why we use cells to do this for us. And they're able to make a phenomenal number of these cells. So we engineer these cells, um, uh, we engineer them to make literally a few thousand molecules per second of these drugs. So, and then you couple that to the number of, of cells that we actually culture when we go to these production and manufacturing uh, systems, we're culturing literally 100 or 200 uh, trillion cells in one culture, right? Making a few thousand copies of, of this drug uh, that we want to make per second. So that's how we get the productivities. We've come a long way, I can tell you, over the past 30 years in our ability to do this. But the, each of these molecules have to be made precisely. Uh, it has to be made, they have to be virtually identical to others because if they're not, then it changes the activity of the molecule. So like for an antibody, you have binding sites. There are two binding sites. We call it a homodimer. There's two chains that come together. And you have these two binding sites that will bind to a specific therapeutic target. Now, that target could be, um, it could be a bacteria. It could be a virus. It could be a cancer cell. But the, but the binding to that target is very precise. So the structure, uh, not only in sequence, but also in three-dimensional shape, and the form that it takes has to be just right. Has to be just right. The other end of the molecule is also quite important. It's called the FC domain. And that, that uh, end of the molecule can recruit the immune system to, to actually work to neutralize or to, to attack the target. So if it's a bacteria or a virus, it could bring in a, a macrophage or a cell in the immune system to actually come in and, and actually digest and get rid of that, uh, that foreign invader. Um, we're moving into an age now where some of the leading cancer therapeutics and other, other therapeutics uh, uh, that are biologics are coming off of patents. So uh, uh, companies that are the innovator companies will put together intellectual property that call composition of matter patents around the, the drug itself and also some other patents around formulation and things like that. But they, those patents have a certain lifespan. And they actually, uh, when those uh, patents expire, it creates an opportunity for other companies to come in and make biosimilars. And it's actually quite a challenging uh, process actually to make a bio biosimilar because that biosimilar needs to be remarkably similar to the novel protein. Won't be exact, but very, very similar. Uh, both in terms of activity, but uh, certainly in terms of safety. So, uh, so the good thing about that is that you have a number of companies coming in and making biosimilars, and this competition will actually help drive down the cost over time as well. So what are we doing specifically at Just Evotech Biologics to make uh, biologics more accessible to a global population? Well, I'm going to talk about our platform, this is a platform for making biologics, and it spans from discovery all the way through commercial manufacturing. So it's, the, it's kind of the A to Z of choosing the right molecule and then actually manufacturing that molecule to, to put into people. Um, so we begin actually with the DNA, uh, of course, and we learn from the DNA that's actually in the public domain and we put this information into computational models that tell us what is the range of what a normal antibody looks like 
we use that information to guide us in some of the things that we do in, in terms of making like libraries that can be screened against a, a therapeutic target so we can make billions of, of, uh, of, of uh, molecules that actually can be screened uh, for activity against a therapeutic target. But we have to do this with knowledge. What should these look like? Well, we can actually, we're actually guided by the hundreds of thousands of sequences that are, that are out there and we're creating some of those ourselves. We, we create structural models in, in computers as well to understand, you know, what, is, what does a molecule look like and is it going to be well behaved? Uh, we, may, we may want to change what the molecule actually looks like, not its activity, but we may want to change what it looks like so that it will be better behaved from a manufacturing uh, and development point of view. So it may be easier to manufacture, easier to formulate. Uh, and we can do that by looking at the, at the, the sequence that uh, may be a candidate for going into the clinic and, and, predicting, and predicting molecules through these computational models that might be superior. We end up making those variants or those uh, different molecules physically. We make them and then we screen them through some assays and we choose the best one to move forward. And then we develop processes around around all of this to develop uh, these things efficiently, uh, to manufacture them efficiently through very efficient processes that we put in place, expression, production uh, in the upstream, downstream, uh, and so forth. And then transfer those eventually to manufacturing scale. And all of this is done and driven through a common data set that we collect along the way. And, and this is the really the key point that we collect this information in a common data set through this whole uh, series of steps from discovery through the manufacturing step. And we, can, and we continue to learn, continually learn from this data set through machine learning algorithms and AI approaches. That helps accelerate <clears throat> this whole process. It, 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 it puts more of the experiments on a computer and fewer of them, few ex, fewer experiments in the lab. You know, they take time and cost resources, uh, people's time to actually to do this. So we're trying to do as much computationally as we possibly can in this exercise. The other important point before I leave this slide is that we're trying to learn as much as possible from the DNA, from the, uh, from the most abundant data, like from hundreds of thousands of DNA sequences. And we're trying to get prediction about the methods that we need to put in place to, to manufacture and develop the molecule. And if you think about DNA, it's, 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 it's this amazing place, uh, amazing library of information, right? And the DNA in a single cell uh, that we have can code for everything that we are as, as, as a person. So that gene that codes for the drug contains all the information that we need to actually to make the drug. And our challenge is to extract that information out and to use that information to accelerate the methods, development of the methods that we use to actually do the manufacturing, the formulation, and all the work that we do downstream of that. So I'm, I'm gonna start really at discovery uh, and an approach that we're using that's actually uh, quite innovative. I don't know of any other company out there that's actually doing this in this way. And we're using a technology called generative ad adversarial networks. These are GANs. Uh, these are these are actually um, these are actually uh, neural networks uh, that are uh, machine algorithms. <laughs> so all you data data scientists out there, you know, you're going to geek out probably over this, but um, we're, uh, I'm going to illustrate it by, by uh, talking about faces. There's actually a website that's called This Person Does Not Exist. So go to the website if you have interest. What, what this website is, is showing is that you can, you can have a, a discriminator part of this GAN that you can train on faces, human faces, actual human faces. Uh, and then you can have a generator that's part of this this uh, GAN that's randomly generating things that are like faces. 
right? And every now and then it fools the discriminator and gets one through. But then you say, well, you know, that sort of looks like human face. I'm going to train the, I'm going to train uh, the discriminator with some more human faces, a bigger set of human faces, and it makes it harder for the generator to fool the discriminator because it's actually more educated. It's actually more educated now. So the, 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 the generator works really hard, and occasionally it does fool the discriminator, even the more educated discriminator. And so the generator learns from this, right? And, it, and it, so it starts to generate more faces that look more human-like. And the discriminator is trained on more, a bigger subset of, of human faces. So it's getting smarter. So you've got this sort of cycle going in place or this, this uh, juxtaposition of these two, these two uh, uh, neural networks that are kind of battling each other to get better and better and better at creating human faces, right? So I'll ask at this point, which one of these faces is, is, is actually a real human face and which one, and, and, you know, and, and pick it out from the ones that are actually compu uh, computer uh, generated or through these GANs. So I wish we were, I wish we were, uh, in, this was in person so I could actually get a show of hands or whatever. But uh, the answer to the question is that, that none of them are human. These are all generated through this GAN technology, right? So, so eventually, uh, this whole this whole uh, GAN approach will fool us. We're literally, we are literally as people trained on millions of faces that we've seen over the years, right? But the but the GAN will get so good that it will actually fool us. Uh, that these that uh, these people are real, but they're these aren't real people at all. These people have never really existed. Well, we can do the same thing and apply the same kind of principle to molecules. So we can train with this vast number of uh, sequences that are out there in the public domain. We can train the discriminator, make it really smart, and then the generator has to, has to generate molecules that are, are going to fool the discriminator. And then we can further train, and you know, we can kind of go back and forth, and, and, and over time develop a very high quality library that isn't actually human antibody uh, sequence, it's actually computer generated antibody sequence, right? So these sequences uh, have been generated from the GAN. And we don't call them human antibodies, we call them humanoid antibodies. And we can literally generate, the generator can generate billions and billions of different sequences. So we get a lot of, we get a lot of variety in these antibodies and what they can bind to and what they can't bind to. And so that, that, that creates an opportunity for us to screen this, to screen them against any number of therapeutic targets that are out there. Um, because we have literally billions of different sequences, difference of uh, billions of different binding characteristics that some will bind. And then we can fish those out and then we can look with further uh, analysis to see whether or not that could be a real therapeutic. But this is the direction that we're going. Uh, and, the, and the really cool part, I don't have, to get, I have time to go into here, is that we can bias these libraries towards specific characteristics, physical characteristics of these antibodies that may confer better therapeutic activity. Uh, and that's an area that's a totally new discovery area. Uh, that we're that we're currently engaging in, they're quite excited excited about. So we also have other computational tools that, where we can actually look at existing antibodies that may come out of a, a human being or, or or an animal. We can say, okay, that antibody it, it it has therapeutic potential, but it needs to be improved. It may need to be humanized. You know, and we can do this with this Abacus tool set or it actually uh, may need to be improved from a biophysical uh, perspective to be better in terms of our ability to manufacture it and our ability to formulate that, that drug. So we can actually improve these therapeutics as well, improve them for expression, purification, formulation, and long-term stability. So once we've 
once we have the, the DNA sequence that we want, then again, we can put this into cells, as I, as I talked about earlier, really soup these cells up to make thousands of, cop uh, thousands of copies of the drug per cell. Uh, we, can, we can use robotics to develop very efficient assays for uh, uh, purifying uh, that drug and also formulating that drug. Uh, then we can then we can put all of this into a small scale uh, scale down system that mimic the manufacturing process itself, and then eventually put this into the full blown manufacturing process, which is really highly productive. So the the bioreactor on the left hand side at the at the bottom down there again could have a hundred trillion to two hundred trillion cells in that bioreactor making drug continuously for many days. And then we can continuously purify that drug from the bioreactor through the steps that you see on that, 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 that move to the right. So we have a highly productive, but very intensified process for making these, these therapeutics. And it's, it's different than it used to be in the past. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, much more efficient, much, more, much smaller, um, uh, in a much better way of actually doing this work. It's not simple. This process is actually quite complicated, but it's, it's an area of focus where we're making very, very, and the industry is as well, making substantial progress in actually improving the productivity at this smaller scale. Uh, and that's important because we want to build smaller facilities and we want to do it in a much more cost-effective way. So. So the equipment that we need to use, because we've intensified these processes so much, it's quite a bit smaller than equipment and the big tanks and things that we used to use. And we can fit this equipment into relatively small uh, rooms that we call pods, and they're really clean rooms. Uh, and uh, we can reconfigure those clean rooms. Uh, we can even, these things are on air bearings, we can even move these clean rooms around and if we want more manufacturing capacity, we just clone the pod. So we don't scale up into these massive tanks and massive facilities. We just scale out. Uh, and, that, and that allows us to uh, more reproducibly make more product because when you invariably scale up, you have all kinds of risk associated with the physical properties of running a process at a small scale, smaller scale, and then trying to run that process at a much, much larger scale. So we're completely eliminating that risk. So this is a, a picture that, that, that contrasts the two types of facilities. And the facility on the left, you can't see that much of it, but it's, a, it's, it's more of a conventional manufacturing plant. They don't all look like this, but uh, it's the same kind of principle. These are hard wired, they're hard plumbed, uh, you see the top at the bottom of those photos. Those are the top of tanks that actually are multi-story tanks where you have cells that are being cultured. And those things can be 20, 20 15, 20, 25,000 liters, of these vessels. And they're all kind of built in in a very rigid and flexible way into these facilities. And so it's an engineering marvel, but it's incredibly complex. And so what we're doing around the facilities is making these things much less uh, complex. We use uh, single-use technology. We don't need central utilities. We don't need all the hard plumbing. We have intensified these processes so that we can operate them at, again, scales where we can put them inside of these pods. We can clone the pods, you know, if we need more. And, and the, the key factor here is that we can build the facilities that these pods are in pretty quickly and pretty efficiently, right? So we're, we're literally building uh, a warehouse, and we're doing this now in uh, Revan, Washington. That is the shell of the manufacturing facility. It's vastly different than uh, commercial manufacturing facilities in the past. These were billion-dollar Facilities, this facility is a fraction of that cost, maybe 10 to 20% of the cost when it's fully built out. Uh, and we can do it pretty, pretty fast, 12 to 18 months compared to at least three to four years to build a conventional facility. 
So we'll build this warehouse out, you know, it'll look something like this in the manufacturing area of the facility. And you can see these boxes. These are the pods that we have these unit operations or these, this equipment inside of these pods. Uh, we, we, uh, can, we have people in there, but not that many people because a lot of this is really automated. So these processes are connected from beginning to end, and we have a high degree of automation that reduces the number of people, also reduces the error rate that we would see normally in a manufacturing setting. So the, the manufacturing ballroom would look something like this, and we can wheel up tanks that have buffers uh, for purification or uh, wheel up tanks that have medium that we can feed the cells for, for culturing them and plug them in. Uh, plug them into the pod. So we're really turning upside down in, some, in many ways the way that we do commercial manufacturing. And because we're doing all of this and we can do it quickly, again, we can make decisions on investment much later. And those investments, once we make them, are going to be quite a bit less to, to meet the uh, capacity demands for the drug in the future. So it, it, you can kind of sum it up like this. Uh, the conventional facilities are quite complex and rigid. The facility design, the process designs are fairly simple and discreet, but they're done at rather large scales, you know, 15, 20, 25,000 liters. Uh, future manufacturing, the facility itself, again, fairly simple and flexible, as I've shown you. Uh, the process design, though, is complex and it's connected. But again, we've made huge progress in that space. And I think we can continue to make progress in that space because it's something we can get our arms around, right? We can reduce, we can reduce costs, we can enhance efficiency at the place of the process and not the, not the place of the plant. Okay, so they're relatively small. It's kind of like a mainframe versus a, a smartphone, right? The smartphone is, so flexible and it's so powerful now and getting more powerful all the time right in a very very small package that's it's easy to use and has a huge amount of utility associated with it so that's what we're doing actually in the manufacture of biologics so in conclusion you know the the reasons for the high cost of biologics it's, it's a quite a complex story but the single uh, most significant factor is the cost of failure at proof of concept. And I, and I outlined some ways that we're addressing that that are in the second bullet. A um, number of ways, four different ways. Um, biosimilars will also contribute to the reduction of cost, and so will actually the efficiency of the manufacturing process itself, uh, especially when we get to biosimilar manufacturing because the cost of uh, biosimilars is a huge amount of the fraction of the cost of the biosimilar will be in the manufacturing cost itself. So having a very low manufacturing cost will increase global access through these biosimilar molecules. So um, just to, to conclude, um, there's a lot left to be done, a lot left to be done. And, and I would uh, ask that if any of you out there have interest in this, Continue to, um, to ask questions, to continue to explore this space. There's a lot of work that can be done uh, in the future to make improvements. And, there, and it's a very important area uh, to spend a career where you actually have the opportunity to make an impact on the access of life-giving, uh, life-saving therapeutics out there in the future. So if you have an interest, you know, engage, get your education. Uh, continue to, to learn because uh, the industry uh, and this whole area needs you. So thanks so much. I, I appreciate the time uh, today and, uh, and just the opportunity to come and, uh, and talk to you. I would wish it was in person, but uh, this is, I guess, the next best thing. So thanks so much. Hi, Ian. Hi, Lisa. How's it going? 
It's going quite well. Thanks for joining me today. I want to remind our audience that you can submit a question about Dr. Thomas's talk, or actually about any of the talks you've heard so far, by going to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, slash Nobel56. Uh, and you can also participate by text at 22333 uh, and text Nobel56. About partway through our conversation, Ian will cut away for a question, uh, a poll question uh, that the audience, you can participate in. Um, but first, I want to know something very important. Do you work in this lab? This lab, I actually do have one section with my students. Uh, this is my, uh, for my Monday afternoon uh, introductory chemistry course. So, so this I is- do have, I do, This is very familiar territory for me. So tell me and tell our audience who is unfamiliar as I am with the renovation. Is this part of the old Nobel or is this a brand part of the brand new Nobel? This is part of the brand new Nobel and this is uh, one of our um, kind of designed labs that was, took a lot of input from the chemistry professors as well as um, the, um, those who actually do run these labs. So, I mean, it has, it's really tailored to the way we teach here at Gus Davis. And so we have uh, individualized theme hoods here for students. So everyone can work at their bench um, safely. And it's just been really wonderful also to work in a space like this uh, during uh, COVID as well, during kind of more social distance um, laboratory experiences. So okay. it's been truly a pleasure. It's kind of an amazing opportunity to test out the uh the flexibility and efficacy of the space. Gee, thanks, pandemic. You keep giving us and giving us. So, so I wanted to observe that there are a couple of science minutes on the learning more about cancer page that if people are interested in just kind of reviewing some of the points that Dr. Thomas was going over, there's one that talks about the stages of drug development and then there's also one that explains um, why these large molecule drugs are so much more uh, complicated. And that makes, makes me want to start with my, um, my first question, which is, um, why, you know, tell me how much bigger these large molecules are than the so-called small molecules of chemo. I asked Dr. Thomas this question and he basically said, they're bigger and that's why we call them large molecule drugs, Lisa. <laughs> it's a, uh, that's a wonderful question. And thank uh, you. The approaches <laughs> we can take here um, as, um, as those of us who synthesize these sort of molecules, it's a very different challenge. When we talk about small molecules, you know, these are going to be the sort of things that you find in pills off the shelf, aspirin. Um, they need to be small so they can get through cell membranes and uh, they can get through the targets that they need to get to. And these can be kind of put together through uh, methods that have really, through extensive research over many years, uh, have been kind of honed by organic chemists. Now, in contrast, uh, these biologics, these larger molecules, uh, these are mostly protein based. And these have essentially, it's kind of the opposite where these small molecules are pretty complex. They have a lot of little things that, you know, different considerations, you have to worry about uh, configurations. When it comes to proteins, you know, these are very large molecules, but the backbone and the chemistry between that links um, these amino acids together is actually the same. But the problem is, is that there's, uh, the human genome has, uh, is coded for 20 different amino acids. So there's 20 choices at each spot along the way. And so uh, you're combinatorially, you know, if you just have you know, even five of these in a row and you have all the 20 choices available, there's 3.2 million ways that this can go. And so from a synthetic standpoint, you know, we would have to build this piece by piece, you know, put one on, stop, rinse it off, but another one on stop and stop. And that's just not practical from a synthetic standpoint when you need this to be a commodity chemical. And so uh, from a synthetic standpoint, you know, using this recombinant DNA technology that, uh, that Dr. Thomas kind of was right there when it was starting to kind of come into play when he was uh, at his postdoc at MIT, you know, this being able to inject a gene into a cell and basically turn it into a small chemical factory for you. You're able to take this normal growth media, basically cell food, and turn it into this life-saving drug. It's really, really impressive. Um, 
you know, even just kind of that baseline technology that's used in biologics today. That's astonishing to hear you describe it. Yes, I'm, I'm just pondering uh, the process that it would have taken to, uh, to do that by hand, so to speak. I wonder if this might be a good uh, place to uh, put in our Poll Everywhere question. So audience, if you go to pollev.com forward slash Nobel 56, you can uh, find a poll question there that asks you about um, what you think about um, the cost of biologic therapeutics, which is something Dr. Thomas talked about a lot in his talk. And we'll wait for those results to come up, but I want to ask you some more questions, Ian. Um, say a little bit more, if you can, about, he described machine learning, and it was really interesting. He used the example about face, faces. But can you, can you talk about, about that a little bit more, Ian? How, how have you seen that being used, for instance, in this kind of work? So that's a, another important point here. Uh, you know, this machine learning, it's starting to make its way into a lot of scientific fields. It's relatively new and it's really just starting to get its legs uh, in the research community. And I think a lot of um, industries are starting to kind of realize how, much, how powerful it is. So essentially, and what he described as machine learning was is that you have essentially these competing processes in order to kind of train this program and what this program you know, does is it's trying to take all this information, all these trials, all this training sessions you're giving it uh, in order to kind of get a right answer, um, so to speak, depending on the input you give it. So in this case, they're inputting sequences of amino acids. Um, and these proteins are just that, a sequence of amino acids. Okay. But that's really like, the way these drugs work is not really in the sequence, it's how it all bundles together and the sequence defines that. And so you can't really, that's a very difficult thing to model. If they give you a string of these amino acids and tell you what shape is it gonna be, that's a very difficult question. And so this is where this machine learning is, is coming in and trying to predict you know, if we put in this sequence of amino acids, you know, what sort of shape of a protein on the back end are we expecting to see? And so if we can train that enough and get it to be pretty accurate, uh, this is going to really cut down that failure rate, uh, which is Dr. Thomas was talking about, it's going to be one of the number one way costs um, for the drug development process, and particularly these biologics. Indeed. So much expense, uh, talking about that, in that discovery to proof of concept stage. So really, just those very early stages. As you heard him describing that, was it surprising to you at all? Or did you sort of think, well, that's exactly what I would expect, given the difficulty of, of simply identifying these molecules? I think just a priori, a priori just thinking about it, it doesn't necessarily make sense that it'd be so difficult because you know your target, you have the thing you're aiming for, you want to design the drug to do this one particular thing. And so you think, well, maybe I can just, you know, look at this, figure what it, uh, what I need in order to maybe shut this protein down that's causing problems in the body and just go in the lab, make it, and it would work. Um, However, what it turns out to be is, is that that's a very complicated process. And that's, we can't just look at our target and know exactly what it's going to take um, to make it, to knock it out, or to do the change we want to see um, with our biologic drug. And this is where that expense comes in. And, and you know, at, it can be a shot in the dark sometimes, you know, but that's not really actually true a lot of times you know this is based on natural products is kind of traditionally where small molecule pharmaceuticals comes into play where you 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 find some sort of product in nature that has some sort of biological activity let's say it eases pain then you have natural product chemists who will look at this plant and isolate the compounds and try to identify the one compound that eases that pain and then you get your synthetic organic chemist to come in make that molecule, and then it's going to be something that you can now produce this on an industrial scale and make a drug out of it. Um, 
But a lot of times, you know, we try to improve on this, especially when it comes to patents, it gets pretty complicated because, um, you know, you make a small modification, you can put a patent on it, and if it works better, um, now all of a sudden this becomes an avenue for you to make money, but making that one small change, try to find something that's a little bit better. Um, that takes a lot of tries. You need to make a lot of molecules, or in this case, a lot of biologics. And this is where that high failure rate comes in, is you just don't know what's going to be the right answer. And so you try a lot of things and hope, kind of hope for the best. This is where you can get those thousands, up to 10,000 uh, candidate molecules mm -hmm. um, that need, you need to check that it works, check that it binds, um, and check that it actually does something even before, and it's safe, before it, even before it gets really far into clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're talking about life-saving drugs, that time and expense feel very painful, actually, to think about. Well, it looks like we've had some interesting results on our poll. It's amazing to watch when they're, <laughs> how quickly they change when the numbers of uh, contributors are small, but then it's sort of settled out. So I think, Ian, that you can see these results yourself also, can't you? So I does it well. surprise you? I think the results of this poll, I think, I think there's a lot of cause to be optimistic here. And I think these challenges are really large challenges. You know, there's some of these things that uh, Dr. Thomas talked about, you know, these are not small tasks, but the thing about them is, is that they're not insurmountable. You know, we have technology today that can start working on tackling these problems. We can start training uh, these machine learning programs. We can start um, working on optimizing the processes that go into making these biologics. You know, we can, you know, and he's already broken ground um, with, um, in Seattle with that new manufacturing facility. You know, there's, I think there's some very real uh, steps being taken here. And I think there is cause to be hopeful. I mean, it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work to be put in and it's not gonna take a lot of hours of a lot of different types of specialists to do this. Um, but that's exactly the kind of career that Jim Thomas has built is managing teams like this in order to bring these sort of ideas to fruition. So I think being hopeful is, I don't think it's unrealistic. And it was quite um, moving, I guess I will say, to hear Dr. Thomas talk about his optimism. You know, it feels like, well, he ought to know. And if he's feeling optimistic, then I think, I'm, I'm all about optimism right now, I guess I have to say. <laughs> think we could use as much as we can. Exactly, exactly. Uh, here's a question maybe out of left field, but I have a feeling you'll have things to say about it. What opportunities do you see for students who are interested in pursuing the kind of work that Dr. Thomas and his company are doing? Um, this is something that he really emphasized in his talk, and I know we have lots of uh, high school and college students in the audience here, so what should they be doing to get, to get in a position to do this work? I, you know, I think the reason why he, uh, Dr. Thomas is outreaching is because, you know, a lot of these, you know, the cure for cancer, you know, building, bringing these biologics to market, you know, looking at these sort of systems uh, that need to take place and need to kind of come into place in order to make um, this affordable everywhere. You know, this is a really big multifaceted problem that uh, comes in from many different directions. And so, uh, you know, I think he's reaching out in order to really kind of say, you know, that this is a field that needs all the help it can get, it needs all hands on deck, and it is not inaccessible. You know, this is something where if this is something that you're truly passionate about, uh, put effort in, you know, look into things, you know, figure out what you need to do, um, look into stuff, get excited, and try to, you know, build a career out of this. And this is something that takes passion and it takes you know a lot of love and joy because there's going to be times that's going to be frustrating and there's going to be times where you know this is as dr thomas mentioned you know there's a lot of failure um, that is wrapped up in all this but after all those failures you get that success you, you can eventually break through and get maybe a new drug to market and it might be and if you keep working on these problems it may be beyond say our lifetime um, but I think it's really important that uh, students of the next generation uh, kind of take up the mantle and keep making uh, progress. 
What are the things they should be studying right now? What are the high school subjects or the or those subjects uh, at Gustavus or another college that are the most important I, to be able to contribute? I, you know, this is getting into some personal ideas um, and maybe it's uh, painted a little bit by uh, the institution that we belong to. But there's a little bit of a multifaceted approach in order to thinking about these sort of problems. You know, while a specialist is, it takes a lot to become a specialist. And really, these are teams of specialists that are coming together to make these amazing things happen. You know, but you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to talk to other people. And so if this is, you know, science courses, you need a foundation there. But you also need problem solving. You need to be able to look at evidence, to look at data. You need to be able to um, formulate arguments and kind of take the information you get and make an appropriate conclusion out of it. And so there's room for humanities. There's, and this is, there's room for writing. There's room for you know branching out and taking things that uh, may be interest, you may be interested in. And if you keep this passion for learning alive, um, you're going to be able to keep going even beyond school. You know, we're lifelong learners, every one of us here. And if we keep uh, engaged in it, um, there's definitely a lot of progress we can kind of keep making. I mean, I, of course, can state my bias. You know, I took a lot of chemistry. I love chemistry. I teach chemistry. Uh, so I would say taking chemistry is a lovely thing. Um, but there's a lot of other um, specialists here that come into play. And so. Um, you can take the courses you need now, but stay engaged, keep reading, and kind of keep on top of it. And you're going to see your passion kind of take you uh, some very interesting places. Mm -hmm. So something, actually, Ian, I wonder if you have uh, a perspective on is, as I interviewed folks this summer uh, for the podcast, about which I'll say something later, I was struck by the fact that we had folks who had gone the medical route. They, they were doctors, physicians, and then there were folks who had gone the PhD route, and they were all engaged in drug discovery and development. And I'm just wondering, is there a reason somebody would choose one of those routes rather than the other if they knew that what they wanted to do was be involved in drug research? I think that's a very good question. And, you know, if it's, <clears throat> I think it's more of a matter of passion and where life takes you, you know, and I think my advocate advocacy is always to be find a passion and go for it and take whatever path um, you feel is right for you. And if you're uh, going through that medical doctor, you know, maybe some, you know, some instances, this might not be all where they thought they wanted to be a practicing clinician, want to be one who's, you know, right there in the, in the doctor's office working on patients all the time. And maybe then realized that, oh, I actually really like this drug development and maybe coming up with a new procedure or, um, or really working on advancing medical technology, you know, as opposed to someone who might go into um, you know, a biochemist or really like working with um, biologics or working in the recombinant DNA field, you know, and maybe uh, kind of come to realize that uh, working with biologics, developing new biologics might be the way to go. So in terms of, you know, people taking their own unique paths and maybe converging uh, somewhere later on, um, I guess the idea is, is it's more about the destination um, where you, if you end up there, that's where you end up and everyone has their own unique path of getting there. And I think they, all those paths inform us and uh, really let us bring a lot of unique perspectives to the table. Well, thanks very much for your time, Ian. Uh, and now we are going to execute one of those moves that makes me very grateful that we have Heroic Productions working with us and that I'm not trying to now suddenly execute this move. We're going to bring seven, no, eight people onto this screen. And then we are going to give just a moment for a new person to appear um, where Ian has been. Um, and while we're waiting for that last little bit of assembly to happen, um, I just wanted to tell you briefly about the fact that all these folks uh, who you'll see before you on screen have very graciously this summer spent some time with me on a podcast. We decided that this was a good year to launch an idea that we'd been mulling for several years here at Nobel Conference, and that is to start a podcast. We knew that the opportunity for um, discussion among our panelists was going to be much more limited because of the scope of 
our together time this year. So each of them very graciously gave me about an hour and a half of their time uh, to talk with me in, in more detail about their research, about how they came to be the scientists that, and social scientists that they are today, and also about how they understand the moral complexities of their work today. You can find those podcasts at ScienceWise. I think by now it's, it's populated Spotify and a couple of other uh, places. Uh, hopefully someday you'll just be able to Google ScienceWise, all one word, W-H-Y-S, and find the podcast. But there are some wonderfully interesting conversations. Uh, with all seven of our Nobel Conference presenters who are now, I believe, arrayed before you. And I think perhaps they can hear me talking. Uh, some of them are smiling, so I'm hoping that means that they are able to hear me. I'm going to introduce each person to you, and perhaps you can give a little wave or a little shout out so that we know who you are. And I'm going to do so in alphabetical order after I introduce, my co again, my colleague Dwight Stoll, uh, professor of chemistry at Gustavus, who's in the lab. Hi, Dwight. Hi, Lisa. And now our, our seven presenters. First of all, Dr. Bison Al-Lazakani at the Institute for Cancer Research in London. Welcome, Dr. Al-Lazakani. Hi, thank you for having me, and nice to meet everyone. Uh, next, Dr. Suzanne Chambers of the University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you, Lisa. Terrific to be here. Dr. Shanita Hughes-Halbert of the Medical University of South Carolina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Next, Dr. Carl June, whom you heard from this morning at the University of Pennsylvania. Looks like we're having some audio problems with Dr. June. Sorry, I was muted, but um, <laughs> I can actually still, but <laughs> it, was, it was a great to be uh, you know, with this panel. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Charles Sawyers of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Hi, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here and look forward to the conversation. Next, Dr. Katherine Schmitz of Penn State University. Lovely to be with you all. And finally, uh, you just heard from Dr. Jim Thomas uh, of Just Evotech Biologics. Oh, I'm sorry, Biotherapeutics. Yeah. <laughs> I'm great to be here. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to my colleague Dwight Stoll. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so one of the really special things uh, about the way that we construct this conference is these panel discussions. Uh, it's kind of a unique uh, opportunity. I think a lot of the scientific uh, conferences, the conferences we participate in as, as professionals are tend to be very focused on our own disciplines. And so this is pretty unique to be able to bring uh, people together from very different fields. Um, as Dr. June said uh, yesterday, uh, get, up, get us out of our own swim lanes. And uh, so the, these panel discussions are an opportunity to do that, to reflect on what we've heard throughout the day. And uh, in one of the, the uh, so, so it's also a great opportunity, I think, to model for students what it looks like to talk to one another uh, across disciplinary lines. Uh, and one of the Zoom uh, discussions I, I sat in on uh, over lunchtime today, I heard a student say, well, you know, it was great to hear uh, in the second talk today, uh, or I was able to see how I could connect ideas from my mathematical modeling class here at Gustavus to some of the data that uh, Dr. Hughes Halbert was, was talking about. So, I think the, the, the students are, are ready to make those connections and uh, this is a great opportunity for us to, to model that. So uh, I think what I'd like to do is begin here by just giving each of the panelists an opportunity to sort of respond or react to uh, the first three talks that we've uh, heard today. Um, that could be just a, um, you know, sort of an aha moment perhaps. Sometimes we hear those and also, um, you know, maybe a chance to, to answer or ask a clarifying question uh, of one of the speakers. And so um, I think let's start with Dr. June. Uh, we'll, we'll go in order of the three speakers today, and then I'll, beyond that, I'll open it up uh, sort of left to right on my, my screen to keep it simple. 
Um, well, thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Um, yeah, no, this is uh, an amazing set of coming together. And I think, um, so Shanita, I was wondering, used to be one of my, a colleague of mine here in Philadelphia, how you fit in the new atmosphere down at MUC. And I'd just be interested on in your reflections because you've had, uh, you know, your feet in both camps. And, um, and, uh, and then I have a second question on, which is um, I mean, how, how you're seeing research now interact with it. Well, thanks, uh, Carl, for those questions. Um, I'll, just, I'll start by saying, um, you know, Penn will always be home. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, had a, a fantastic um time there was a great learning experience uh, for me to be there and to, you know, it was really the place where I, I feel like I cut my teeth on uh, transdisciplinary research that really gave me the, I think, the, the, the breadth and depth of understanding sort of all of the issues um, that are relevant for um, cancer and cancer prevention and minority health and health disparities. So, um, one of the things that I think is, you know, so one, can always be home. I still miss it. Um, but what I'll say, you know, the opportunity at MUSC is that, um, you know, it's like Penn, it is an academic medical center. Um, we are the only NCI designated cancer center in the state. And so, you know, that brings, a, a, I think, a, a unique set of responsibilities. Um, and opportunities and challenges. Um, one is, you know, we South Carolina is uh, very different than F Charleston and the area in which I live and um, work is very different than uh, Philadelphia. But um, I think the challenges are the same um, with respect to social determinants being an important factor in um, how individuals are able to receive uh, quality health care, particularly as it relates to cancer. I think that, um, you know, there are challenges um, that are the same with respect to, um, I, I came to MUSC as they were just beginning to implement um, their electronic health record. And I think all institutions experience the same types of challenges. It's very difficult to implement um, new systems. So, so you know, the things are, I think are the same just with being in an academic institution, but um, both places have really been, um, you know, a fantastic um, learning experience and opportunities. Um, and what was your second question, Carl? Well, I'm just wondering now, we have we had issues at Penn trying to start up research in COVID, and but it really almost stopped all of my experiment cancer. Mm -hmm. Wondering how what the experience was at MUSC. Hmm. So, so we, I mean, we like any all I think research um, intensive institutions um, really struggled, uh, and, and struggle is probably not the right word, but experience challenges because there was a um, you know a suspension of um, most research um, activities um, and I think what was but one of the things that I think has been MUSC may have been unique may have been prepared in a different way um, than other institutions because there's been a, um, a considerable investment in developing uh, infrastructure for telehealth and telemedicine because of the the rurality that exists in the state one of the um, one of the huge sort of vision for MUSC is to be able to connect all patients to health care using uh, telemedicine and telehealth so I think that those that infrastructure um, was was sort of in place um, maybe more than you know, I, I, it'd be great to hear from the other panelists about their experiences with this as well. But you know, I feel like MUSC was um, able to um, 
pivot very effectively to um, delivering health care in an alternative format. Um, so, but, you know, we certainly, we are one of, um, we're part of the NCI Community Oncology Research Program. Uh, we're a minority underserved site. And one of the, you know, the, the you know, that affected our program and our ability to um, enroll patients into ongoing clinical trials in a very profound way. And what was great, I think, is that, you know, NCI, which is the, um, the funder of this program, you know, acknowledged that and, and really tried to work with sites to understand challenges and then be thoughtful about solutions and sort of all of us, we're all in the same position in the same boat. So, um, but things are, are being reactivated. Um, you know, my research is, is back in as much swing as I think it can be at the moment. Um, but it, it is, you know, so it's a evolving work in progress, I think. What's it been like for you? Yeah, we, we had, I mean, almost a complete cessation of all our experimental therapies, which, you know, if you're a cancer patient, something you would like. Yeah. And I just got the numbers uh, for September, and finally we're back up on enrollment. Mm -hmm. So, so f it t but it took a lot longer than I thought to get the machinery and infrastructure uh, working mm -hmm. again. Right. Yeah. So it is. I mean, I think it's. Um, you know, it's a. Um, you know, one of the billboards that um, that is on Highway Twenty Six uh, is. You know, when you can't change the situation, you change yourself. <laughs> And so I think we're all kind of a little bit in that in that in that boat, right? Because um, you know, there are a lot of things that we can't control during this time, but we can control how we respond to them. Um, but how have others sort of been dealing with um, research activities during uh, COVID, or as a result of COVID? Well, we're still we're still quite engaged, <clears throat> you know, in in our company. We have we've had to keep people, uh, you know, separated, social distancing. We've got a lot of the, uh, you know a lot of procedures that we put in place uh, to, to make sure that employees are safe. But um, but we've uh, yeah we've, we've we've continued on at a, a little bit slower pace, but, um, but I think we're kind of getting used to engagement. In this arena, I was actually going to ask a question to you about. I, mean, I I didn't even know if your field existed, so there's my here's my ignorance. And so I, I think it's great, and I think it's great. And it's so needed. It's so needed. So I mean, you're finding out actually so much about you know, patient access in, in in minority groups, and how, but you know, finding out things, you know, getting the the, the information, getting it on the ground getting, you know, access is, is challenging. What do you see as, as some of the best, perhaps, uh, way uh, or solutions that you're, you're finding? You're finding a lot of important data uh, about what's preventing access. Um, what, are the, what are the most promising approaches or ways to actually getting that access to people really important? So your your the video was a little choppy, so I'll just repeat the question to make sure I, I heard it. Um, so the question was, what are some of the most effective ways for improving access? That, that question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I think, thank you. I think that um, there are a couple that, um, that really rise to the top. One is um, using an approach where, um, you know, patients are connected with, um, with services um, using what's called a navigator model. Um, and navigators can work, you know, in a variety of settings across the continuum of cancer. There's a uh, evidence base about the, the effectiveness of uh, patient navigation to helping uh, individuals get into uh, cancer screening and to um, diagnosis. One of my um, 
trainees, uh, Evan Grayboy is, is a head and neck surgeon who's been working to develop a patient navigation that's more integrated um, into the clinical space and, and is working and has shown in a preliminary way that um, navigators can help reduce um, delay um, access to post-operative radiation therapy among individuals who have head and neck surgery. So what's been great about um, this work, one is that he's sort of taking this evidence-based model, applying it um, within sort of a unique space within um, cancer treatment, and that's being led by a, 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 a physician surgeon um, who has really sort of taken to um, an interest in understanding behavioral science um, and behavioral science methods and behavioral, um, behaviorally oriented interventions. So patient navigation is one of the ways that I think has been um, one of the most effective ways to reduce access. Um, I think that, and why I think it works is because it enables patients to um, talk about and, and, and work with someone one-on-one -on -one, um, to address their individual barriers. So barriers can be, you know, you don't know about what to do, you're, another barrier is you're afraid to do what you know you need to do, um, or, you know, the other, and, and that, those are kind of the two main barriers that, um, that are relevant to cancer. So navigators really work within that space um, of helping people to resolve their unique sets of challenges. Um, Shreya Kenbovi, who's an um, internal medicine physician at Penn, actually, um, has done some really amazing work with creating a community um, patient navigation center. I forget what the name of the center is, but she, the navigators really work um, with the patients to address social needs and, and more socially oriented determinants. I think that's really the next um, opportunity and really space where we need to work is to um, a, to provide navigation that addresses uh, unmet social needs. So what the literature tells us and what studies have shown is that people, um, patients are, you know, one of, I think in many ways, um, you know, have the best intentions to follow through with the recommendations that are made by their providers, but um, financial costs, financial hardship, uh, particularly you know, not just about paying a medical bill, but paying like your electricity bill, your mortgage, your rent, are the things that reduce um, being able to to do what your provider has um, recommended that be done that you do. And so, navigating patients to address unmet social needs is really um, important, and I think sort of will bridge the gap between the expert care that's provided in a clinical setting and the community and neighborhoods in which patients live in which they actually have to um, manage their, their chronic conditions, manage treatment-related side effects, manage all the things that come <coughs> with a living, healthier lifestyle. Okay, thanks, great. Uh, so we've, we've heard a little bit from our first three speakers today. Um, uh, left most on my screen up next is uh, Dr. Ala Zakani. Do you have any uh, reactions to the, the first talks today? Um, I guess maybe, uh, well, one of the questions that I'd really love to get the opinion of the panelists today, but, but also everyone maybe, is, um, you know, is it right that we could think of a future where the availability of technology in a way that in, you know, in reality, you know, phones are cheaper than than most than most other things than most than, for example, healthcare bills. Um, that that will somehow enable us to level the playing field in cancer care, um, and especially around the early detection of cancer, which is something that I'm increasingly worried and passionate about. So maybe Shanita could 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 start in your opinion of how you think, for example, um, is it the case that maybe if, if, if we take it in another way, for example, we, we the, the world was speaking an awful lot about 
you know, internet poverty, uh, broadband poverty in developing countries, for example. Um, and then we saw that developing countries kind of skipped an entire generation that, that more developed countries did and went straight into mobile broadband and, and actually, you know, quite rapidly are catching up. Um, with what's available in, in more developed countries. So, so thinking of this kind of model, can we or do we see a trajectory where, where the availability of these mobile technologies may be at a, at a cost level that is more accessible to more people can be used effectively in order to start bridging this gap, especially around cancer early detection? Sure, sure. I, so I can start. Um, and, and I do think there's a significant, significant potential with um, technology, health information technology, to um, bridge and fill several important gaps. I think we're learning that now during COVID, where you know it's it, we have now a, a big, an option um, in many healthcare set situations to do a visit virtually, um, and and you know if you're concerned. And, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, so I think to the extent that technology can be um, and is being and um, being leveraged effectively, um, I think will address many gaps. I do have concerns. I think that um, you know health information technology, while important and critical, um, it has significant potential. I think that um, you know, we, we, I would have concerns about relying on it as and sort of putting it forward as the as the only or primary means of interacting with patients. I say that because here in Carolina as an example, um, there's still parts of the state that are very rural that don't have um, you know, high speed connectivity. Um, and the connectivity that they do have the sort is can be sporadic. Um, I don't think that that is you know, an area of, of concern. So, you know, while someone might have a cell phone, um, you know, being able to connect to the speeds that are necessary to have a telemedicine visit um, can be, you know, may not be uniform and you might be um, exacerbating disparities or creating new disparities because you don't have the, um, you know, the, the latest and, and the, the sort of the technical capacity I think there's also um, the potential for there to generate, um, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, you know, I would call, you know, as I was talking to the students today, I was reminded that my first job out of college was at, as a network administrator. And, uh, <laughs> um, but if you ask me to like fix something on the computer now, I would really be challenged. And so, you know, I, I rely on my 13 year old son to, kind of help me understand a little bit more about the technology. So I do think that there is a, you know, the potential for um, older adults to not to have less exposure to um, technology and um, be less willing to use technology. And so, you know, as, the, as our population ages, I think there's, you know, there's the potential for, you know, a, a growing to be left out of sort of this technology base. Um, but Katie, I think, is might have some thoughts about this, you know, because it's a huge emphasis on you know, using technology to promote um, exercise, and healthy eating, and I wondered what your thoughts were about this. Yeah. So thanks for asking. I, you know, uh, I'm. I was actually going to ask you about uh, the digital divide as well as the. You know your experience, Shanita, of the the differences in the population. I was at Penn as well. Uh, Shanita and I had the opportunity to work together there, um, and um, you know I have now moved, as she has, to a more rural setting. And uh, you know, and I I have found that the um, the patient population is different uh, at Penn State in Hershey, Pennsylvania than they are in Philadelphia. And I have got to believe that that is the same for you, Janita, at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, uh, I really appreciated the issue of, you know, thinking about 
oh, you know, the developing countries are coming along in a very nice way with broadband. Well, Pennsylvania is not. Um, you know, they have, have a, a, a statewide report that just came out with the sixth most populous state in the country. And uh, we have a, an extremely uh, robust uh, rural health uh, research uh, arm of the legislature in our state. And they did a very uh, extensive report on the availability of broadband. And we have a massive problem in the state of Pennsylvania that you know, I, I think is a canary in the coal mine. I don't think it's just uh, Pennsylvania. I think that Pennsylvania just happens to be well funded this kind of research. Uh, and what they found was that um, the commercial entities that are uh, providing broadband are indicating that there is broadband in places where there is no broadband. Um, but in fact, we do not have uh, the uh, availability of telehealth and telemedicine uh, that, that we would like to believe that we have. Um, I will also say that I think that there is something um, clearly very different uh, that I experience in central Pennsylvania as compared to uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and it is not just an issue of the difference in the racial makeup. I think that there are cultural differences in uh, more rural places in, in the United States, but in, you know around the world, that I think make an enormous difference in terms of some of the access issues that we're discussing. For example, at Penn State, one of the things that I have had to deal with that I think is relevant to the, you know, the work of Dr. Thomas, Dr. June, um, the <laughs> talks we heard today, all of our, our work, um, you know, when I'm going to uh, recruit a patient uh, in the chemotherapy infusion suite, and I and I'm trying to explain what a randomized controlled trial is, um, and you know I'm educating about the concept of clinical trials. I I automatically have a conflict of interest. There's a conflict of interest if I'm educating about what clinical trials are in the first place. Mm -hmm. How can I then try to enroll someone in my clinical trial? That's a, that's a conflict. So. I think that there is uh, a lot of um, variability in access that is uh, even beyond um, even beyond technology. It's a basic educational difference in people's willingness um, to participate in the research enterprise. Um, the idea of being a part of a clinical trial is not an obvious thing for people outside of NCI designated cancer centers. I do not work for an NCI designated cancer center. Penn State is not designated by NCI. We operate as much as a community oncology center as an academic medical center. And the patient population reflects that. I'd like to just note that while there is brilliance here and brilliance at all of those cancer centers, 85% of cancer care in the United States is delivered in the community. Could and I do the vast majority of minority individuals who receive cancer care in our country receive that cancer care in the community, in the kind of programs that Shanita was talking about are funded by NCI, but a lot of them aren't involved in those NCI programs. Could I just do a really quick uh, timeout terminology check? Could you describe or explain to us what NCI means and why that's relevant in the world of oh, cancer? Anyone? Oh my goodness, I should be the one to do that. So. <laughs> I have a feeling you, you all know. That? It's the National Cancer well, Institute, based in Washington, or Bethesda. And why is that relevant? Well, it's a source it's of funder of cancer research. Yeah, it's the largest funder of cancer research in the country, and uh, the National Cancer Institute has a program uh, of designation of cancer institutes. Uh, there are, I believe, at this point, forty-six or so um, uh, designated cancer centers that are comprehensive cancer centers. And what that means is that they have at least three different research programs, including a population health research program, which is where I would be housed in a designated cancer center. There are also another 80 or so uh, designated clinical cancer centers across the country. Um, but uh, the, the point is that those are the um, cream of the crop 
uh, across our country. Yes. And a great deal of cancer care is delivered in the United States and, of course, obviously beyond the United States in places that are not that cream of the crop. Thanks. That's helpful. All right. Thank you. If I yeah, go May ahead. I be greedy and, and sort of change tack a little bit and ask a question of, of Carl, uh, really an educational question, if, if you may educate me. So immunotherapy um, in general has been um, probably the most exciting thing to happen um, in cancer therapy for the past few years. And, and um, almost any patient that comes to us at the moment, there's an immediate thinking, can we enroll them on an immunotherapy trial of, of one sort? Or, or another, and of course, there's a big difference between the the CAR T cell work that, that you do and some of the um, sort of other immunotherapeutics. But I guess for me, it feels with immunotherapies, it's so powerful, but it's very much having a tiger by the tail. You have to really know how to control this tiger, and it shifts its head this way or that way, and you completely lose control. Can you give me your opinion on how you see the future of immunotherapy developing in order to make sure that it can become much more widely usable, perhaps with less of the risks and less of the sort of need for active management that comes with it? Yeah. Um, so part of it is uh, it's new, and so we're still discovering the best practices on how to deliver it, who's most eligible. Um, you know, one of the um, issues that risk is different from chemotherapy. So where immunotherapy, the main risk probably long-term is, you know, autoimmune disease uh, that runs rampant in my family. My daughter has arthritis, which I mentioned today, and excluded all those patients from our cancer trial. And so, the issue, which is the ethics of that, I mean, there are patients who wanted to be on, but because they had diabetes or something, they, they were not eligible. So that was, uh, that was something the federal government said, including Drug Administration, that you're not eligible if you have an active immune disease. And just learning about that, is it safe to treat those patients? And, and I think the answer is sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. You can trigger, for instance, in someone who's had a kidney transplant, if you try and they, then they get cancer, then treat them with some of these immunotherapies, have rejected their organs. And for instance, in a kidney transplant, they have dialysis. So what's the relative value of that? A really complex question of, you know, priorities and so on. Um, but um, so we're seeing that, I mean, you know, we have to go first, go, you know, the closer you are to a major cancer, the best survivors kind of therapies that you're going to see Charles Sawyer's discuss tomorrow, targeted therapies, and immunotherapies. It's, it's the rural areas really are left behind on this so that, you know, the disparities are getting much better, I think. It's getting Generation of the fence getting trained and learning how to do that before they can go out to the rural areas and do this. There's a range of trained labor now, and in meeting the physicians who know how to target therapies. Um, so that wasn't something I anticipated. It's uh, go back when I first started training, I, it was bone marrow transplantation. And at the time in the early 80s, uh, there was only really two places you had to do were Hopkins in Baltimore or at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center where I trained in Seattle. And people thought it would ever, never really be generally available now. Uh, more than bone marrow transplants done, and it's been learned how to do it at a, many community hospitals you can do. But it took a generation. So we have a problem, you know, to to address the disparities of ability, and just like the, the broadband path problem that uh, Catherine was was covering, it's, it's amazing that we have that. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Chambers. Do you have a, any uh, initial reactions so far today? 
So, um, so thank you. It's great to be part of this conversation. A comment that <clears throat> is um, going around in my head is that we're talking about disparities, and certainly in my country we have um, disparities that look like they're based rurality but when you dig into the data they're actually socio-economic and despite bringing in cancer control plans and you know distributing services through regional areas and a whole lot of things that we are doing those disparities are actually getting worse they're not getting better and as new um, innovations in treatment come online what we know is that those those people that are already disadvantaged are not going to get access to them by and large so I feel like as as behavioural scientists and clinicians, what we tend to do is we focus on the thing that we think we might be able to influence, which is changing the individual's behaviour when in fact the disparity and the disadvantage is structural and comes from um, you know, our social structure inequities um, in resources. So there's an extent to which I would throw out the idea that we're kind of like on this treadmill where if we can just get these people to be more proactive, be more agent, do this, do that, we're going to get them better and they're going to do better without going, you know what, <laughs> they've got no resources, they're not getting education and they're not going to. Um, the way our society is going and COVID is of course just making these inequities worse, the people who are again more disadvantaged by any big health threat are the poor. So um, I don't have an answer to that and it's just something I know that I struggle with and, and in our rural areas we do research where we go maybe it's stoicism or fatalism and then we go nope socioeconomic and maybe it's the distance from the treatment centre. No actually in the end when you do all your work it comes back to socioeconomic disparities. So as researchers in cancer who make our living in this way, what's our responsibilities um, in the face of knowing, which I think we all do, that socioeconomic inequalities are the things that are leading to these disparities? So I, I think that's a really great point. And, you know, as you were talking, it made me think about, um, you know, sort of the nature and why I made a decision to to use a participatory approach um, and the work that I did was doing related to um, cancer and minority health and health disparities. So community-based participatory research is an approach that is, is engages um, diverse stakeholders and one, de defining what the problem is, um, second, developing um, strategies to address that particular problem and then, you know, at the last phase, working um, to disseminate and implement, you know, effective approaches um, beyond the research setting. So it, 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 it the, with the ultimate goal of, of um, using research and findings from research to change practice. So I think that, um, you know, as, to my way of thinking, you know, you're right. And I remember having, you know, a lot of discussion with our community partners in Philadelphia about what and how we focused on. And there were a lot of, um, a lot of concern about, you know, our efforts um, that focus on individual behavior change to, to, to um, not really address challenges in the built environment. Um, and as they dealt with um, physical activity, um, or dietary behaviors. And I think, you know, once so acknowledging that that's really important um, and, and essential, I do think, you know, there are, you know, there are things that I think, you know, we can do as researchers and we have to do, and one of which is to help people to be better able to navigate um, their, their own particular situation by having, um, a, the best understanding of what they need to do and how they need to do it and the resources that they need to do it. And with that knowledge, I think comes power um, for them to advocate um, with their elected officials, with all of our elected officials to make um, the changes in the built environment that are, that are important. So one conversation, you know, comes to my mind, which is, you know, in our partnership, which was called the West Philadelphia Consortium, to address disparities, one of the, you know, our long-term goal um, in the next phase of our research, if I, I think if I had stayed at Penn, this is what we would have been doing, um, 
would have been to, you know, we had done work looking at, you know, risk education, which led to improvements in being physical act, being physically active, but not diet, but not changes in dietary behaviors. So the next phase of our research was really to um, train community members to be advocates for, um, to help them to, to increase their skill and confidence and their belief that they could do something to change um, the, the, the environment in which they live. I think we're seeing now, you know, we're at, as a country that peaceful protests can um, want, do a couple of things. One, raise awareness of an issue, and then two, begin serious conversations about changing the social environment. Um, and so, you know, so just to maybe bring the point to a close is that, you know, I agree with you that, you know, focusing on individual behavior um, to the exclusion or not thinking about the longer term trajectory of dealing, of addressing issues in the built environment, which are due to socioeconomic uh, characteristics and differences, um, is, is, is a very limited way of thinking because you know, for all that, you know, we can do to change someone's behavior, um, if they don't have the environment to support it, it's really, um, you know, it, it, I don't think it'll have the intended outcome that we want and need as, as a society. But I do think, you know, working together with diverse stakeholders, and this could be community residents, I often think about communities um, as, you know, being defined by professional activities, so healthcare providers are a type of community, but working, sort of defining these different stakeholders and bringing them all, in, engaging them all in the process of thinking about, well, what should we be working on? What can we change both on, you know, at different levels of influence is critically important. And that multi-level approach is something that has um, just recently, I think, become a, a focal point for um, population health and health disparities research. We, in, up until maybe four or five years ago, we had been working really sort of at one level um, to change a particular behavior or change a clinical setting. And now we're recognizing that we have to sort of engage and address multiple levels simultaneously to have the greatest benefit. All right, great. Uh, how about Dr. Sawyer's uh, any initial reactions from you so far? Yeah, um, I'd actually like to um, hear a little bit more from Jim on the challenge of enhancing access to innovative medicines. Um, and you know, there's a lot to, a lot of complexity here to unpack. But one is, you know, obviously it's you know we've even heard it from the current administration about you know the higher prices in the U.S. versus you know favored nations and so forth, and we have these executive orders. Um, we also, you know, we have a patent system that's meant to reward innovation, um, um, but there's an expiry, and uh, we know about um, generic industry is, is a, I guess, we probably get different opinions around the circle, but I think it has been somewhat successful in leveling the playing field after a certain period of time, and the barrier to entry into making a generic small molecule is not that high, and a lot of us are probably aware that companies in India and China uh, are very good at um, you know, generating these small molecules. But Jim, as you discussed, biosimilars are a little trickier. Um, but what, what I've seen is that um, they're, they're welcomed in uh, Europe uh, in particular and other countries. There's, um, the price differential is not as dramatic a drop as with a small molecule generic because I guess there's a higher barrier to entry, and so there's fewer competitors. But you made a great point in your lecture about you know, improving efficiencies of manufacturing and so forth. But another thing I'm aware of from the US perspective is this incredible, maybe frustrating legal system that extends the patents uh, again and again and, and almost prevents um, biosimilar entry in the US. So there's a lot in there, but I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about all that yeah yeah thanks thanks charles uh, yeah it's a it's a it's a it's a big challenge overall i i think as as we as we move forward i think the the cost of these therapeutics 
will go down by similar as you said there's there's more of a challenge there because we do have to repeat some of the clinical pathway at this point we can extrapolate from from uh uh, one indication and the other indications, but there has to be some clinical data generated with biosimilars because it's impossible to make, it's not impossible, but I'd say it's incredibly difficult to make them identical like a small molecule. Um, so I think, uh, I'm hoping the regulations will improve over time uh, so that we can actually uh, move forward based on analytical data alone and not actually have to do a lot of clinical studies are a small amount, a very small amount uh, of clinical, uh, generating clinical data, so we don't have to incur that cost and load that onto the molecules. So that's one potential solution is that if we get good enough at this, you know, we can make and show that these molecules are virtually identical and the, the bits that may not be identical are really not going to cause a safety issue and certainly not to cause an efficacy issue. In terms of the, the patents, I, I think we we need to look at patents, you know, overall and the strategies there. I, I think there are, there are a lot of companies who are protect, protecting their market uh, for these blockbuster drugs uh, and they'll use different strategies to extend formulation uh, patents and other patents that will extend the life of, of the exclusivity associated. And I, I think that's a shame because that is really against the spirit of, of actually the, the patents themselves and then giving access to others to come in and, and you know, produce biosimilars and make them competitive and drive the cost down through competition. So, so I do think we need a bit of reform in that space. I, I think once once we get our own company, you know, it's gonna work out. Uh, we have the opportunity to reduce the cost of these drugs to, through the manufacturing and so forth. I'm, I'm very keen on that because it's not only for this country, but it's also for the, the rest of the world. They, they need to access these great therapeutics that we, we have access to, although not perfectly, we have access to them in this country, but most of the planet doesn't at all. And I think it's through biosimilars, it's through improved technology and, and manufacturing and those kind of things that will help increase that access. But we need it here too. We need it in this country as well. So I don't think I perfectly answered the question, but that's a shot at it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, sounds great. Well, that uh, that uh, makes our first sort of survey through the through the panel. I'd like to shift gears just a little bit. As uh, as you know, we've been um, collecting questions from the audience throughout the day, and uh, throughout the day, I've been working to kind of identify some themes uh, that have emerged from that, and, and would like to uh, ask some of those specific questions now. So, um, I guess the first. Uh, question is about uh, for, for Dr. Jun, and it is about um, sort of the long-term versus short-term uh, scope, I guess, of cell therapy. So you, you mentioned how uh, the expectation right now is that in some cases the, the cells will have, uh, the engineered cells will have long lives uh, in the patient, in other cases shorter. And so is there a clear advantage to, to having a case where, where the cells have a shorter uh, life life expectancy, I guess, in the patient. I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, I hope now I'm unmuted. Um, and it's a great question, Dwight. I think um, it, it's it's surprisingly co uh, complex answer to your question. So, um, and I'll just give a few examples. Um, we know some tumor, you can with a few months of chemotherapy and, and you, know, you know, longitudinally and, and like uh, some limits, it's called our shot. Six months, you're about half the patients and they're done. Um, but if the tumor B cell, um, lymphoma, uh, but if you look at uh, this or 
propel in you know that's younger body it hasn't differentiated much then it makes acute leukemia and, and it's been shown that in adults and kids you need years of chemotherapy to, you know. and um so same basic son that's younger maybe closer to a cell takes a lot longer to eradicate so um and it turns out our data so far our t cells is is that persistence matters in the case of acute leukemia the form that takes a lot of long-term therapy um with chemotherapy and, and uh but for the lymphoma it, the, the response rates are the same whether you have a car that only lasts in the body about whether you have ever so so it's unfortunate it's going to be tumor dependent uh, another issue i think that the reason some people get cancers is basically they're predisposed so, uh you know they they have dna repair problems and they may have tumors and you know, for instance, in, in women's cancer with the so-called BRCA one and BRCA two, you know, up until we get bilateral breast cancer, or bilateral ovarian cancer, and so there, in a CAR T cell or some engineered cell therapy that persists, may prevent a second primary. Um, and you know, that that so consider. So you think what you want? would be the same thing as what Charles wants, which is control, is physician controlled, you know, on how long the therapy persists and, and can you adjust it? That's what we need to have, and there's ways to get there. Okay, great, thanks. That reminds me of uh, lots of occasions with uh, talking with my students where we have a situation like this and you say this this coin has two sides. It's on the one hand, a great area for scientific study <laughs> because it's complicated, but, but also uh, uh, frustrating sometimes when, when we can't, when there's not a clear answer. But that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is for um, Dr. Hughes Halbert, and that is, um, you know, in your work to identify these social <coughs> determinants, are you ever worried about uh, this wasn't the, the, the audience um, person's words, but what I would call implicit bias in the, in the mechanisms that are that are used to identify the social de determinants. So can you just talk a little bit about that, how, how you think about that? Sure. Um, I, I think that's a really important point and concern because we know from prior studies that um, there is a strong potential for stereotypes and implicit bias to play a role in, um, you know, the patient-physician interaction. Um, and, influ and those stereotypes and implicit bias can influence um, what is recommended to a patient um, or what's not recommended to a patient. So one of the things that I think is really important is, and, and to the approach that we've been taking is, want to understand um, the nature and distribution of how social determinants are currently being documented in the electronic health record. Um, want to understand, are they documented? Yes or no. And then in what words are they being documented? Um, and do those that process of documentation differ um, between patients based on their racial and ethnic background, their gender, um, and the types of conditions that they have. So that's really the first stage of the sort of the empirical the research process. The second phase, which I think is, is essentially important, is to look, is to examine and determine the concordance between what a, um, a healthcare provider has documented and the patient's record as being um, an unmet social need or an adverse or social risk factor and what the patients have actually said. Um, so looking at that concordance, I think, between what patients self-report as their perceptions of stress, their financial hardship, um, their social isolation, um, and how much that matches with what's reported um, what, if anything, is reported, yes or no, and then what's reported in the electronic health record is critically important because I would argue that when social factors come into play, 
you know, the person actually experiencing their living their life in their community outside of the clinical setting is the gold standard data that we want to uh, make sure that's being reflected in the um, in the electronic health record. And then based on so and based on sort of that phase of research, we would we would have a couple of different um, options or opportunities to pursue. One is um, along the lines of I think a quality improvement um, initiative where you know we educate providers about what social determinants are, what are ways to document them effectively. Um, and accurately in the electronic health record, and then two, also, and then to provide that, um, establish the infrastructure to facilitate that process in the electronic um, health record systems. So one way I think that that's moving now is that the CMS has um, created ICD-10 codes that providers can use to document. Um, social strain, financial hardship, and other types of social determinants, those aren't um, being widely used now. And I think there's an opportunity to um, to really focus on provider education about what those social determinants are um, and how they should be documented. I think we, we there's a challenge because um, as, as in one, I, it makes me think of when I was um, first involved in uh, medical education as a lecturer, you know, there's, um, you know, we tend to think in like groups and, you know, there could be, and there have been lectures about African Americans think this way, Hispanics think this way, and then sort of without sort of understanding um, sort of the uniqueness and the individuality that patients bring. So it's a concern, I think, um, but as I said, I think there are ways that we can, one, understand um, and document and determine how much of a concern it is, um, and then sort of go from there in terms of how we improve the quality of, of that those documentation and of social determinants. And then just as importantly, how we deliver, um, help patients to um, navigate whatever social risk factors that they have. Um, I think there's a reason why patients may not talk about financial strain. They may not talk about um, stressors in their life. Uh, and I think those are, um, you know, we have to understand what the, you know, the reasons for that and to, um, to create and develop multi-level interventions to address that. All right, great, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Thomas, and um, this the, the spirit of the uh, set of questions is kind of around sustainability of these new manufacturing uh, approaches. You briefly mentioned in your talk uh, the idea of single use, and uh, which is very different from sort of the conventional manufacturing model, which involves huge stainless steel tanks and a lot of water washing and, and things like that. So can you just comment on that? Like. Um, you know, how do you think about the sustainability of, of these new, more nimble approaches when it comes to, to topics like single use? Yeah, I mean, that's an important question. Um, you know, I think uh, in Seattle, we're, we're, we're pretty strong environmentalists, right, in a way. So uh, we, uh, we, we pay a lot of attention to that. If you, if, you look at the, if you look at this approach and you look at the overall uh, impact environmental impact of, uh, let's say, the new approach with single use, but it's a lot, of, a lot of other technologies, too, that we're employing. And you compare that to the the older, you know, more conventional stainless steel, which is involved in helping to develop, too. So I'm, I can kind of see both sides of the equation. Uh, the environmental impact is a lot lower, actually, because of the way that we clean uh, the large you know, the caustics, uh, how we have to operate these large facilities, the amount of water usage, uh, the amount of waste that's associated with these. The environmental footprint is, is, is smaller, it's, it's, it's lower. Um, in terms of the, the plastics, that's an important question. We're, we're working in ways of recycling those plastics, you know, so that we can, you know, efficiently uh, address that part of the, of the equation. They're not as simple to recycle as, you know, a, a, a water bottle, you know, that we 
we drink out of because of the complexity, multi layers, and so forth. But uh, we, we believe that's possible. We're, we're working with uh, consultants and a company in that space. I think the industry is as well, but that's something we, yeah, definitely we need to, we need to stop. But we think from a longer term perspective, it's yes, yeah, definitely a much more sustainable way to actually do this. The energy input, everything associated with this is smart, much more efficient, uh, it's been much more deployable uh, because of that. Right, or other locations. It, it's a whole different approach to actually doing this type of work. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, we are obviously quite strong believers in this, but it's it's through a lifetime, a career, I guess, experience that we gain this sort of perspective. All right, great. Thank you. It's good to hear that uh, the outlook is, is good in that uh, category as well. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Thomas, uh, but also some of the other panelists. I think it's been kind of interesting to me to realize today that we haven't even gotten to Dr. Alazakani's talk tomorrow about AI, and in fact, AI machine learning has come up several times already today. So, a couple of questions about that, and one is just um, sort of the old uh, adage, I guess, that about garbage in, garbage out. That um, artificial intelligence and machine machine learning is only as good as the the training data that goes into it. So that's one question, you know, what do you see as um, some of the challenges uh, associated with, you know, getting good training data for these models? And secondly, is there are there risks of false negatives um, in that exercise? That is sort of overlooking, uh, incorrectly overlooking a, a really good candidate molecule. Do you worry about that? Yeah, I can I can address the first part of that. I mean, when we look at molecular design, and I think I mentioned in the talk, we, there, there are hundreds of thousands of sequences that we reference, you know, that are that are in the public domain, um, and then we are generating a lot of sequence information ourselves. So there is there is a training set, but we're trying to grow the training set because, you know, uh, when you use these tools, the bigger the data set, the better. Uh, so you can. You know, big data is, is like a Google, that's a Google approach in clicks, right? So that's, that gets into the billions and billions and billions of, you know, data, data points. We're, we're not in that, that, uh, that uh, world of big data, but we're trying to generate as much data as possible at every step. That's why we rely on a lot of robotics. A lot of what we do, we, well, we try to turn this whole enterprise upside down instead of being just experts in these different fields that are that are uh, doing experiments where we have experts in these different fields doing experiments in a way that we're generating the maximum amount of data so that we can apply machine learning tools across a common data set and then and more efficiently learn from from them um, we do validate though at every step. So if we if we predict that this molecule is going to be better than that molecule, now we usually predict there'll be several, and we'll test all of those. So, so we actually will make them physically, take them out of the in silico space, and actually make them physically, and then run a, a, a battery of assays on them in a high throughput format, and ask the question: Were we correct or not in our prediction? And then, you know, if, depending on the answer, we'll feed it right back in to, to our model, right? But I mean, we're getting better and better. The more, the beautiful thing about all of this is the more we do, the better we get, right? And now we're capturing all of the data. In my history, who knows, 90% of the data was, was lost from this large functional group to the next large functional group to the next large functional group because the data systems are all different. But we've connected it all together in a common data set, and we're capturing everything. So, so, so I'm very hopeful <coughs> that there's an enormous amount of progress in our space, but I also, you know, in other areas using machine learning and AI technology. All right, great, thanks. Uh, so now I want to, uh, we're coming up on the, the close of the hour here, and I have a couple uh, maybe uh, questions that are kind of broader in scope that we could probably talk for a long time about, but curious to hear your uh, thoughts, anyone who 
who feel strongly about this. So in Dr. June's talk, he talked about, he mentioned government, industry, philanthropic uh, partnerships as being a, a sort of a key component of the, of the way forward. And I guess my question is, you know, from those kinds of partnerships that I've uh, observed in my own uh, research area, I observe that they're, they're hard uh, to pull off a lot of times, uh, in part because the partners often have not necessarily conflicting objectives, but objectives sometimes that don't perfectly overlap that can make hard, um, just, you know, different working cultures uh, makes it difficult to bring these groups together. So I guess the question is quite open, you know, what, what do you see as some of the major challenges to uh, making some of these partnerships uh, work? Going forward, what do we need to do? I would be well, happy I, to yeah. make it for a moment. Everyone that wants to. Yeah, Dr. Chambers. So. <laughs> um, I, I, look, I think what's important is um, at the outset, there's got to be a shared mission. Um, and if you don't actually have at least one shared central mission, you're just going to get into trouble and, and you know, it's, it's kind of not worth your time. And then within that, um, there needs to be trust. Uh, I think for most of us who've worked through our career, you work out ways to establish very as early on as you can whether there is in fact a shared mission and whether these are people who partners that can work together in a trusting relationship. Because if you don't have that, you put a lot of effort into something that just goes nowhere. Okay, Dr. Schmitz. I can add to that um, if you want. Uh, the, um, I mean, I completely agree. Uh, there's an example that I'm involved in where uh, the, the goal is to share the, the DNA sequencing information that comes from sequencing patients' tumors across hmm. a broad swath of cancer centers. So we're now up to 100,000 patients all collected in a common database. The ability to um, analyze the sequence and, and do science on that is, is actually almost plug and play now. That, that technology is, is right here. The real sort of nuggets of gold are in the electronic medical records of those patients. Um, and doing curating 100,000 such records is just a non-starter. Non um, but by uh, bringing together um, the interested party, in this case, a shared goal, as Catherine said, the pharmaceutical companies really want this data matched to the genomics of the patient. So, uh, and we pitched this as a pre-competitive um, set of knowledge. So it wasn't going to become, you know, patentable or, you know, firewalled. Um, but if they could just pitch in together and pay for the cost of executing the project, then it was a win-win. So that project is now underway. Um, and uh, there's trust, et cetera. So again, it's, it's, um, it's definitely possible and I would encourage more and more conversation about this kind of partnership. So what I was gonna add actually was, um, I, I felt like um, uh, Carl was missing a, a pillar <laughs> in his talk um, and I'm sure he would agree actually. And um, the pillar missing is, um, uh, the, you know, what's happening with the patient behavior with diet and physical activity and sleep and uh, navigation, you know, and appropriately getting to appointments. Um, and I'll give the example, actually, from um, my years at Penn. Um, uh, there uh, was a, a really big difference in the quality of the outcomes that would happen between allogeneuses, autologous transplant patients, and uh, when you go to the, um, uh, the tumor board and talk and find out kind of what's going on, you know, why do the allogeneic patients have better outcomes, um, it seemed to have to do with the fact that they were being navigated to a class led by a nurse who was referred to as a sergeant, um, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, um, who was very, very strict about, you know, what the diet needed to be, what the home environment needed to be, kind of, you know, movement and rehabilitation needed to be happening. And these patients would get to 100 days out from their transplant and be in beautiful shape. And um, meanwhile, you know, with autologous transplants, were being released from the hospital and, um, you know, without end of, of navigation, without the same kind of guidance and having great deal more difficulty getting to 100 days being safe and healthy. Um, and so I think that there is, um, 
uh, some some um, very low tech uh, partnership that needs to be happening. Um, that I think uh, Dr. Chambers would certainly agree with me, as well as Dr. Hughes Talbert. Okay, great. Uh, I think probably uh, getting to what might be my last question is more focused on students. So we've heard today um, off and on bits about, you know, how, how do you think about these things in terms of uh, aspiring a scientist and, and what kind of careers can be had here. And what strikes me is, uh, so I myself have a pretty, um, let's say, interdisciplinary background. I did my undergraduate degree in biology went to graduate school for chemistry, and, and now I'm getting into uh, data science in various ways, for example. So I, where I see a lot of interesting thing is at those intersections. So I, I think as a student, it can be tempting to say, well, I wanna do it all, right? I, I, I wanna really try and take in, in all those things. And that, of course, has its limits. So what would be, um, you, you're at various stages in your careers. What would be your advice to students about, you know, especially undergraduate students here at Gustavus? Uh, what would be your, be your advice to them in terms of if they're interested in these fields that we're talking about today, um, what should they do next? How should they approach the, the next couple of years? Easy question. Um, I, I'll take a stab. I, I actually would would reframe the question as what is the what is your passion for a question to solve and then get the skills that you need in order to solve the question um, so you mentioned chemistry and biology as you now know there's chemical biology and there's computational biology um, you can't be an expert in all three um, but you can um, have the ability to talk the language and understand how to construct a question uh, and then find the right collaborator for the part you're missing. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, uh, good yeah. collaborators are, are sometimes hard to come by but invaluable. Totally agree. Other thoughts? I mean, I see. I, think I, I, definitely I, follow. I think Jim Thomas just started. No, it's, 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 yeah, I think uh, following your passion for sure, but I, I think uh, an intellectual capacity, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's something really important to feed. And I do think the cross-discipline aspect of so much science now, we're, we're out of, you know, just strict disciplines. And, and one of the things I was attracted to in biotechnology many years ago was it was the melt, melt, melting pot of science, right? And across these different disciplines, from engineering to you know, very basic at that time, molecular biology, immunology, and so forth. So I, I would, I would say, yes, sample a lot. <laughs> you can't be, a, you can't be an expert in everything, but sample a lot and move toward your passion, and 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 where your skill set is, you know, and uh, yeah, follow it with 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 rigor and uh, have fun. Just have fun learning. <laughs> Okay, any other thoughts on that topic? I guess I you know, I would um, very quickly. But, um, I, I think that I've had to retool. Um, I would bet that there's going to be some nodding uh, by the panelists that um, over the course of my career, I've had to learn how to be a manager. I've had to learn to be, you know, do budgets. I've had to learn, you know, now I'm learning about health services and implementation science and you know, so so I think um, uh, you know what you do your undergraduate degree in, or what you start off. Um, you know, I've got to believe that Jim Thomas has had to learn how to do a whole host of things that he didn't originally train in in order to do the work that he. So be ready to lifelong learn, I guess. Okay, Dr. Jim, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I would just say um, it's changed since. I think when Jim and Charles and I started off at the bench, it was much more of a foxhole thing. And, and now team science has really become, you know, emerged. And, and like the project Charles talked about where all these sequences and now other people, you can crowdsource, you could, but working in a team environment is really important, getting those skills. 
I think um, there's some things you have to go deep on, you know, and that may be, but if you can work with other people, it, it will really, it's both fun, it's international, and, and it's how you can solve complex problems. Great, see a lot of nodding. And if so, I may, yeah, I mean, yeah, if sure. I may just add one small thing, especially just emphasizing what Charles started off saying, which is don't get too seduced by something that you think is the in-field, right? Um, because what is in now when you're a student is going to be completely gone in, in 10 years' time, and it's going to be replaced by a field that none of us have thought about today. So I think, you know, just emphasizing what Charles said about actually find out what is it that you're desperate to solve, what is it that you can't stop yourself thinking about, and just get whatever tools you have um, and, and train in, in something, be strong in something, but, but that's it. Don't, don't, get, do, don't chase the fashion, chase the problem that you want to solve. All right. Well, great. Thanks so much uh, for this uh, very rich discussion. We'll have another opportunity tomorrow. And uh, I guess it's over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, panelists. And I look forward to doing this again tomorrow. Take good care. And we'll enjoy watching the rest of your talks over the next day. So thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much. So that leaves us with a little bit of time to have a conversation with my colleague, Laura Burak, who will be joining me in just a moment. That, that concluding conversation, though, was very interesting to me because uh, I think about the ways in which a liberal arts education really does invite the kind of cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, non-disciplinary thinking that all of our presenters were talking about. It's interesting to me that uh, Professor Charles Sawyers, Dr. Charles Sawyers, I should say, was actually a history uh, student in his undergraduate uh, degree. And he said, you know, there are ways in which learning how to solve those puzzles, the puzzles that you solve when you're writing a, uh, an undergraduate bachelor's thesis and you're looking at original manuscripts in the library, manuscripts that maybe no one has looked at for a hundred years excuse me, 100 years, is also a kind of puzzle solving. He describes himself as a puzzle solver. So I think that there really is a way in which that liberal arts education gifts you, well, maybe not gifts with you, gifts you, uh, gives you the opportunity to develop some really impressive tools in your, in your toolbox, um, tools that enable you to ask those questions. One of the things that I'd really like to ask our speakers, though, is how do you cultivate a passion when you're not sure that you have one? I think it's a wonderful idea, and I also know that when I work with students, sometimes they might be afraid to have a passion, or they might really say, I'm not sure what having a passion looks like. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll have a chance to ask them that question soon enough. Now I'm, I think, joined by my colleague, Laura Barak, who is here to do a little debrief about what she just heard. I feel like the NPR reporters who now say, Laura, what did you hear? <laughs> what did you hear in that discussion that interested you? <laughs> I think one thing that I found fascinating was sort of the recurring theme of the importance of medical records. So sort of returning to the different ways in which they can be used, both uh, if we think to uh, Shanita hughes Habert's talk earlier today, where she talked about sort of text mining those for indications of patient loneliness or lack of support or things like that, to being a place where you can potentially see implicit bias, where you see the differences between what's been written down uh, versus what's actually expressed from the patient perspective, all the way to the genomic data and thinking about how do you sort of take that genomic data and sort of put it together. And so I think that it's really interesting to think about because those patient records are potentially so important for doing all of this different type of research, but also we want to think about protecting the uh, privacy of these patients. Like how do you actually do this research while remaining uh, sort of a truly anonymous uh, and all those types of issues too, because if you, especially if you think about genomic data, uh, people that are experts in genomic data, can identify people based on just the genomic data that's there. And so mm -hmm. how do you balance all of these different issues, I think is something that is one thing that struck me from the sort of day as a whole. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Indeed, on that last point, isn't it the case that some murderer was discovered because he had been, uh, his data had been, or I'm sorry, his genome had been sequenced by one of these, uh, uh, Ancestry.com or one of those sources? Do you remember that story? Yeah, so that was a story that came out a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, where essentially they used DNA from a crime scene and then uploaded it into an Ancestry database uh, and sort of found distant relatives. Uh, that's certainly not the only case that has been solved in that sort of way. Uh, and the database that's been used actually had a data breach uh, not so long ago and some issues with their privacy settings. So mm. that's a really big, complicated area uh, that mm. could probably be a whole other Nobel conference someday. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Now I'm really worried about having sequenced my dog's DNA. Oh, Ampersand, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> another thing I heard Dr. Sawyer say, Charles Sawyer say with respect to that is the difficulty. What did he say? It's, a, it's filled with gold nuggets, uh, that, that uh, patient data, and it's much more difficult to um, trawl and to identify pieces of information. I was interested in Dr. Hughes Halbert's discussion of uh, natural language um, searches um, and other ways to, I assume, make it easier to get at the information that we actually need. And obviously, when you're the patient and you're trying to answer those questions, I know I always struggle over those patient questionnaires because I think, how do I say this exactly in a way that will actually manifest that the pain is an eight and a half or, you know, that I felt it three times. You know, I think we as patients really struggle because we realize the importance of that. And yet, on the other end of things, the difficulty of actually making any sense out of all that um, information is really quite insurmountable, I would think. Mm -hmm. It could be an example where some of the digital humanities work that's occurring mm. might actually be a place where there could be a really good intersection between medical research and some of the digital humanities approaches to trying to think about uh, all these different, what does the text mean uh, sort of questions. So might be another little tiny plug for the liberal arts. What a lovely, lo well, that was a lovely softball, Laura. That's a really great point. <laughs> That's a really great point. I know that Dr. Alazakani, when she talks about her knowledge base as distinct from a database, is going to talk quite a lot about uh, the number of kinds of data. Uh, and indeed, one of the really important ones is patient data. Great. What else? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that point. Also, uh, I was really struck uh, by Jim Thomas's talk today when he was talking about the way in which artificial intelligence could be used to think about how to design an antibody because they're so complicated. Uh, and he gave the example of the faces uh, yes. where essentially you could have a computer regenerate a human face from scratch and I couldn't tell the difference. I was sitting uh, watching the talk uh, and I thought maybe B, and then it turned out all of them were regenerated. And so I think that that's one more example of potentially the, the power of artificial intelligence that has sort of been demonstrated that I'm sure we'll get even, even better look at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Dwight asked a question about this, but I wonder if you want to drill into it a little bit more. Can you talk about some of the kinds of concerns that people might be having? Now, he talked about uh, false negative. Um, but what might be some of the other concerns? I, I mean, I know that with, um, with uh, uh, AI, we know all kinds of worries when, for instance, it's being designed to recognize faces, and we know that systematically faces of color are under-recognized. Uh, um, but what might there be concerns also when using this uh, kind of technology with respect to um, identifying molecules? I think uh, there's not necessarily the same privacy issues when you're thinking about identifying molecules because they're not people or things like that. Right. But I think that one of the things to think about is when you're thinking about all these molecules, uh, like we can see things as humans sometimes that machines have a difficult time doing. So one of the things, one of the very few things that humans are still like maybe better at <laughs> than computers is pattern recognition. And so that's sort of the basis of some of the like, are you a robot tests when you have to like click the crosswalks and things like that. And so, uh, I think that there's still that question of 
is the computer really doing a better job of getting the pattern recognition or not? Uh, and so who do you trust? Uh, and so I think that as more and more data is accumulated, as more and more sort of small molecules are available, as more and more antibodies are available, you have to think about how do you actually choose a treatment for a given patient? And so uh, one of the things that is sort of a follow-up of that is if the computer says one thing and a doctor says another thing, how, how do you actually decide? And I think that sort of as treatment advances, there's that whole question of as complexity increases, how do you actually make sense of all of this information? Uh, how do you sort of take all of this information that's out there and have it in a place where people can access it? And I think that that whole complexity starts to get at some of the questions that were also raised in the panel today about what are some of the causes of the disparities? So there's ideas about where treatment does occur. Does it occur at a National Cancer Institute designated center, or does it occur uh, at a small cancer treatment center uh, close to where a patient lives? Uh, what is the sort of clinical trial access where people live? How much does geographics really matter versus socioeconomic factors. There's so many different limitations. Um, and one of them is probably simply just the complexity that if you had three options, everyone could know about those three options. Mm -hmm. But if there's 50 options for a given patient, how do you choose that? How do you uh, make sure that there's education and databases, though, that you can actually figure it out. I think those are some of the hints at some of the future questions that are to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a, a left field question, but it's one that's remaining from earlier in the day for me, and I think for some of our uh, audience members, and that is, I've been really struck by how many of these revolutionary treatments address leukemia. And then when you look at the numbers, it's maybe not a kind of leukemia that is um, experienced by very many people. Why is it, Laura, that these, these uh, therapies are being successful first with leukemia? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, so actually chemotherapy was also first tested on, bone, on blood cancers as well. Uh, so I think that there's a number of different factors that go into it. Uh, one is just potentially the accessibility. So when you think about a solid tumor, uh, it's kind of a protected environment in the middle, especially. And so if you're trying to get at the middle of that solid, uh, it's harder to get at the middle than it is to get to a bunch of distributed cells. And so blood cancer tumors are distributed throughout the body. And so therefore, if a drug is also distributed throughout the body, then it might be easier to sort of reach all of the cells at once. Uh, so there's the distribution factor. Uh, there's also uh, sort of the way in which mutations happen. So uh, I think that generally speaking, the number of mutations that are present in a blood cancer is less than the number of mutations that are present in a solid tumor. Uh, and uh, solid tumors therefore have more what's called heterogeneity, where there's lots of different types of cancers essentially within one tumor. Uh, and so when we think about drug resistance and things like that, I think that cancers that are more developed, including solid phase cancers, would be things that would be harder to treat with these drugs because resistance is more likely. Uh, and then when it comes to the immune system treatments, so immunotherapy, especially like the CAR-T therapies, uh, solid tumors exist in a sort of T cell restrictive environment. So it's very difficult for the T cells to work. There's lots of negative signals because in order for the tumor to have grown to that extent, it has to be producing these negative signals. So without those negative signals, you wouldn't have had the tumor. And so therefore, 
in addition to that sort of distance factor, there's also like sort of a T cell toxicity that surrounds the, the tumor that isn't there in the blood cell cancer. And so uh, there's a lot of factors, but certainly uh, there have been very good, uh, especially checkpoint immunotherapies for solid tumors. So checkpoint immunotherapies are different than the ones that Carl June talked about today. And they're essentially ones that are focused at getting rid of that toxic environment. So essentially they act upon those negative signals for the T cells. And so essentially the tumor has all these turn off, turn off, turn off signals and the checkpoint immunotherapy say, nope, you should turn on, turn on. And so uh, those have been successful. And so they don't work for every patient, but there are a number of different solid tumors that have been treated very successfully with those therapies, such as certain types of lung cancer, certain types of colon cancer, melanoma. Right, right, right. Thanks very much for that. And thanks for your, uh, your overview of what's gone on so far. I look forward to having another conversation with you tomorrow after we've heard a few more talks. Yes, Great. excellent. Thanks, Laura. Take good Thanks, care. Thanks, Lisa. See you. Bye. So in a moment, I will uh, welcome to the, to the laboratory my colleague and former classmate, actually, Don Myers, who is the, Don is the uh, director of the Hillstrom Museum in, at Gustavus, and he's here to be talking about um, some uh, exhibits that have been created, especially for this conference. We're really excited about that. I just really do, I've said it a number of times, but uh, coming up on this evening of really exciting uh, fine arts events, I just really want to emphasize the importance of exploring this topic through the fine arts. So tonight you have an opportunity to experience three separate art exhibitions, actually. Uh, you also have an opportunity to uh, experience a concert that has been designed and created by two Gustavus grads and a, uh, and a number of our current Gustavus students. Uh, so it's a really wonderful opportunity to think about cancer through these other media. So I'm really happy to welcome my colleague and friend and former classmate, uh, Don Myers, the director of the Hillstrom Museum of Art. Don, welcome to the laboratory. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Good to be here. And I'm asking everyone, do you, uh, do you, does some of your lab work happen in this room where you are right now? <laughs> um, mine does not. <laughs> <laughs> right, you're, you're able to conduct your uh, assays in a different f venue. So I am really excited that you have put together two different uh, exhibition, I'm sorry, exhibitions for this year's Nobel Conference, which people, even though you're not allowed to come onto campus, I'm sorry about that, you can really experience much of the richness online. So Don, why don't you tell us about those? Sure. Uh, we have two exhibits, as you mentioned. Um, one is a juried show called um, Cancer Never Had Me, Views by Artists. And the other slightly smaller show is um, Artists Who Had Cancer, Works from the Hillstrom and Sjogren Meyer Collections. And um, two quite different exhibits. The, the smaller show is an historical show. All the artists are from the past. And um, with the exception of one artist in the juried show, um, they are contemporary artists who are still with us today. And uh, the juried exhibit has 45 different artworks and they range from very um, um, abstract works to very concrete kind of Im imagery. The artists in the exhibits are all, um, they have all been affected by, art, uh, by cancer in some significant way, directly or indirectly. Um, we put out a call to artists of 18 years or older um, who fill that bill. And so that's basically every artist, I would say, who's not a minor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so having curated a show where people very intentionally were presenting works that spoke of or spoke about their cancer or the cancer of someone close to them, 
Did you notice things about the works in the other exhibition, uh, works that were not necessarily created intentionally to speak to cancer? Did any features of those works pop out for you after that? Well, I suppose to some degree, but the, the works are ones that we happen to have available by those artists, so they don't necessarily, as you indicate, um, connect with the fact that the artist had cancer in one um, particular um, exception, that being Grant Wood's family doctor lithograph, which um, is the hands of his own physician, and um, it was the, the examples were signed while he was in the hospital the last few months of his life. Um, before he passed, passed away from pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A form of cancer that, as the exhibition points out, is still one of those that is tremendously challenging. The, the prognosis for folks with pancreatic cancer is still quite bleak. Right. We were very grateful to Laura Barak for putting together um, some texts um, where we know the kinds of cancer that the artist had. Um, she considered the treatments that were available and the, in the artist's lifetime um, versus what's available today. And of course, it's a very hopeful kind of scene because so much has happened and so much more is available. Um, not every cancer, as you say, is, is mm -hmm. easily treatable still yet, however. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So where did you uh, come up with this idea of a juried show? Well, um, soon after you told me what the Nobel conference theme would be this year, um, I thought it really lent itself well to having some sort of exhibit to connect with it. And we have done some juried shows in the past, um, thematic exhibits. The challenge with them is that you don't know what's going to be submitted. So <laughs> it's always a bit of a crapshoot. Um, the fun thing is that, you know, we get all these different images that the artists have submitted and they're interesting and, you know, very compelling and interesting. Um, but it's not until you actually see the works in person that you know if they're really strong. And I'm happy to say that I was not disappointed by any of the works when they were brought or sent to the museum. There, there are a lot of very strong works by a range of artists, artists who are students still yet, but artists who are, you know, old pros as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you're describing this process, I'm realizing that w must have been additionally challenging for people to both mail you and for you to receive all these works in the middle of a global pandemic. Were there additional <laughs> challenges to simply <laughs> mounting this show because you were trying to do it in the middle of a shutdown? Oh, definitely. Um, when most of the works were brought, um, it was still warm summer and um, I could have the artists come up to the curb by the emergency exit door of the museum and lean their work against a tree, say, and once they stepped away, I would go in and pick it up and bring it down to the museum. So they didn't have to, you know, touch me or touch each other or get close to each other or anything of that sort. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of challenging. Um, but you know, it's a joy because you then get to see the artworks and mm. slightly get to know, you know, the, the eyes of the artist mm. at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, you had a juror uh, for the show, and how how did you how did you select a juror, or how did how did you approach a juror? What is that process like? Well, um, I just considered people that I know that might be good jurors, and um, Gregory Jackman is a former curator from the National Gallery of Art. Yeah, he was in the prints and drawings, old master drawings division, and he also ran the um, print study room, and I've known him for many years. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, somebody told me, a mutual friend told me that he had done these kinds of juring processes before. So I just reached out to him and he said, yeah, I'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. And he was a joy to work with. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing for me is that, you know, everybody that was involved with the exhibit, you would end up hearing their own cancer story. So Greg's parents both went through cancer, his father twice. Mm -hmm. And um, when we had our signage for the exhibit put up, uh, Bolo Signs here in town comes and puts them up. They look very beautiful and professional. Um, Margaret and Dave, Margaret told me that she's had cancer four times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a universal mm -hmm. theme and I don't mm -hmm. think there's anyone who's not been touched by it and affected heavily mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And as you say, it is one of those topics that, I mean, as we've worked on the conference, I mean, one of the reasons that something like this show is so important is 
while the science is absolutely amazing and exciting to think about, and, and while the social science questions are compelling, every time you talk about the science and the social science, you are reminded that there are real human beings in real hospital beds or you know, going through real uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and, right, it's, it's and very immediate. Exactly, that's the word, that's the word. It's very immediate. Um, yes, exactly. Um, let's see, what else did I want to ask? Are there, are there particular works that you'd like to lift up? I know that there were, for the juried show, there were uh, four uh, selected for mention, and plus uh, uh, Four a prizes of plus four honorable mentions. And um, nothing of that sort for the, the smaller exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, are you asking me if I have particular favorites? <laughs> well, if you would feel comfortable telling us about a favorite, of course, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, there are 45 works in the Cancer Never Had Me exhibit, so I have 45 favorites. There you but go. But I'll mention a Perfect. couple. <laughs> um, one that really struck me was, it's called It Sounds Like a Cicada. It's by Jill Dumbledee um, Coon, Double D Coon, excuse me. Um, it has this female torso slash tree with a cicada on it. And she went through treatment that included radiation and she felt that the sound of the radiation made her think of a cicada. We all know that kind of buzzing sound. And so she combines that into this really lush and beautiful image. Uh, another favorite is um, Brenda Gill's work. And I'm trying to think if I can remember the exact title. It shows set seven different fishing lures. Her father was a fisherman. Her father was a Vietnam vet. Um, he died of glioblastoma. And the fishing lures are each labeled with one particular kind of cancer, six of which are accepted as having a connection to Agent Orange. And glioblastoma is the seventh one, which hasn't quite been agreed that it's you know connected with Agent Orange. So her father passed away from this, and he was a Vietnam vet as well oh, as a fisherman. As well as a fisherman. That's, I find that particularly moving. It's it's delicate and and um, you know realistic, but not I don't know storytelling. I guess deeply, deeply symbolic. Yes, indeed. absolutely. Indeed. Right. Um, what, are, what should I be asking you about the exhibition that I've not thought to ask you, Don? Especially well, given that uh, it has to be experienced electronically. I think that that's exactly what I was going to mention, is that um, it's challenging for off-campus people to come see the exhibits, but we do have catalogs, fully illustrated catalogs for both the exhibits, and those are available in PDF form on the, um, the museum's webpage. Um, so we encourage people to look at that. And then also we put together a nice introductory tour, 10 minutes or so, something like that, um, that gives a taste of both the exhibits and draws on the statements that the artists wrote for the jury show. Um, it's some of these, some of these statements are very moving and very, uh, I had to write a text for this and then I had to record it and I had to steal myself because when you're reading these words, they're very moving. It's hard not to become emotional. So I think that that, that um, video will be a really good way for people to experience what's going on in the, in the museum. And it is going to play right after our conversation. Oh, so good. yes, oh, so wonderful. those of you who'd like to see it immediately after this will be able to do so. And I just remind everyone that if you don't have time to watch it right now, it's available in the Learn More About Cancer uh, section of the webpage. And there's a, there's a section called Art at Nobel Conference, I believe. Uh, this is an amateur's question, but as I look at a catalog, knowing that it's a catalog rather than the live work, and as you pointed out, there's they come alive when you see them for real. But can you give us recommendations, um, everyone who's off campus? How do we look at a little picture in a catalog and kind of get a sense of what that work is like, mm -hmm. really? Well, that definitely is a challenge. And, you know, the catalog has fairly small images. I might mention that we are in the process of putting together um, sort of quick walkthrough tours of both the exhibits, and those will be available. I don't know how soon, but fairly soon on the museum webpage. And um, the videographer just walked through one at a time and there's a, a caption. So you get to see it 
sort of in situ and uh, maybe a little bit larger than you would when you look at the catalog, but you can read who the artist is and then go back to the catalog and check it out further. Oh, but wonderful. Obvious, obviously, it's best if you could come see the actual works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, pandemics, pandemics. Well, I, <laughs> I am so grateful that you've, uh, you've come and joined me today and talked a little bit about these works. And I'm so grateful for all of the work that you and the staff of the Hillstrom Museum uh, did to make these, work, these uh, two exhibitions um, available. One more time with the names, Don. The jury show is called Cancer Never Had Me, Views by Artists. And the smaller exhibit is called Artists Who Had Cancer, Works from the Hillstrom and Sjogren Meyer Collections. And may I just mention who Sjogren Meyer are? Please. Collectors from the Twin Cities area who very generously lent 16 um, wonderful photographs by people ranging from Dorothea Lange to Gordon Parks for this exhibit. Wonderful, yes, thank you to them very much. Great, and thanks to you, Don. Thank Take you, Lisa. Care. You too. Good evening. The Hillstrom Museum of Art has organized two cancer-themed exhibits that coincide with the 2020 Nobel Conference of Gustavus Adolphus College, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. The larger, juried exhibit, Cancer Never Had Me, includes 45 works by 33 different artists who have been affected, directly or indirectly, by cancer. She's not here, she died, is how the artists of this work responded when someone on the phone asked for her recently deceased mother, who died of cancer years ago when the artist was 17. Exhibition juror Gregory Jackman, a retired curator from the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., selected the exhibit's works and awarded first through fourth prizes, also naming four honorable mentions. First prize, The Artist and the Surgeon, is a handmade accordion book with photos. The artist notes that after breast cancer surgery, she and her caregiver devised a daily ritual of documenting the marks on her body from the surgery, as well as changes to cut flowers she had in a vase. Clean margin biopsy was the term used to indicate that this artist's prostate cancer was confined to that gland and had not spread, news that made him cry. The process of creating the small drawings combined to form this work, one for each of the 238 days from diagnosis through treatment, was therapeutic for this artist and allowed her to quell the chaos she experienced throughout the ordeal. Several works in Cancer Never Had Me deal with breast cancer, including those awarded the second and third prizes. An imaginative rendering in fabric, beads, and thread of a mammogram references the detection and treatment of cancer in this artist's mother nearly three decades ago. Altered Suns suggests, through its intense colors, the harshness of a desert, and the artist parallels survival of such an unrelenting environment with survival of the hardships of her invasive ductal carcinoma breast cancer. A more Eden-like scene is found in a watercolor memorializing this artist's athlete brother, who regularly wore sunscreen during his runs, but forgot to cover the small space of skin on the back of his neck just below the hairline, leading to the cancer that took his life. Fourth Prize is a mixed media work that relates to this artist's mother's cancer, referencing her Swedish roots through typical blue and yellow colors, and also her Native American heritage through characteristic forms of beadwork and stitching. The last time this artist saw her dear friend, Joanne did not want photos taken of her, but she agreed to have her hands captured showing off the manicure she had continued to have. 
When young, this artist would sometimes use a Sharpie marker to connect her. He has familial atypical multiple mole melanoma syndrome. Two of the honorable mentions in Cancer Never Had Me reference gold, including this one that uses imitation gold leaf to symbolize the lymphoma was determined. One more honorable mention is a triptych that uses strong colors and surreal imagery to relate to this artist's experience with breast cancer. The work also includes torn pieces of paper on which she had typed her feelings about her struggle with the disease. Also dealing with breast cancer is a work in which the artist associates the high-pitched buzzing heard during her radiation treatment with the sounds of cicadas, noting that just as the insects discard their useless shells and transform into creatures capable of flight, so did she change from a person with breast cancer to one without. This artist, after being diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, created a body of multiple works providing perspectives on the disease, including this large-scale self-portrait taken after a radiation treatment. A positive message, depicted through semi-abstract images of colorful cells, is what the artist of No Cause to Mourn wants to convey, related to her father's stage four bladder cancer, about which he never complains, The second cancer-themed exhibit at the Hillstrom Museum of Art, Artists Who Had Cancer, includes 32 works by 16 American artists, all of who succumbed to the disease. The works, mostly dating from the first half of the 20th century, are from the museum's collection or generously lent from the collection of Daniel Sjogren and Susan Meyer. For the artists whose type of cancer is known, exhibition texts discuss their careers and, in some cases, the impact the disease had on their lives and work. In addition, Laura Burak, co-chairperson of the Nobel Conference on Cancer, has written about the cancer treatments available in the lifetime of the artists, comparing that with what's possible today. Prominent painter Robert Henry and famed photographer Gordon Parks both had prostate cancer. Henry remained active as an artist into his 63rd year. He complained about pain in his left hip and was never told by his doctors or his wife Marjorie that the cause was cancer that had spread to his pelvis and lower spine. Surgical and radiation treatments for prostate cancer were still in early stages of development in the first part of the 20th century, and at that time there was no treatment if the cancer had spread. When Gordon Parks died in 2006, not only had surgery and radiation been improved, but also drugs that prevent tumor growth were available, and today, expanded treatment for prostate cancer includes a vaccine and a drug called enzalutamide that was co-invented by one of the Nobel Conference speakers, Dr. Charles Sawyers. When famed regionalist Grant Wood died a couple hours short of his 51st birthday from pancreatic cancer, he knew it was coming. He had entered the hospital after months of not feeling well and agreed to have exploratory surgery as long as the doctors promised to tell him whatever they found. His sister Nan, famed as the model for the dour female figure in Wood's iconic painting American Gothic, told her brother's assistant that Wood should not be told about his cancer. But he disagreed, saying Grant is a man and a brave one, and he's entitled to know what ails him. Wood remained hospitalized for around two months and had hopes, unfulfilled, to be able to paint while there. He did, however, sign the examples of his last lithograph, Family Doctor, from his sickbed. At the time of Wood's death, surgery was the only treatment for cancer of the pancreas, but it wasn't an option if the disease had spread. And while there are today many more treatment possibilities, the five-year survival rate is still only 9% partly because the cancer is often undetected until it has spread. The universality of cancer's impact on all people is a central message in the two exhibits related to cancer at the Hillstrom Museum of Art. 
electronic versions of the catalogs for both Cancer Never Had Me and Artists Who Had Cancer are available on the museum's webpage at www.gustavus.edu forward slash Hillstrom. Hello, friends. I made a rookie mistake and forgot to announce another art-related event that's happening right now. So I just wanted to pop in here and tell you that right now there is a discussion with the artist Allison Hiltner, whose show is in the Schaefer Gallery at Gustavus right now. If you'd like to go to that, the link is, um, you can find the live stream link to the, the talk at um, gustavus.edu slash Nobel Conference. Allison created an exhibit on display for the campus community, but she will talk about that work, and at 6.50, we'll show the video of that exhibition. And then right after that, I will talk with, um, with the curator of, the, of that exhibition. So again, just hop over to Allison's show right now, or her discussion right now, and then you can see um, a little video of that show at 6.50. So enjoy. Hello, I'm Helen King from The Open University, and today I'm going to be talking about historical patients. In the last piece, I talked a bit about how we want a disease to have a history. History sort of matters. Cancer's no exception. Having a history is something that physicians want because they can show themselves as part of a long tradition, a tradition of progress. It's also something that patients want because it is reassuring to know that there is something that's happened before that's relevant to what you're going through now. And I think that applies particularly to finding stories of patients. So I'm going to look at some ancient stories of patients and also a modern story of patients today. We have to bear in mind, of course, that point I made in the first video, that even when an earlier text in history talks about cancer or carcinoma or anything like that, we can't be sure it means cancer in the sense that we mean it today because the tests aren't available, we haven't got access to the tissue to say what these people really had. But the perception of cancer is what I'm looking at here. Just because we haven't got the evidence doesn't stop historians or patients or websites making stories. I'm gonna concentrate again today on breast cancer. And if you go online, you'll find there are various lists of famous women who had breast cancer. Presumably it's supposed to be reassuring if you have it today to know that famous women of the past did too. One of the very earliest women who occurs on these lists is the Persian queen called Atossa. Today there's actually a clinical trial in Australia that's being run that's called Atossa Therapeutics. You can look it up online, it tests hormone therapy using an oral hormone, uh, endoxifen, in patients with invasive breast cancer who take this before they have either lumpectomy or mastectomy. As of May 2020, the results were looking very encouraging and the trial moved on to its next stage. But to me, it's just fascinating that it calls itself Atossa after this Persian queen. So what's the story? Who was Atossa? What happened to her? Our source is the ancient Greek historian Herodotus. It's in book three chapter 133, and I've included in the list of reading a reference to how you can find the story online. But I'll just read you the, that chapter, chapter 133 here. It's set in 520 BC. Here it goes. A short time after this, something else occurred. There was a swelling on the breast of Atossa, the daughter of Cyrus and wife of Darius, which broke and spread further. As long as it was small, she hid it out of shame and told no one. But when it got bad, she sent for Democedes and showed it to him. He said he'd cure her, but made her swear that she would repay him by granting whatever he asked of her, and said that he would ask nothing shameful. So that's the story. Who was a tosser? Well, wife of one king of Persia, daughter of another. It's interesting that the first response that she has to whatever's happening in her breast is shame. The Greek word here is aiskunomine, and that's from a verb which can have the sense of dishonoring or making something ugly. So it could be she felt 
ugly. It could be that she was ashamed to let a man see her breast other than her husband. There are many, many examples in the history of medicine of women who suffer for a long time because they're really too embarrassed to show their condition to anyone who might offer them care. This Demosides, well, he's a doctor, a Greek doctor. He's at the Persian court. He's already successfully treated Atossa's husband, Darius, King Darius, for a very bad, difficult to say what it is, obviously, with, retros with retrospective diagnosis, but it seems to be a badly dislocated foot. Uh, his foot is causing him extreme pain. The historian Herodotus, who writes these things, told, tells us that Dr. Demosides, I quote, applied Greek remedies and used gentleness instead of the Egyptians' violence. So there's a subtext here in this history book written by a Greek for Greeks. What he's saying is that Greek medicine is a lot better than any of the other medicines of the ancient Mediterranean. And what is Demosides' reward? What does he ask for in return? He promises it won't be anything shameful, which is interesting when shame was the response that Artossa had to her breast problem. What he asks for is for her to intervene with her husband, the king, and persuade the king to invade Greece with Demosides as personal advisor to the army. So Demosides and 15 Persian generals go off to Greece to look at the coast and see what can be conquered. And during that, Demosides escapes and goes home, which is what he wanted in the first place. So that's what he gets as his reward. What about that swelling though? There was a swelling on the breast of Artossa. In the first of these videos, I tried to point out that some of the claims made about the earliest history of cancer rely a lot on translation, translating general words for swelling as tumour to make it sound more like it's definitely cancer. The word here, the original ancient Greek word, is phuma, phuma, which is literally just a growth. It's from the verb to grow. So it could be translated and has been by other people translating this story as boil, as ulcer, as abscess, and of course it has been translated as tumour. The swelling bursts and spreads. It's not clear in the story at all what Demosides does to cure her. He just says he said he would cure her, and he does. But bearing in mind he's already been praised by Herodotus for the gentleness of his therapy, it seems unlikely he would have used surgery. We know that Atossa lived on for many years, had four sons, and had no recurrence of this condition, as far as we know. So she's a survivor, whatever it is. But those writing about this story in modern times read all sorts of things into what's a really short story. One example is Siddhartha Mukherjee, oncologist and writer, in his 2011 Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. For him, Atossa is a very important case. She's referred to three times in this book. The first reference, that he makes actually compares her with one of his own cases, a woman with stage three breast cancer. And this is what he writes. The isolation and rage of a 36 year old woman with stage three breast cancer had ancient echoes in Atossa, the Persian queen who swaddled her diseased breast in cloth to hide it. And then in a fit of nihilistic and prescient fury, possibly had a slave cut it off with a knife. Now, you'd have really realised none of that's in the story. There's no reference to the treatment that Demosides uses. Mastectomy seems unlikely, not to mention challenging. Uh, and there's nothing there about this fury and swaddling her diseased breast in cloth is rather more than what the story is telling us. Now, the second reference, uh, that was on page five, the second reference is on page 41, goes like this. In the middle of her reign, can I just say that's not in the story? In the middle of her reign, Atossa noticed a bleeding lump in her breast that may have arisen from a particularly malevolent form of breast cancer labelled inflammatory. If Atossa had desired it, an entire retinue of physicians from Babylonia to Greece would have flocked to her bedside to treat her. Instead, she descended into a fierce and impenetrable loneliness. 
she wrapped herself in sheets in a self-imposed quarantine. Darius's doctors may have tried to treat her, but to no avail. Ultimately, a Greek slave named Demosides persuaded her to allow him to excise the tumour. So that's what we read in that reference. So just looking at these two passages already from the Emperor of All Maladies, the first is talking about her fury. The second is attributing loneliness to Atossa. And again, the treatment is assumed to be surgical. In one reference, it's excision of the tumour. In one, it's excision of the whole breast. And then the third reference in the book treats Atossa as a traveller through time and explores, very interestingly, what treatment she'd be offered during each century over history. And includes the line, this is on page 463, in 500 BC, in her own court, Atossa self-prescribes the most primitive form of a mastectomy, which is performed by her Greek slave. I don't know where that comes from. It's not in the story. In the second reference from Emperor of All Maladies, Maladies Demosides persuades Atossa to have surgery. In the third reference, she prescribes it herself. What is going on here? It seems impossible not to read things into this story that aren't actually there. We assume we know how Atossa felt about the swelling. We assume we know what the treatment would have been. None of this is given. All this is inevitably influenced by our own knowledge, projecting that back into the past. And it's also influenced by our knowledge of other breast cancer survivor stories. Among those, there's the extraordinary letter written in 1812 by the novelist and diarist Fanny Burney. She describes to her sister the surgery she went through in 1811. It's been digitized by the British Library, so you can read it online. You can see the original and you can read the transcript. She describes cancer as this dreadfulest of all maladies. And she vividly describes the horror of seeing all the bandages and dressings ready for her surgery. And then the extreme pain of a mastectomy without anesthesia. She lived for 29 years after this surgery. The message, as another survivor of breast cancer, the British broadcaster Jenny Murray wrote, is that, and I quote from an article in The Guardian, I've given you the reference, though the diagnosis is awful and the surgery, even with a full anaesthetic, isn't pleasant, breast cancer can be survived and a long and productive life lived after it. For this, she, Fanny Burney, deserves her place among the greatest women. The difference between Atossa and Fanny Burney, though, is not just a millennia and a half of time. Atossa lived in an era where cancer was not understood, and there's really no way of knowing if what she had was cancer anyway. Burney knows all too well what's going on and what the prognosis would be. But also we read Atossa only through the words of Herodotus who's telling us this story, not because he's interested in Atossa, but because he wants to show that Greek doctors know best. For Bernie, in contrast, we have her own words, although written six months after the events that she describes. But both women, whatever we think in terms of the diagnosis we're giving to them, offer hope to women now. They offer hope to survivors. They help them make sense of their experience. So history isn't just about the facts, it's also about what you use it for. In the next and final piece in this series, I'll be looking at changing theories of what cancer is, looking at it more from the medical point of view than the patient point of view. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. I'm Nate Otto. And we both teach here at Gustavus in the Department of Health and Exercise Science. And we are so excited that the Nobel Committee invited us here to teach you a little bit about um, cooking ravioli today. 
Um, if you didn't catch the pasta video that we did, um, you can go back and watch that because we won't be covering how to make fresh ravioli. We've already prepared that for you. We're going to get right into the ravioli filling in this video. So a few of the tools that you're going to need, um, a sharp knife, definitely important part of uh, prepping all of our vegetables. We'll use a bench scraper. Again, we're bringing back the bench scraper. We have a plastic one and a metal one. Um, we uh, also have a sentuku uh, knife that we use uh, for a lot of the prep, um, but a good chef's knife is um, something that we um, will use regularly as well. We're going to need our ravioli cutters. Um, we've also brought, if you don't have a ravioli, ravioli cutter, you can also use a glass. Um, and then if you don't, um, we want a little bit larger ravioli, we've um, used a, a, a water chestnut can, cut the bottom off and the top off, and it makes a really good, nice, big, um, uh, appetizer ravioli, if you want to use the appetizer or even a cookie cutter would work as well. Um, outside of that, we have our pasta dough prepped and ready to go and our vegetables. Yeah, and the pasta dough has been resting for a little bit and is starting to dry out, which is going to be great because it will make a nice solid container for all of our filling. So the vegetables that we chose today, we have a variety of squash, uh, which should be in season around this time of the year. We also are using Brussels sprouts. We have some tomatoes, a really nice, strong uh, purple onion, and then we have some really good uh, Parmesan cheese. We'll also be using some olive oil and some herbs. We chose um, oregano and thyme for this particular recipe. The no lovely thing about ravioli is you can put whatever you want in there. So if these particular vegetable combinations aren't your particular favorite, you can choose whichever ones you like. We um, really would encourage you to use butternut squash because it gives the filling a little bit of a sweet and kind of a creamy texture, which really works nicely uh, in the ravioli. But again, feel free to use whatever filling you like. Um, the other thing that's really great about ravioli filling and using uh, pureed vegetables is you can hide things inside your ravioli. <laughs> Especially from your kids. Right? So we've tested this recipe on our kids and they love it. We didn't happen to tell them that there were Brussels sprouts in there <laughs> until after they had already eaten it and they, they loved it. And again, so, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about if you're, um, if you're trying to experiment with some uh, different uh, vegetables. Uh, another thing to talk about here would be the American Cancer Society guidelines. Um, and one of the things that they recommend is that you consume a high amount of fruits and vegetables. And actually, the guidelines aren't all that different from um, guidelines that you and I probably have heard of. The number one overarching guideline uh, by the American Cancer Society is maintaining a healthy weight. Uh, we know that a diet is a a component of maintaining a healthy weight, but please keep in mind that um, the factors contributing to any kind of chronic disease development, whether it's cancer, heart disease, or diabetes, are multifaceted and very complicated. So there's no superfood, there's no research that supports anything particularly strong related to food and cancer prevention. Um, so we want to just main, try to maintain a healthy weight by choosing foods that are um, high in antioxidants, have a really high nutrient density. And what I mean by nutrient density is that for the calories that you're consuming, you're also getting a lot of, um, veg or a lot of um, vitamins and minerals. We also want to choose healthy fats. So we're going to um, use some olive oil today as we roast our, our vegetables. Um, and olive oil contains a lot of antioxidants as well, which is kind of a nice, a nice bonus. Some of the other guidelines include limiting red meat. Uh, so this is a vegetarian meal. So that aligns nicely with the, with the guidelines. Um, and again, really, with, with regard to the high vegetable content here, I think, um, I think this is a good choice. Um, but again, keep in mind that the overarching guideline has to do with weight maintenance, not necessarily choosing a particular food. The research is really thin uh, when, we, when we talk about a particular food and cancer prevention, so, um, so keep that in mind. So we don't need to do anything super special with our vegetables since we're going to roast them. A uh, simple slice and a rough chop would be enough just for us to get them into the actual roasting pan. We typically use a 9 by 13 um, pan and um, we like that we can just evenly distribute a, a nice portion of whatever if we're going to be using again squash, 
Um, we have both zucchini and yellow squash that we're using in this recipe um, with our butternut squash. Trying to get them so that they're somewhat even all the way across. Um, not trying to make one set too big or one set too small. Just trying to find a nice even balance between them both. Um, we really like onion and uh, something that our kids have kind of grown up enjoying too as we continue to cook um, at our house. Um, so we tend to use a lot more onion. You can use a white onion, a purple onion, um, or even a yellow onion. A yellow onion might be a little more mild. Um, we really actually have grown to enjoy the purple onion. Um, we're using a Brussels sprouts. The Brussels sprouts you just cut the ends off of, pretty straightforward, and then just give them again and just a, a nice cut down both sides, kind of quarter them all the way through. Not overly complicated with the Brussels sprouts. They'll get end up cutting up later as we continue to make our filling. The key with roasting vegetables is that you try to um, cut them evenly, even even um, sizes so that one doesn't burn and, and the other one's not fully cooked. I'm just getting some of the herbs ready so once the vegetables get roasted we're going to add some of these fresh um, herbs that we have too which really add a lot of flavor to the dish. And again this recipe is really kind of up to you. If you uh, enjoy something that's a little bit spicier you can add a little bit more spice by adding some cayenne pepper or um, some other um, peppers that you maybe have in the garden, a jalapeno or um, uh, doing something maybe a little more southwestern by adding a little bit of chipotle. Really the stuffing is kind of up to you and I think there's an important part about that. When we cook this, we came up with this recipe because we were really looking for the, that those cancer guidelines as far as that vegetarian and you can kind of make it however you want in whatever flavor that you really are interested in. And we've kind of experimented with this, adding a little bit more of this and that. Um, Brussels sprouts are the one things I think the kids are um, not quite sure of yet, but they actually have enjoyed. So um, we are trying this again with our Brussels sprouts. The, one of the other things that was interesting that I found on the American Cancer Society website was a reference to um, a variety of colored foods. Right, and we know that the vitamins and minerals inside our food help give them a certain color. So um, you may have heard that guideline before um, by eating a, a plate that is colorful. So again, it was part of the reasons why we chose the, the squash and the Brussels sprouts, the green and the yellow and the reds to give you a nice example of, of what that might look like. So the squash is probably gonna give people the most trouble. Um, the squash um, is gonna need to be peeled and we've done part of that for you here. This is, um, this is what it looks like from the store. Um, and be careful when you cut this thing in half, it's pretty hardy. So have a buddy with you, <laughs> when, you when you prepare your squash. Um, and so again, you'll need to peel that hard outside um, away. Um, and then normally when you cut that in half, on the inside there will be a, number, a bunch of seeds, kind of like what you would find inside of a pumpkin. So we also just took a spoon and dug those out um, and then we'll just chop them up in, um, in even amounts and add them to our roasted vegetable tray. We try to get the, all that brown and butternut uh, shell off, as well as a lot of the white part that we are taking off. You'll see some green veins that will run through the actual squash. And we're trying to get down to that, just beyond those green veins all the way through. So we get a nice, good, almost pumpkin-y flavor as our squash color. Okay. And then again, we'll do the same thing as we go through with the rest of our vegetables. Just slice all the way through. Um, again, this, because it isn't, hasn't been cooked, has a little bit more denser um, uh, process as far as cutting through. So just be careful when you're using your knife, making sure that you get a nice, good, stable knife work. Another piece, uh, another tip that you can think about as you choose your vegetables, and was one of the reasons again why we chose these is because they are in season in the fall, and if you have access to a farmer's market, that's really a great place to get fruits and vegetables because they are the closest to where they've been farmed, and that's going to increase the amount of nutritional density or the nutrition composition of the food. The closer you can get it to where it was pulled out of the ground or yanked off of a tree, um, the higher the nutritional um, value is going to be for you. In Italy, as we traveled there, the Italians would say farm to table. It would be um, as close as you can get, within a hundred miles. Um, they really like to eat very close to home. So, 
throw these on here. We have uh, two more pieces. Um, a lot of people that I tend to cook with, um, you new cooks or even students, they're two of the more complicated things to cut are tomatoes and garlic. And one thing that we've, uh, we grow garlic in our garden um, every year. Um, one of the things that we found has been really successful, you can get all kinds of different gadgets, but I found that if you cut the tails off and just take and put your knife flat and give it a little bit of a tap with the back of your um, palm of your hand, um, those come off of there very simply. And uh, you can just take and put your peels off to the side and get a nice, wonderful garlic. And then again, just a nice, even rough chop, nothing too fancy with the garlic here. We're not trying to mince it or go through and do too, something too complicated. We're eventually gonna throw this all in a food processor anyway, so you don't have to spend too much time making it pretty. <laughs> then with the tomatoes, one thing that we try to do with the tomatoes, sometimes with a paring knife, or again, if you have a sharp chef knife, it's a little more difficult with the santuku that Stephanie's using. Um, we take out that little core, cut the tomato, and we're trying to get to that seed portion. And in our tomatoes, one of the simplest things is, you notice the vein of those seeds, we just use a spoon. You can use your thumbs too, but um, we've done canning of tomatoes and the spoon tends to be a little bit easier on the thumbs if you're doing lots of tomato work. It's not as messy either. Right. <laughs> I'll just let you finish those. Perfect. So as we get the rest of these vegetables put together, we're again um, going through just a easy soft chop. You don't have to spread them out. You can actually mix all of these vegetables together. We're just kind of giving you a nice even balance to kind of see the multicolor again, as far as the, the recommendation of the multicolored vegetables for the, the Cancer Society. I'll just do the thumbs on this one. There you, you go. You can just pull it right, you can just pull it right out too. Oops. The kids actually like doing that. <laughs> Has a good feel to it. Yeah. on there. Yep. Oops. All right. I'm going to wash my hands. Get all that cleaned up. Spread that out onto our pan. So we get a nice even cooking surface all the way through all of those. We're going to take and add some salt and pepper as we go through and some olive oil. Um, this is a, a very simple process as far as just how much you put on. Um, you just drizzle a little bit all the way across the entire set of vegetables. People are like, a little bit? Okay. Yeah, a little bit, a lot. It's really kind of up to you. Again, I think we learned that that little bit of dosing in Italy because <laughs> the ladies would just whoo everywhere. Yeah. They and like it, their olive oil they in Italy. Do. <laughs> and again, it's a healthy source of fat. It has lots of antioxidants. Um, and, you know, extra virgin olive oil. There's all sorts of controversy around different kinds of olive oil. Um, olive oil, I think, you know, for the most part, the olive oil, if it's extra virgin olive oil, it's going to be just fine. I don't think we need to spend too much time worrying about, um, worrying about where it comes from. Um, it's going to all contain those good, those good nutrients. Okay, so we have our vegetables, they're cut, and olive oil, salt, and pepper to flavor. Outside of that, we put it into a 450 degree oven, and then um, we're gonna roast for between 20, 25 minutes. Depends on how, how well your oven um, works. Uh, sometimes it might take a little bit longer and how much vegetables you're using, but you notice we only use the half of a butternut squash on this one. Um, about five or six uh, of the Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts, thanks. Uh, the red onion and the zucchini and the yellow squash and about four or five tomatoes and a few cloves of garlic. Okay, so we put that in the oven. Again, about 450 degrees. Ooh, oh. Beautiful. I got your door. Perfect. Ooh, it smells so good. <laughs> Set this right here. Not on the thing. Yeah. Here, I'll give you this one. Perfect. That's about what it should look like. You're trying to just take some of the moisture out 
um, and um, just make sure that the vegetables are nice and soft so that we can put them in a, we put ours in a food processor. If you have an immersion blender, you can use that. You probably could even use a hand mixer or um, you probably could just whip it up with a fork if you, if you had to. Um, again, it's all gonna get stuffed inside of the ravioli um, pasta and, and boiled and covered in a little bit of sauce and some cheese in the end. So we're gonna take about half of this. Yep. About, because we want to reserve some to eat on the side as well. So we're going to take about half of that and uh, put it in the food processor. Do you need another one of these? Are you good? Yeah, I'm all right. We shouldn't need to add any more liquid. Um, if it looks like it's too sticky, um, you can always add a little bit more olive oil or even a little bit of, of water if you wanted. Um, but you shouldn't have to. It should blend up just nice. Yeah, just a little extra more of the butternut squash. Yeah, again, the butternut squash gives it this um, sort of Oops. creamy texture um, and a little bit of a sweet flavor, which uh, balances out nicely with the salty pasta sauce and the Parmesan cheese that we're gonna, we're gonna add. So we need to dive, we're gonna put about four ounces of cheese inside there as well. And then I'm gonna let you scoop up the herbs. So about a tablespoon of each would be great. And if you're using dried herbs, you might need a little bit more um, compared to the, to the fresh ones. Throw those extras in there. All right, we blend this up on our food processor. Oops. Don't forget to plug it in. Yes, I do have to plug it in. Mm -hmm. I'll take these vegetables out of your way. The other thing that we found, you'll notice that the mixture is very steamy right now because it's hot. So. Um, it, it, you can do this in advance if you want to make the filling in advance um, and it, it works really nicely to let it cool a little bit. Um, if you don't have time to make it in advance, you can spread it out on a cookie sheet and throw it in the fridge for five minutes or so just, just to take the heat away from it. Otherwise it may fall right through your um, ravioli dough. <laughs> Should have kind of a really colorful um, concoction as far as like all the different colors. You can still see the reds from the, uh, the tomato, the purple from the purple onion, the green and the green speck from the zucchini and the butternut squash, as well as even the cheese. As you notice the cheese doesn't incorporate perfectly right into there, especially if you're using a hard cheese like Parmesan or Asiago. Um, some of the softer cheeses like mozzarella um, or a softer cheese like even a brie, depending upon flavor is whatever cheese you really wanna put in with your pasta um, or a ricotta. Um, it would be something that would incorporate just a little bit more. So again, your choice on cheeses. We typically do Asiago or Parmesan. Um, we really like the kind of the king of cheese, that hard Parmesan. It gives it kind of a nice nutty flavor um, and uh, you can find Parmesan in Italy pretty rapidly. So this is what our pasta filling will look like as far as we get ready to make our pasta filling um, put into our pasta dough. So we have a little bit of um, filling already made and ready to go here too. So in this pasta, um, we've already done, again, we've looked at um, the making the pasta in our first video. So we've taken our two sheets that have been um, uh, already prepped and rolled out. Again, if you're looking for more information, go ahead and watch that first video. From there, um, we're gonna roll out or lay out our pasta. Right. <laughs> So we're gonna take our pasta. Um, we're gonna use, our, we have two sheets here. There's one on the bottom here. We use them right in between tea towels or kind of a, um, a, a dish towel. Um, we take our first set of pasta. They are roughly about the same size as we rolled them out. Um, so I'm gonna lay them out so we can kind of get an idea of what our pasta um, ravioli cutters are gonna be. We take our pasta ravioli cutters. We're gonna kind of get an idea of about pro approximately softly press them in there about where we're going to put our our filling 
and we can kind of mix it up. And again, you don't have to have the ravioli cutters. You can simply use a cup. And again, if you're going to do a, just a cup, you just roughly place that on there. So you get an idea of where those filling pieces are. Take your two spoons. If you've dropped cookies before, you've dr pretty uh, um, straightforward as dropping all the rest of your ravioli filling as well. You don't need to overfill your ravioli. Sometimes just a smaller little portion of ravioli filling on the inside. And with that pre-design on the pasta, you have an, a good idea of about how much you should be putting in there. About a good half a teaspoon or almost a, you know, if a level teaspoon kind of goes through all the way um, onto our pasta dough. We'll get this laid out all the way through. And then we're gonna set that second sheet right over the top once we get all of these pieces put on here. One of the, probably the biggest mistakes, and that's even a little dramatic, it's not really a mistake, is overfilling the ravioli. For and sure. You wanna make sure that the edges seal. If they don't, your filling will just fall out and you can just scoop it up and cover it with more cheese and it's fine. But again, your best bet, especially if this is your first time making ravioli, is to underfill them a bit. <laughs> They taste good either way, though. They do. <laughs> Let's see if I can turn this back on. Nate and I tried to look to see if you could buy um, pre-made dough in the store. You know, if you just wanted to um, eliminate the fresh pasta making portion of this. Um, and we were not able to find any, so um, it's a good thing that you know how to make it now. Right. So we take our second layer of our pasta, carefully peel it off of our pan, and we are going to carefully set it over the top, trying to cover all of that pasta underneath. And then with our fingers, we're just going to try to set that pasta or maybe stretch even just a little bit of that pasta around each of those dropped pieces that we've put on there. And we come back to our ravioli cutter. And again, this is a really good opportunity time to invite the kids to come in, um, tell them they're gonna be cutting out ravioli and having a good time using the ravioli cutters. This is also a really fun thing to do with your friends. Right? If, we, totally. if, if we've taken one thing away from Italy, and this is also the number one thing that students say um, after we get back from um, um, traveling, we always ask them, like, what's the one thing that you want to take back with you? They say, I want to spend more time making my own food and spend more time um, enjoying food with the people that I want to be with. And so this is a great activity to, to do with a, a group of friends. Again, just take some time, really enjoy what you're doing. And I promise, even, you know, in, in every case, the food's gonna taste better if you spend some time with it. A little bit of love in the kitchen goes a long way. And at this point, um, you could freeze these if you wanted to make a bunch, again, with a bunch of friends and have everybody take some home, you could freeze this. Um, what we're gonna do today is drop them right into a pot of uh, pre-salted uh, boiling water. Uh, we'll just set that away. So we're all set, ready to boil our ravioli. Again, the three different shapes that we have, our square, our circle with our ravioli, and then we use that cup to be able to get uh, just a simple circle all the way through. Very similar, it just doesn't have that fancy edge. If you wanted the fancy edge, go ahead and use that fork again, again in video one with that pasta. We'll set it right onto our basket, and drop it right into our boiling water. They only need about five minutes to cook. Some of this is also personal preference. Uh, fresh pasta is gonna be a little more, um, I don't know, uh, gummy. Uh, it's gonna have a different texture for sure. And so you may have to just play around with cook time um, to get a texture that you like. Yep, uh, in, in Italy, a lot of the times you run into a statement of al dente. And al dente is usually for something that is a firmer noodle. Um, so when you boil um, dried pasta, you get that al dente 
kind of texture where it has a firmness to it. And when you're cooking ravioli or fresh pasta, um, you're not gonna necessarily get that al dente, what you would think of, of a dried pasta cook. And so in this, you might notice that, again, that texture is a little softer or has a little bit more of an ease when you bite through it. As this boils, we're gonna show you also, um, again, Parmesan cheese, uh, kind of the king of cheese in Italy. Um, we'll show you, we have three different uh, graters. Um, of which we use all of them in our kitchen, but we just wanted to kind of show you a variety of different things. Again, the handled grater it has a nice arch on it. Um, uh, you can easily use, we um, create a nice even uh, pattern as we go through um, with our pasta, something that you would see with more of a shredded cheese in your local grocer. Um, some that we like sometimes a little bit larger, so you have a variety of different options. Flat or even a larger, sometimes when you're um, having uh, 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 Parmesan, you want just a little bit more of cheese. Something has a little bit of a larger shred to it. It adds a little bit more of that flavor, and that's what you're looking for, kind of topping off and giving you that nice, good, deep texture. And notice the flakes are a little bit larger. You'll find those in the grocery as well. The one thing, it'll probably be already shredded for you and in more of a, a, a cup or a bowl, um, usually um, kind of like the size of a sour cream container. And then we also have this one, it's known as a microplane. And, and if you just want that light, subtle, like nutty flavor that kind of rests on top or just melts right in, we use this microplane. And you'll notice the difference between the three shredding processes as we use the microplane versus the large chip. And notice how fine that is, almost wispy, and it just melts. So if you're having trouble with your Parmesan cheese melting, maybe it's not necessarily the cheese itself, but how finely you're grating it. And then clearly, if you really wanted to, you could grab a knife and cut off a chunk if you want to, you know. That's what enjoy. Nate likes to do. He <laughs> likes a lot of cheese flavor in each bite, so he just takes the knife and shaves off. So I much nice. prefer having chunks that are about that size, but I'm a big Parmesan cheese fan lover, so options as far as putting your cheese together um, on our final pasta here. Yeah. I think these are about ready. They okay. will float to the top um, when, as they cook, which is a nice sign. Uh, so I'm gonna grab a plate and put a few of these on here. Perfect. I'm grab some sauce over here. Yeah. plate yeah mm. now with ravioli it's a little bit different than maybe spaghetti we're not trying to drench our ravioli in our pasta sauce the sauce is more a supplemental um, more of a, a scenario where we are using the sauce as an addition to because we really want those vegetables to kind of pop out and have that flavor that kind of density of, of uh, nutrient flavor that kind of comes through with that that filling. And that's something that's a little bit different than maybe a spaghetti or even um, something that you would have on a, a, a pepe la cow um, uh, in an Italian style. Um, again, you can see as the use that nice microplane cheese go right over the top, it melts right into that sauce. I'm gonna add a little bit more thyme. You can also add basil. We love to add basil to a lot of our cooking, but this just, this sort of makes everything pretty at the end. And then we're gonna grab some of those roasted vegetables and add those in here as well and we'll have our final dish. So high nutrient density, excellent flavor. I'm just gonna mix these up a little. Smells amazing. <laughs> yeah, if they can only smell through the camera and have the ability to Absolutely. find that. And we might even add a little bit more of that Parmesan cheese on top of these vegetables, which would be, would be nice as well. And there you have it. We have a, a pureed vegetable stuffed ravioli. 
and some roasted vegetables on the side. Again, all local, in-season ingredients, lovely flavor, high nutrient quality, lots of, lots of veggies. We hope, you, we hope you enjoy. If you have questions, you can feel free to email either one of us about any of the items that we used in the recipe. Cancer is a mean disease. Watching a loved one suffer the pain of this disease was an experience that altered every single aspect of what I assumed to be true about life and death. My mother was diagnosed with cancer on July 29, 2009, when a large tumor was discovered in her ureter just outside of her right kidney. She died almost exactly one year later on July 30, 2010. Everyone in the family assumed the cancer was treatable. No one knew that her diagnosis was stage four bladder cancer. She kept that part of the story to herself. I was my mother's primary caretaker over the year that she tried every treatment available to her. I was visiting my mother at her home in Minneapolis for a weekend in July 2009 when she complained of an ache in her lower back. She was popping extra strength Tylenol every six hours to help alleviate the pain. On Saturday, we golfed and went shopping and she seemed okay as long as she took the pain medication every six hours. We returned home after a long day and went to bed early. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my mother's moaning. I went into her bedroom to find her rolling around on the floor, crying in pain. She told me to get a bucket from the bathroom. I returned with the bucket and she began vomiting. I grabbed my phone to dial 911 when the pain suddenly stopped. She looked at me surprised and said, that's funny, the backache completely disappeared. She was able to get up off the floor and sat down on her bed. We're going to the ER, I said. She was hesitant but reluctantly agreed after I told her that the pain would eventually return. Once in the ER, the pain came rushing in again. The ER our nurse gave her a shot of morphine and she was off for testing. The hospital waiting room was relatively empty at two in the morning, so I lay down on one of the couches and started organizing my thoughts. What could possibly be wrong with my mother? At 67, she was healthy, active, and excited about life after retiring a few months earlier. My mother and I were very close and very much alike. Since moving to Minnesota in 2002, I spent almost all my weekends with her. My mother was luminous but could get tight in the eyes with grief. She experienced a lot of loss in her life. She lost a husband to divorce and a sister, lover, and second husband to cancer. I think my mother appeared to be vulnerable, but she had a high tolerance for all kinds of pain. And to me, she seemed invincible. Lost in my thoughts, I fell asleep. A nurse woke me at 5 a.m. to tell me that I could go see my mother. When I entered her room, she said, I have something to tell you. It's cancer. I have cancer. I was stunned. How could this be? How could the love of my life, my person, get cancer? The oncologist, a woman in her 50s, came in to talk with us about the next step. As always, there was a cocktail for this type of cancer and the first ingredient was chemotherapy. Because I was the only child living in Minnesota near my mother and I was on a sabbatical for my teaching position, I became her primary caretaker. So it began, the new normal as they say. We developed rituals right away and the world became very small. Our days were filled with appointments, trips to the grocery store, and sitting together talking. My mother began to share things with me about her life that I never knew. An affair, childhood trauma, and other events that were significant to her. Looking back, I wondered why she was sharing her secrets, but now I realized that she knew something that I did not. That is, stage four cancer equals death for her. While my mother's body was rearranging itself from the cancer and chemotherapy, my body was turning inside out with anticipatory grief. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think it was the beginning of my processing the loss of my mother. The chemical and surgical interventions meant to cure the cancer were making my mother's suffering worse than the very disease that was killing her. The treatment recipe wasn't working. 
I was made aware of this when my mother called me in March of 2010 to tell me that she was terminating her treatment. I was on my way to a Fleetwood Mac concert with a friend of mine when her call came in. My mother had undergone months of chemotherapy, an unsuccessful surgery, and now was in the middle of radiation when the treatment burned her bowel. This was the final straw for her. I asked her, who else have you told about your decision? I wanted to be prepared for the frantic phone calls from my siblings. My mother replied, well, I know, God knows, and now you know. Something inside me shifted. I knew in that moment my mother would not survive. During the last month of my mother's life, we sat together often in silence. The two days before she died, we were resting in the quiet when she turned to me and said, I want my mommy. I was shattered. Not knowing how to respond, I began to sob. My mother looked at me and said, but you are my mommy now. The loss of my mother to cancer still sometimes consumes me even 10 years after her death. I am full of an emptiness that I can't seem to let go of. Cancer stole my ground note. My mother told me that she was certain that she would get a new body when she died, a body that she said I may not see, but I will feel. She was right, she moves behind me. Like I said, cancer is cruel, but it made me recognize my own mortality and brought me to the very edge of human experience. To watch the dying is a gift that taught me that there is nothing essential besides loving and being loved, and that love doesn't just disappear when someone dies. It exists in a place where I can be with my mother anytime. It's a space of peace and grace. Welcome. My name's Michelle Rosenko. Welcome to the 56th Nobel Conference, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology. We've been exploring how yoga-based practices can support individuals as they navigate this journey with life after a cancer diagnosis. We've explored the idea of the three-part breath, we've explored range of motion. I want to introduce the idea of enteroception. You maybe don't know that word. We are three-dimensional beings and we take in sensory experience and we make sense out of it. Like if you go outside to walk your dog in the early morning and you have a short sleeve shirt on and your arms are cold, you feel cold and you think, mm, I need a sweater, right? Or you might taste your gravy and think, that needs more salt. So we take in sensory information and we make sense of it. Well, we also are constantly receiving sensory information from inside our bodies. And sometimes we're a little less tuned into that. So, that's one of the reasons we go to that three-part breath, just as an invitation to listen to the sensory experience in our bodies. We're gonna start standing today. We're gonna let the crown of our head float high. So we're standing tall without being rigid. And when we exhale, we're gonna relax, but we're gonna really be grateful for the support we feel under our feet and through our whole body. First, just find your own breath. Use that enteroception. Use that sensory awareness of feeling what's going on inside you. What's the tempo of your breath? What's the rhythm? Do you notice it more in your ribs, in your belly, in your front, in your back? Where do you feel that breath? And now we're gonna bring some intention and awareness to that breath 
And we're going to intentionally inhale and fill our belly and then expand our ribs then feel the high lobes of our lungs and exhale from the top to the middle to the bottom. Inhaling fully, exhaling fully. The breath is such an amazing gift. When you are in a challenging time, maybe you're going in for that MRI or that PET scan and you're having scanxiety. You can't go for a long run in that moment. You can't pop off to a yoga class, but you can breathe. You can take time and breathe, which hits the reset button on your nervous system. We're gonna move into the different ways our spine moves, and I'm gonna introduce a new sequence, a standing sequence. First, with your palms just at your side, inhale and open the arms Lengthen through the top of the head and the heart. And exhale down. Inhale, bring your hands up and loop your fingers together and invert them. And now exhale, bend your knees and flex your spine. Inhale and come up. And go ahead and grasp your fingers behind you or put your hands like they're in your back blue jean pockets. And just take a little bit of a back arch and come back down. Then inhale up, right hand grabs left wrist, side bending, inhale and exhale. One more time. Grab the opposite side, doesn't matter which side you do first. Up and down. Now, I'm gonna stand just a little bit wider. I'm gonna inhale up and I'm gonna rotate my spine. So one arm goes in the back and one goes in the front. Inhale up, one arm front, one arm back. Inhale up. One arm front, one arm back. Last one. And inhale up and come on back down. Let's do that whole sequence again. We start with your arms, just shake them up. They're just here. Inhale, open, heart lifts. Exhale, close. Inhale, grasp the fingers. Exhale, flex. Inhale, up. Exhale, lower. Inhale, back bending. Exhale, center. Inhale, up. Grab one wrist. Side bend. Inhale, up and down. Inhale, up, side bend. <clears throat> Inhale, up, and down. Good, shake it out. I'm going to teach a new sequence that, again, gives us some range of motion and stretch. It's also gonna get into that place right between our shoulder blades where we hold a lot of tension but when it's not strong there, we have trouble holding a nice strong spine. So we're gonna strengthen our back and also stretch that place. I'll talk you through it. Start with your feet pointed straight forward, legs like train tracks. Big inhale up. Bring your arms down so they're like a W, or sometimes we think of this like a cactus. Drop your arms forward. I think of this as cactus wings. Inhale, bring your scapula or your shoulder blades together. And on your exhale, bring the right hand over the left like you're giving yourself a hug and bend your knees, sit like that chair. Now stay in your chair. And now try to bring either the backs of your hands, lift your elbows, 
Do you feel that stretch between your shoulder blades? Back down. Big inhale, open, stretch your legs. Other arm comes on top. Backs of the hands, lift your elbows. And down. That place between our shoulder blades, we hold a lot of stress there, so we're giving that a stretch. We're gonna do the cactus wings one more time. Inhale up, exhale, find those cactus arms, drop them forward, cactus wings. Inhale, scapula together, left arm comes on top this time. Nice big hug, bend the knees. Lift the elbows, try and touch the backs of the hands, stretch between your scapula, lower. Give your legs a little break. Opposite arm. And lift. Up and down. Now, we're gonna come down to laying on our backs on the floor. So take a minute and clear a space. You don't need a lot of room. You need to be able to stretch out and have a little room on either side. I'm gonna start just laying down here. And just taking, do you notice my knees are bent, my feet are on the floor. If your head is uncomfortable like this, if you feel like your neck is kind of in this position and it's uncomfortable, it's perfectly fine to put a blanket or something under your head. Let your head be supported. A towel works well. You want your forehead and your chin fairly even. But just laying here, I want you to come into that internal sensory awareness. Notice the places where the floor is supporting you, your feet, your pelvis, the back of the shoulders, your head. Feel that support and just come into the fullness of your breath again. Let's think about that th three-part breath, the belly, the ribs, the high lobes. It feels so different in a different position. If you can, go ahead and hug one knee in, hug the other knee in. Just make some little circles with your knee. We try to take the holding between our shoulder blades out with our eagle arms. Now we're giving our low back a little massage on the floor because that's another place we feel a lot of tension. Hug your knees in, and then just hold the right knee and put the left foot down. Let's take a nice big breath here. Feel the support underneath you. Go ahead and let your left leg slide out. That makes the stretch a little bit more intense. Then my right leg is up, my right hand is holding, my left hand is going to my hip. On an inhale, I'm going to very carefully and with curiosity just see my range of motion, my range of comfort, bringing my right leg to the side. And then I'm going to bring it back to center and switch hands. Now I'm just going to bring my knee across my midline and stay right there and see if that feels okay. And right here you have a choice. Here's a place we could go into a spinal twist, which might feel delightful, and if it does, certainly go for it. But again, you're not trying to crack your back. You're not trying to force it. You're just taking a nice inhale and then letting that knee cross and the pelvis roll and feeling the rotation of your spine. And then coming back, hugging your knee in and taking a full body stretch wherever that is for you. Your arms may be more comfortable, a little higher, 
wherever it is comfortable for you. Walk your feet in, hug them in again, low back stretch, beautiful little massage on the low back. Hug my left knee, stretch my other leg out. Breathe, feel what's going on. Left hand holds left shin, right hand on hip. Big inhale, gently with kindness and curiosity. What's my range of motion to the left? Come back in, switch. Just bring my knee across my midline, pause for a moment. This may be just enough. But if you feel that little inkling that said, oh, it would feel so good to twist a little farther, twist a little farther. Always listening, always adapting. And come on back, full body stretch. Walk it back in. Go ahead and take your feet out a little wider on the mat. Put your arms so they're just not in the way. Big inhale. Knees fall one way. Inhale. Knees fall the other way. Inhale. Knees fall. Up and fall. Now, from here, we're going to move into just a little bit of a resting pose, what's often called savasana. You can leave your feet wide and let your knees go knock-kneed. Sometimes that feels good on the low back. Or you can move into what's a more traditional savasana of your legs reaching out and your arms, palms up. And here's the magic of savasana. You don't do anything. Just feel the floor supporting you. If you find your mind is skipping off to your to-do list, invite yourself back to this moment, to the comfort of your mat. When you're ready, take your time to roll onto one side and find your way to a comfortable for you seated position. I started this particular video talking a little bit about interoception feeling what you feel, the sensory awareness system inside your body signaling the meaning-making part of your mind. Now, it's almost counterintuitive, but what research shows is those people who feel what's going on in their body, the hard things as well as the good things, are more resilient. When they've been through a challenging time, their body recalibrates back to their homeostasis. So it's not about blocking out the hard feelings or the painful feelings and just being happy. No, we want to feel what we feel. Sometimes it's hard to do that, so we always come back to that breath, that breath. Feeling our breath, maybe noticing what feels good that we want to take with us into the day? What can we maybe leave here on the mat? As always, I'm going to close with a well-wishing meditation. I will say, may you be. And in fact, today I think I'm going to say, may we be. So all of us together, taking a nice deep breath in. May we all be safe. May we all be healthy.
May we all be happy. And may we all find peace. Take a nice big breath in. Thank you for letting me share this practice. I hope it's been helpful. If you're interested in discovering more, you can look up Yoga for Cancer. There's a wonderful body of research. There's excellent tapes and videos available to you to support you as you navigate this life with a cancer diagnosis. Be well. I look forward to joining you at the conference. The Now and After, Part 1. It was tomorrow and it is yesterday. This video is meant to show how a viewer would interact with the sculptural work in this exhibition. However, due to the current COVID-19 safety protocols on campus at Gustavus Adolphus College, gallery visitors are not permitted to touch or interact with the sculptural work, as the work cannot be effectively disinfected. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Now and After, an exhibition by me, Alison Hiltner. There are two pieces in this exhibition, and the first one we'll be looking at is It Was Tomorrow and It Is Yesterday, which places the viewer into a science fiction-styled interpretation of the natural world. The main ingredient of this work is microalgae, more specifically spirulina. I selected this species because of its frequent connection to being utilized as a CO2 scrubber slash oxygen generator and fuel source. It is a journey into cultivating and utilizing this difficult to define organism, cyanobacteria. Spirulina is neither flora or fauna. Instead, it is a mixture of neither and both, deriving its energy from photosynthesis, its only solid connection to flora. It also possesses the infrastructure of a unicellular parasite. The blooms encased inside of these vinyl sacs respond to CO2 data collected by blowing into a sensor apparatus that you see that looks similar to a microphone. The audience can start an exchange where the cyanobacteria releases a unified sigh of oxygenated air in the form of bubbling chatter. Viewers can breathe into the sensor within the gallery and the duration of the aeration pumps attached to the cyanobacteria sacs will quicken in response to the breath input, creating a rhythmic rudimentary form of communication. Do you want to breathe into it? The Now and After, Part 2, Tethers. This video is meant to show how a viewer would interact with the sculptural work in this exhibition. However, due to the current COVID-19 safety protocols on campus at Gus Davis Adolphus College, gallery visitors are not permitted to touch or interact with the sculptural work, as it cannot be effectively disinfected. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. The second piece we'll be looking at today is tethers. Signals create life from chaos. 
life implies connection and connection is vital. When cells detach from their environment, they lose connections and die. This concept is universal. It is the immediacy of our sense of touch that dissuades loneliness. Tethers is about focusing on this connection and about the signals we send into the world that weave us into the greater matrix of existence. How does it feel to hold a heart, our own or someone else's? With Tethers, I have created a physical interface where someone can feel the pulsation of the heart in their hands. A participant merely needs to place a fingertip on the green glowing sensor, and data is transmitted into the pulsating, translucent white fingertips that are encased in what was once a transplant organ transport module. Then they pulsate to the rhythm of that person's heartbeat. The reason the work is centered around the heartbeat is twofold, both coming from my experiences as an artist in residence at the University of Minnesota School of Medicine in the Visible Heart Lab and System Regeneration Lab. The first is learning that cells can essentially die of loneliness. And then when I held a still beating pig heart in my bare hands, leading me to the realization of how separated we are from our bodies and the vastness of what we simply take for granted. The beating of our heart is a muted physical sensation for us. At most, background noise that can comfort or concern. But in reality, it is a powerful, universal connection. A sign of life that is always felt and should be shared. Welcome back. I'm really excited now to have a chance to talk to Nicholas Darcourt, who is visiting, a, uh, pr visiting instructor of art and art history at Gustavus, and also is uh, the person who is uh, in charge of the Schaefer Gallery at Gustavus. So Nicholas, welcome to the laboratory. Well, thank you. So uh, you've just come from a gallery talk by the artist Alison Hiltner, who uh, is the artist who has created the ex exhibit that's in the Schaefer Gallery right now. Tell us a little bit about that exhibit if folks weren't able to see either her talk or the brief video about it. Yeah, so uh, we uh, at the Art and Art History Department uh, were um, quite lucky to have Alison Hildner come in and put a, a show, uh, an exhibition up for us. Um, she is a, a Twin Cities based artist uh, who works mostly with installation type uh, sculptural works. And uh, so in the show, in the exhibition, there are two pieces. Uh, if you were just watching the, um, uh, the, the two videos on the live stream, you would have seen um, those two pieces. Um, <clears throat> and so what, what you'll see is a lot is, is uh, some, uh, some pumps, some hoses, some uh, stainless steel stands, uh, things that look like medical equipment. Um, you hear a lot of noises, a lot of sounds, um, instruments turning on turning off um, so it's a uh, it's it's quite a uh, an experience if um, if you are uh, in the gallery uh, the first uh, the first piece that uh, she was talking about it was today and and it is tomorrow um, uh, really uh, kind of uh, kind of moves across the gallery you can experience uh, the work on the first floor and then you can also go up to the second floor uh, and experience the, the work there too and uh, if you couldn't quite tell, it, there's a series of pumps that will actually activate uh, the work on both floors. So, uh, so that work uh, spreads out over two floors. Uh, and then the, uh, the work on the third floor, uh, tethers, uh, you might have seen that, um, have already seen that uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can view these objects uh, as, uh, as kind of 
placeholders for the heart for your heartbeats, and uh, you can kind of experience the, the the pulse and the speed of of different heartbeats. Uh, and at least that's that's how the work is supposed to be uh, experienced. Um, I can talk about uh, talk about it a little bit more later on in the interview, uh, but that's what uh, that's what the work is uh, is about in this exhibition. So, uh, yeah, why don't you know what? Uh, Nicholas, I would love for you to start by talking about the experience of actually being in the gallery. Uh, we've seen, some of us have seen the, the, the little tour, but as someone who's actually walked through the pieces, and I assume you were able to activate them? Uh, so, uh, it's, it, right now it's, um, I would say that the, uh, the status of the work is, is, is one in which Gallery viewers are not allowed to interact with, and that's just because of the uh, the COVID nineteen protocols. Uh, so the it, specifically for the first piece, the the pumps are kind of set on a um, uh, just a delay, uh, but the pumps need to always be moving and running, uh, and uh, that's because there needs to be oxygen flowing into these bags or these kinds of sacks of, uh, of bacteria, uh, otherwise that bacteria will die. So. Uh, so it's 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 imperative to the work that um, there's a sense of life that's happening, uh, uh, living living organisms, uh, especially getting into uh, bacteria. You know some of the most basic uh, living organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'll hear uh, you hear the pumps turning on and off. You'll see the um, the air kind of pulsating through the through the bags through the sacks, and uh, it really starts to. Uh, Although it's although it's supposed to be random, it kind of almost feels like there's a little bit of a rhythm that kind of starts to happen there. Um, and then uh, moving upstairs to see the uh, the next work, um, it's um, when you get closer to the work, you start to kind of uh, the work starts to transform a little bit. From farther away, it seems a little kind of cold, um, maybe a little kind of scientific, kind of medically sciencey. But uh, as you get closer, the the uh, the work starts to transform. It starts to feel a little bit more uh, alive to some degree, and you can start to see the, um, some of the silicone parts, uh, and uh, and you uh, can see them move, and and uh, you start to really get a sense of this uh, these organs or or kind of science like kind of science fiction hearts uh, that are kind of beating right in front of you. I was particularly uh, moved by I guess that exhibit in that when she describes the fact that the pieces of the exhibit were actually created in part out of a container that was used to transport an artificial heart, am I right, or, an, or that were used for organ transport? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so those are actual uh, organ transplant uh, containers. Uh, so the, the artist, Alison Hiltner, uh, did a, a artisan residency at the um, University of Minnesota uh, Hospital, Medical Hospital, uh, as part of um, the Wiseman Art Museum, uh, which is on campus as well. Uh, and uh, so she was able to uh, be up close and personal with the processes of, of uh, 3D printing uh, uh, hearts and uh, human tissue. Uh, and so um, she was able to hold a pig heart as she, uh, as she documented. Still beating. And still beating, right, exactly. Uh, and uh, she was really in awe of these, um, of these containers that can, that can hold organs and keep them viable for up to 48 hours um, and they can be transported from uh, anywhere in the world I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at it, I, I, as a philosopher I was uh, reminded of the work of uh, Donna Haraway who th talks about the human as cyborg and in very real senses we are of course when we think about how many parts of our bodies are able to be replaced or supplemented with things made of silicone and um, and other, um, you know, quote, artificial materials. And that, hu that heart, uh, as I saw it pulsating when Allison was activating it, was remarkably moving, I have to say. I was really sort of blown away by it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you know, really the amazing thing about Allison's work is uh, even though it deals with, um, well, everything has to be plugged in, electricity, right? Everything is, is based on some sort of, uh, sense of machinery or, mecha or mechanics uh, and systems involving you know, metal, plastic, um, there still is, it still always is referencing life or, kind of, or keeping something alive uh, or in the sense of the heart, uh, beating hearts, uh, the idea of, uh, of connectivity uh, and, um, and uh, really just uh, about um, you know, biological life. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So I understand that the show was very much created in conjunction with the Nobel Conference, and you know, alas, it had to, it's having to be carried out in a very different way than you envisioned. But how does it connect to that theme of cancer in the age of biotechnology? Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Nicholas? Yeah, right. So uh, <laughs> at the Schaefer Art Gallery, we this is our second year that we have done have put on an exhibition that is in uh, what I say is a creative conjunction with the the conference. Uh, and so what happens is it gives uh, the uh, attendees to the conference an opportunity to uh, get involved in, in, a, in a creative modality that is, that is connected to the, the theme, uh, not exactly um, part of the, uh, of the theme, but something that's connected. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, Allison's work uh, is very much uh, about biology and technology, uh, not necessarily cancer related, but but still working uh, with uh, still working with science and medicine, uh, and it gives the um, gives the the attendees uh, an opportunity to um, get into some free association and uh, get into the creative mind of of an artist who's thinking of the same kind of thinking on the, along the same lines, or um, you know working with create working with uh, working with creativity, but still in in a maybe coming from a, a science platform. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it, that it's important to explore a theme like cancer through, uh, through the medium of art, uh, and in this case, highly conceptual art, and indeed art that really does employ scientific concepts? I mean, it's very interesting that she chose specifically cyanobacteria for particular, for particular reasons, for instance. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, th I think you're asking me to be a scientist as well as a... As a <laughs> yes, is that all right with you? Well, I can try. I can certainly try. <laughs> I might have to have some disclaimers next to some of these statements. But um, uh, So, you know, in my opinion, um, in Allison's work, it uh, really comes down to um, this idea of maybe uh, of, of manipulating life or, or keeping, life, uh, keeping life viable uh, through these systems or... Uh, or referencing the potential, uh, the potential of life through uh, through technology, through uh, some of these, and some of the parts are pretty mundane, really, uh, and some are uh, are quite extra extravagant. Uh, using uh, computer programming uh, with some of her work, um, and so and so for me, there's a there's a pretty strong connection, uh, especially with the topic of cancer right now, um, and uh, the idea that using technology technologies is um, is really the forefront of um, of, uh, of working to um, to to mitigate cancer and to um, and to change people's lives. So there's to me there there's a direct uh, connection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know I am a I am always the person who says it is clear to me that we come to understand ideas, whether they be technical scientific ideas or social scientific ideas. Uh, we come to understand them at many levels through many different media and certainly a really powerful one is uh, the medium of art and this uh, this show uh, offers us a really interesting look into that. Can you say a little bit about the mission of the Schaefer Gallery in general? What, how does it serve the Gustavus community and how does it serve the wider community, uh, at least in ordinary times when people are allowed to go to it? Uh, yeah, right. So, uh, so typically the, the, uh, the Schaefer uh, Art Gallery is um, is open to the public, uh, not this year, uh, not currently. Uh, it's just open to uh, on-campus um, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and uh, what we do is we have uh, about nine months worth of uh, exhibition programming, uh, and that can be anywhere from pulling in um, regional artists, uh, con uh, typically contemporary artists. And um, like I mentioned, we we are now trying to always have a connection to the Nobel uh, Nobel Conference. Uh, we also uh, have the opportunity to work with the uh, the visiting artist funds, which is through the uh, through the uh, Johnson Endowment funds. Every three years, we can bring in a bigger name artist, and we can uh, have an exhibition, a much larger exhibition. Uh, and oftentimes, these would be national artists. Um, so we can uh, offer um, arts programming in that way, uh, and then we also. Uh, support the art and art history department uh, by having <clears throat> exhibition for juniors every year. Uh, we can do um, project, uh, small projects, uh, kind of use it as a project space for um, for JTERM or, or um, IEX. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then uh, also we will always have some sort of an artist talk. And so, um, you know, the community can, um, and uh, Gus Davis members can, can see what, what the artists are up to and, and get a sense as far as uh, what their process is. Mm -hmm. Any, were there any surprises in the artist talk by Alison Hiltner? Any new um, understandings of the work that came for you from listening to her talk? Uh, yeah, I think you, I think there's always going to be uh, a much deeper <laughs> level of understanding that comes when you hear when you hear an artist talking about their own work, um, and uh, and that is uh, her sense of I would say her sense of development uh, with her ideas. Um, so getting to the point where she is now working with the uh, materials uh, and working with the technologies that she's working with, um, it was great to see some of those jumps that that ha that happened uh, in her uh, in her career, uh, working from things that were just very simple, um, maybe even kind of artificially connected, uh, but no, maybe no like uh, no no real sense of, of process yet where where there's life involved, uh, and then to see that jump into getting into working with. Um, with really biological life, it was it was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the lines that she used in the in her video uh, jumped out at me today. I've seen that I've seen the video a couple of times, but the line jumped out at me because of something that I learned earlier today. She said, "I learned that cells can die of loneliness," and I learned this afternoon from a discussion with uh, Professor Laura Burak that uh, cells need to need to develop socially, which is one of the reasons apparently that uh, cow serum is used as a as a growth medium for cells. So I'm I'm learning about cells and their need to be together, which I think we all we all hear that phrase right now with a little bit more poignancy than ordinary, right? In the midst of this pandemic in which we're all aware, even if we're introverts, that we need to be together, whether we're individual cells cyanobacteria, or whether we are collections of cells like you and I. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, well, I appreciate your coming in to talk with us today, Nicholas, about this show. Again, if you want to, would you like to just tell us again the name of the artist and the name of the exhibit, and people can watch the video, which is posted on the web page? Yeah, you bet. So it is um, The Now and After, uh, and that's works by Alison Hiltner. Uh, if, uh, if you're moving around the, uh, the Gustavus web, website as well, uh, you can find it under Schaefer Art Gallery. And um, uh, there'll be images and, and, vid and the two videos as well uh, on that web page also. Wonderful, yes. And so you can navigate there either by uh, going right there from the Gustavus web page, or if you're already at the Nouvelle Conference page, again, go to that learning, learn more about cancer topics. So thanks so much, Nicholas. It was great to see you. Yeah, thank you very much for the Hi. Yes, yes, absolutely. And just a reminder to you all that uh, we are, um, you have a lot of opportunities to connect up with this conference um, by using Poll Everywhere to ask questions or to um, follow us on Twitter at Nobel Conference or to join, uh, join the conversation on Facebook where we are Nobel Conference. Those of you who go to Nobel Conference regularly know that one of the features of the conference is an event on Tuesday night that is traditionally uh, uh, music related at least and sometimes other media as well. And it is thematic. And uh, we are really excited that this year, despite everything that the world is going through, we have been able to um, benefit from the um, artistic talents of a couple of recent Gustavus graduates, uh, and they are Aaliyah Felton and Michael McKenzie. Both of them uh, are committed to using music to teach about social justice, and they proposed to the committee two years ago a concert that would address racial disparities in cancer treatment. Michael is a national award-winning conductor who is an active social justice advocate and a music educator as well. His work centers on the power that choral music has to effect social change. He is currently the Artistic Director of Voices for Social Justice, which is a national nonprofit choral organization. Aaliyah 
is a teacher of English language arts, and she teaches particularly secondary school students. Through her upbringing and also her education, Aliyah has found a real passion within the power of music. She's sung in church and school ensembles her entire life. They are both with me today before the concert, which begins at 7.30, although fortunately they can sit here calmly because it is all already in the can, as they say. So welcome, Michael and Aaliyah. Thank you so much. We are so excited to see your concert this evening. I'm so excited for the world to see it. <laughs> so excited. <laughs> it has been a little while in the making, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It's been 15 months. How many months? 16. 16. I was going to think it was almost closer to two full years, but I guess I guess you're right. The, the idea grew a little bit uh, when the conference was already a little bit underway. Talk a little bit about that process. How did, how did this idea come up, you two? Yeah, so it started uh, actually a few days after I graduated. Um, Dr. Ocean Ryan, who's a former professor, reached out and wanted to uh, see if we could get some social justice component to the music we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we drafted three different versions of the program, uh, and for one reason or another, uh, it ended up transitioning into being an entirely uh, social justice choral uh, piece. Uh, and so when that happens, uh, before I embarked any further, I decided I wanted to bring on a co-director, uh, and that's when I called Aaliyah and came up with the idea that um, the social justice topic that we could dive into uh, were the racial inequities that exist in our healthcare system that could uh, and do impact people being diagnosed with cancer. Wonderful. So what is the story that this work tells? Yeah, the story tells of two people who are embarking on their own journey with cancer. One is highlighted um, by uh, our one of our soloists, Katie Perutka, um, and I also got to, an opportunity to solo on this piece as well. Um, the essence of what we tried to capture with this program is the fact that we aren't having enough conversations about what it means to be equitable and to... Uh, have justice within our healthcare system. So through this journey, you get to see two different people who are experiencing it in, in and of itself, but are also experiencing it differently and how they, they cope and how they get to see themselves through this journey to the end. And you, and you don't necessarily know what happens to them in the end. It, we just know that they are going on uh, and that is kind of captured in our final song, um, where we try to capture the idea of there being a home for people who are dealing with uh, this uh, tragic disease. And so we tried to, we tried to capture that as best mm. as we could. Powerful. So what was the creative process like? How did you select the works that ultimately made it into this very uh, compact and musically dense and rich show? Yeah, so there have been, uh, I counted it the other day, there have been 10 versions of this program that have existed uh, since its initial conception. Um, and part of that was deciding to make musical changes based on responding to conversations that were happening around the world. Some of them were COVID related, uh, but at the heart of what we wanted to do was put together a program uh, where all of the composers <laughs> Represented members of communities who have historically been oppressed for health reasons. Uh, so the entire program is constructed uh, by composers of color, female composers, uh, composers uh, who identify as members of the LGBTQIA plus community, um, because throughout history we've seen uh, how oppression has manifested for those different groups in regards to uh, health matters. So the program is entirely composed of poets uh, and composers and lyricists who, uh, who fit uh, those communities because we felt that in, in their personal experience, we would be able to better capture uh, the added element of oppression when we're dealing with disease. So when there's an additional factor that some people don't know to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. 
One of the uh, presenters this afternoon during the panel discussion, Suzanne Chambers, said one of the ways that we often attempt to address uh, people's experiences with cancer is to fix what we can, which is to try to give individuals a way through a process. But she said what that ignores is exactly what you are pointing to, which is that these are structural, systemic obstacles, challenges, um, constructed challenges um, and obstacles. Uh, so this piece really speaks to your, your concert, your, your work really speaks to that reality for people. Yeah. You mentioned uh, COVID safety measures. So were there any things you had to do? I don't know, because you were singing? Yes, we had to take a lot of COVID safety measures. We uh, went through the process of getting approved to even record on campus. That was a process in and of itself because things were changing so rapidly uh, with the measures and the uh, and the regulations for singers when it comes when it came to COVID-19. So we uh, when we finally got approved to record on campus, we uh, set it up so that students were socially distanced, our choir was socially distanced as possible, and we also received these uh, special masks for singers. So that was also very helpful for us. And we only uh, rehearsed in 30 minute increments and took 20 minute breaks in between each uh, rehearsal time to give time for the air to filter properly through mm -hmm. the space with the chapel. So mm -hmm. we took as many safety precautions as possible and we're very happy with how things turned out in spite of them. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I understand that the, I know a number of years ago, the chapel ventilation system was vastly upgraded so that it has one of the best ventilation systems on campus, which also added a layer of safety. But I'm sure the experience of singing at such great distances had to be really challenging for the singers. What, what was that like? Yeah, we, uh, we were joking when we got to our first rehearsal that the chapel is a notoriously difficult space to get clarity because it's so large uh, and sound just fills it up. Um, and then on top of that, all the singers were 10 feet apart in any direction. So we had 14 people stretched over the same distance that we would have fit 350 singers for Christmas in Christ Chapel. Uh, so we had to get them to listen to all of those things and learn music and be in the chapel at the same time. Uh, so we had an interesting echo effect that happened right at the beginning uh, that we got really good at uh, mitigating through, uh, luckily I've had, I had five years of time to like master the chapel. So we had, we had a lot of skills that we got to bring into play uh, when we were talk thinking about rehearsing and recording and how we were going to listen. Um, but the back row of singers probably spent the whole concert never knowing what it sounded like because the likelihood that they could hear the four, the 40 feet in front of them where a whole other voice part was, is very unlikely. So the amount of trust that they had to have and the amount of work that they had to put in to make sure that they were always right where they were supposed to be uh, was much greater than if it was a little concert setting where they could maybe figure out what the rest of the music sounded like. That back row was just, they had to be real champs the whole time. That is astonishing. It almost makes Zoom calls seem easy, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you were rehearsing via Zoom beforehand, is, am I right? Or, or were people learning their parts on their own and then you brought it all together at the end? Yeah, people were learning their parts on their own and doing periodical checks to, to check in with people's voice parts. They would send in recordings of themselves singing. Uh, we thank God for our uh, section leaders who helped us out a lot with that process. Um, but yeah, we were we were relying heavily on students being independent and being able to and being learn. accountable. And they came together and they did a beautiful job. So kudos to them. It is a really I'm so excited that this is finally uh, coming coming live, as it were. It's really amazing. Uh, so after six months of not singing with a group, was it a pretty uh, powerfully emotional experience to to be together singing? Uh, yeah, that was <laughs> uh, 
for for any musician, but especially when you're um, the way you do craft is through being in a group of other people. Part of what you latch on to is the community. Uh, and so the way that things instantly, like the room was so electrified the whole three days of rehearsal and the thing, because people were just so excited to get to share space with people and make music together. And on top of that, it was music that they booked in so heavily that they cared so much about. We consistently were two hours ahead of schedule the whole weekend because of how much energy and electricity and passion they brought to it. They learned the music at an extraordinarily fast rate. I was absolutely shocked. We were like halfway through day two and I was like, I'm running out of things to do. (laughs) So let's slow on a little bit because (laughs) we have to make sure this is right. Um, And then... Yeah, they really, I mean, they really rose to the occasion. Uh, when you when you think about the fact that they had three days and only challenges and all of the rehearsals, the, the music they put together is absolutely astonishing. Wonderful. Aaliyah, what was it like for you singing after such it a was, long time? Yeah, it was, it was a beautiful experience, especially because uh, in a way I felt like my collegiate uh, choir experience got cut short. Uh, because of the pandemic and I had to end my career back in February, which I had already planned to do, but still it felt unfinished because I didn't get a chance to sing with uh, my, uh, sing with the seniors uh, at baccalaureate or anything like that. So that was a, that was a really tough experience, but being able to come back and sing with those same people that I sang in choir with for two plus years was just super beautiful to be able to have that experience again. It was very emotional seeing everybody and very emotional being able to sing with everybody as well. Mm-hmm. I had to keep myself from crying multiple times. And mm-hmm. I, I, shed one, I shed one or two tears, maybe one or two, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. just the experience itself and coming together and sharing this story together, it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. I have it on good authority that the people running the cameras were having a little trouble keeping it together as well. Yeah, indeed. So what do you hope people take away from the concert that they're about to see? I hope they leave the concert. Um, if they, if these were, if these are conversations that are new to people, I hope that it um, gets them to think about some of the systems that exist in our country in a different way. But most of all, I hope people just feel inspired to create change and to have these discussions in their own life. If we can take a traditional choral setting and have a conversation about the systemic racism that's present in the healthcare system, anyone can start to have those conversations. There are systems that exist all across our our breadth of life where these inequities are present. And when we in our individual lives choose to fight against those injustices, that's when actual change is gonna happen. When it's not just large scale, it's not pieces of art, but it's taking that into your personal life having those conversations with people, holding people accountable, not letting oppressive behavior exist in a space where you might hold some amount of power. That's what I hope people feel inspired to do, to leave and say, I'm gonna show up to work, a family gathering, time with friends, and I'm committed to making sure that at no point does any uh, oppressive rhetoric enter this space, that we're questioning our systems and we're trying to make them better so that everyone feels uh, at home in every space that they might be in. Thanks. Aaliyah, would you like a last word about what you hope people take away? Sure. I, I echo all that Michael said because it's absolutely true. And I, I hope that people are able to walk away from this, especially in light of the world that we're living in today, right now, and be able to really take this with them and have those crucial conversations in spaces where it really matters because we aren't having enough of these conversations and they're so crucial, especially in a time where healthcare is such a hot topic. And I, I really do hope that people walk away feeling like this this particular subject is applicable to them and whatever spaces that they go into and we can have these critical conversations to make and drive change. That is, that is my big hope. That's my deep hope for this. 
Well, thank you both so much for what we are about to hear. So Michael McKenzie and Aaliyah Felton, thanks for all of your creative contributions. I'm very much looking forward to just sitting here and experiencing this concert. Best of luck to thank both you. of you. Thank you so much. Welcome to tonight's concert presentation, Home, an examination of the privilege to live. In accordance with all guidelines surrounding safe practices for music performance, this evening concert is pre-recorded in which each singer will wear masks especially made for singers and remain socially distanced to minimize the threat and exposure of COVID-19. Tonight's performance examines the inequity and injustice within our healthcare system as we explore the emotional journey a diagnosis with cancer can have. As we have seen in the recent COVID-19 pandemic, we are often quick to assign blame to communities of marginalized groups to further an oppressive and divided society. Additionally, we have a practice of legislating who in our country is allowed to receive certain medical treatment. This can be anything from denying women access to the full range of services they may need or determining that a person is unfit to donate blood based on their sexuality. We have built a system that ignores the needs of all persons. Potentially the most glaring systematic oppression in our healthcare system is the treatment of people of color. Healthcare can simply be defined as efforts made to maintain or restore physical, mental, or emotional well-being, especially by trained and licensed professionals. I challenge you to broaden your view beyond our healthcare system to examine the ways in which we inhibit the access to someone's physical, mental, and or emotional well-being as a result of their race, gender, ethnicity, and many other facets. In our country today, we see communities crippled by an access to natural resources and programs that help them pursue full and healthy lives. Most closely related to this evening's topic, people of color are the largest community who don't have access to health insurance, the resource vital to receiving medical care in our country. All of these factors make one wonder who has the power to determine who lives? Furthermore, what accountability is in place to ensure the physical, mental, and emotional needs of all humans are being met? As we examine the impact of a cancer journey on a human being, I encourage you to view the inequity through a lens beyond health insurance and go deeper into how we have seen people of color's lives be harmed in our community as well as systematic oppressions. Cancer doesn't discriminate based on race, so why should access to treatments be able to? Tonight's performance will include a diverse group of composers helping us present to you home, an examination of the privilege to live. We, unaccustomed to courage, Exiles from delight live coiled in shells of loneliness until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us into life. Love arrives and in its train from ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet if we are bold, Love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light. We dare to be brave. And suddenly, we see that love costs all we are and all will ever be. Yet it is only love which sets us free.
I'm being taken on a holiday, but <laughs> it's a surprise. I wonder where I'm going. I think I've guessed, but I've been wrong before. What do I pack? It could be cold, rainy, could be a tropical paradise. I'd better pack everything. I wonder where am I going? I think I've guessed. I, I feel it in my bones. Have I remembered to pack everything? I could need scuba gear, climbing gear, warm clothes, a bikini. I think the bikini unlikely, but I try to fit it in the case. I lie awake considering all the possibilities and trying not to, knowing it futile. I wake early. I do not want to miss the flight. It's a 40 minute trip to the airport. Will we be even able to park? I hope I have everything. I have had plenty of time to consider. Folks say, be positive. But it's not them who'll be wet if they didn't grab a Mac. If it's a tropical paradise, then great. Leave the Mac in the case. I wait for the taxi full of anticipation. I wonder, where am I going? I'll only know when I'm on the plane. When I think of all the times of war
A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream to the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with the fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade wind soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with the fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill. For the caged bird sings of freedom. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak.
thanks so much for joining us for day one of the Nobel Conference 56, Cancer in the Age of Biotechnology, Hope, Equity, and Access. It's been a full, challenging, rich day of exploration of this topic. And we have another coming tomorrow with four more talks and much more content. Uh, the conference will begin at 9.30 tomorrow morning and we'll begin uh, streaming some additional content at about 9.10. So you can join us anytime after that. So thank you and have a safe and restful evening.